Good morning and welcome to the Democratic Alliance's online Innovation Summit, coming to you live from arguably the most beautiful city in the world, Cape Town. My name is Richard Newton and I will be your host for today. The summit will be broadcast via Zoom to, amongst others, mayors, deputy mayors, members of the mayoral committee, members of the provincial legislature and members of parliament. It'll also be going out live on YouTube. Now, innovation has several definitions. You can find them all over, but it all boils down to effectively this. Innovation is the creation, development and implementation of a new product, process or service with the aim of improving efficiency, effectiveness, or competitive advantage. I like to think of it as building a new box and then thinking outside of that. Now, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher in around 300 BC, was quoted as saying, all possible forms of organization have now been discovered. If another form of organization was really that good, it would have been discovered already. Boy, was he wrong. More recently, the founder of the uh, the inventor, of the, the inventor of the electric lamp, Thomas Edison, said, there is a better way to do it, find it. The English poet William Blake said, what is now proved was only once imagined. And pop artist Andy Warhol said, they always say time changes things, but we actually have to change them ourselves. Now, no one understands this better than the DA. While we know that some in South Africa still align themselves with the Aristotle school of thought, we at the DA have been at the forefront of finding new and better ways to do things. The massive challenges that have hit us in relenting waves over the last 10 to 12 months haven't forced us back into the harbour to take shelter until the storm passes. No, in fact, we found ways to lessen the impact and we found solutions where others have only seen impending failure. Today, we will highlight and discuss some of the innovative ways that we have found and will continue to find to improve effectiveness and efficiency and ultimately improve the lives of the people and the residents of this province. You will hear from some of those at the coal face, or should I say, the clean renewable energy face of innovation under four themes, COVID-19, technology and economic growth, water resilience, and energy resilience. Now, some of our presenters today are not politicians and are not connected to the DA. They are public and private experts who have worked and will continue to work to use innovation to improve the lives of people. And our, participations, our, our participants on Zoom will have the opportunity to send questions in for our panel discussion. We'll be having four of those during the course of the show and also take part in polls we'll be running under each of the themes. Now, these polls are here to stimulate debate and encourage participation and are by no means an indication of DA policy on the issue at hand. But let's get down to this. And it gives me great pleasure now to introduce the federal leader of the Democratic Alliance, John Steenhuisen, to officially open our summit. Over to you, John. Good morning, fellow delegates, fellow Democrats, and fellow South Africans. What an incredible honor and pleasure to speak with you here today and particularly on a topic as hopeful and inspiring as the DA governments and the way they constantly push the boundaries and change the game to improve people's lives. This is not something we speak about often enough. We have so much else on our plates, and the landscape in which we work moves at such a breakneck pace that we seldom have time to just pause and reflect on some of these things. But it is important that we do so because it is in our governments more than anywhere else, more than in parliament, more than in the media, and more than in the courts, that the DA has the biggest impact on our people's lives. Everything else we do, all of our campaigning, all of our communication, all of our activism is about one goal only, to put us in a position where we can help South Africans live their lives more comfortably, more safely, and more rewardingly. It's in our governments that all of those debates and opinion pieces and policy papers we produce elsewhere become tangible and meaningful to ordinary people. It's also in our governments that we're able to put the largest expanse of clear blue water between ourselves and the ANC, where we're able to demonstrate clearly and undeniably, backed up by irrefutable evidence, that people live better, more fulfilled lives where the DA governs. We've been doing so for many years already. 
not only in the Western Cape and Cape Town, but also in other metros under extremely challenging coalition arrangements, as well as in almost 30 municipalities across four provinces. When you hold up the performance of all these DA governments against the performance of towns, cities and provinces governed by the ANC, the contrast is absolutely staggering. Yes, DA governments do make mistakes, and sometimes they drop the ball. But on balance, it is like we're not even competing in the same league. On every single measure, whether we're talking reach and the quality of basic services, quality of healthcare, quality of education, social services, clean audits, wasteful expenditure, a corruption-free government, unemployment, economic growth, or the ease of doing business, our DA government stand head and shoulders above those run by the ANC. Never has this difference been more clearly demonstrated than in the past year, as we've had to come to terms with the spread of COVID-19 and the crucial, critical task of balancing a healthcare response with efforts to keep our economy alive. Since the start of the pandemic, the Western Cape has stood alone as a beacon of global best practice, while the rest of the country has stumbled from one crisis to another scandal. The contrast between DA governments and ANC governments across every conceivable measure is so stark that sometimes it's almost embarrassing. That this is not reflected daily in our country's media, but that would be the topic of a different webinar altogether. The fact that we are held to a different standard or that commentators often seek to establish some bizarre moral equivalence between any minor misstep on our side and the wholesale mismanagement and looting of the country by the ANC can either frustrate us or it can inspire us. We can either mutter about the injustice of it all, or we can say that DA is held to a different standard for a reason. We don't want to be measured by the ANC's yardstick. We want people to expect more from us. We want service delivery, excellence, and clean, honest governance to be so synonymous with DA governments that it almost goes without saying. And I say almost because, of course, we'd still lack a fair shake in the media, but that alone is not our mission. Our primary mission is to find ways to improve the lives of people who live under DA governments. And we do so by continuously streamlining and refining the way in which we govern. We can never be satisfied with what we have already achieved. And that is why this summit is so important. For once, we get to recognize the incredible value of innovating in government. We get to speak about and showcase some of the successes the DA has achieved. And we hopefully get to spark some ideas amongst others for more such successes in the future. Innovation in government is, to coin a marketing phrase, our USP, our unique selling proposition. It's what makes us better than the competitor. We're not content to simply be a more efficient and more honest version of the ANC government. We don't just do things better. We do better things. And that is what today is all about. But before we get too far in today's program, let's just pause for a moment on the whole concept of innovation. What exactly is it? And what does it look like in our world? It's a word most often associated with the world of business. And you're probably most likely to think of someone like an entrepreneur as an innovator. But we also speak of innovations in technology, in art, in music, and in government. Some people use the terms innovation and creativity interchangeably, but they're not quite the same thing. While both refer to the creation of something new and original, but where creativity is about purely using your imagination to conceive of something fresh and new, innovation is when the new thinking adds a dimension of value. If creativity is about the imagination, then innovation is about the implementation. We could be talking about something entirely revolutionary, or it could be an incremental change but it has to offer some kind of meaningful or productive impact in the market or in people's lives. The other thing about true innovation is that it seldom happens in isolation. More often than not, it requires people to come together 
and to test the ideas against each other. It takes debate and disagreement and yes, sometimes even conflict. Such innovation cannot happen in an environment where disagreement is seen as a problem and where people are simply expected to conform to a certain view. Exploring new ideas and pushing the boundaries inevitably creates a certain amount of tension. In an organization where unity is a primary goal, these tensions are considered dangerous and destabilizing, and they are often suppressed. But where the primary goal is progress, these tensions and lively debates are considered the very lifeblood of an organization. As the Canadian psychologist and professor Gad Saad once remarked, and I quote, the herd mentality is the killer of innovation, unquote. That's why the DA is probably the only meaningful party in South Africa capable of producing groundbreaking ideas and solutions. There is no broader church in South African politics than the DA. There's no greater melting pot of backgrounds and expertise. And there's certainly no other party more open to debate and dissenting views. No one can accuse the DA of having a herd mentality. Fellow delegates, 2021 is the year in which we are going to have to showcase every inch of our innovation in government. This is a make or break year for South Africa, which means it's a critical year for the DA too. I'm not going to dwell too long on our country's precarious situation because I'm sure you all know exactly where we stand. Whatever problems and challenges the coronavirus brought to our shores, the ANC government has compounded tenfold through its heavy-handed and completely ineffectual approach. Unable to do the few things that would have made a real difference, they did the hundreds of things that made them look busy, but our situation infinitely worse. Thousands of businesses have now closed their doors, never to reopen. Millions have lost their livelihoods, and we're approaching this next budget clinging to a log that is speeding towards a waterfall. Our shrunken economy and our missed tax revenue, thanks to these inexplicable lockdown regulations, have left a gaping 300 billion rand hole in the fiscus that is going to have a devastating impact on all areas of government spending. And while everyone, including the president and the finance minister, can see where we're headed, they are paralyzed by conflicting factions, rampant corruption, and a failed ideology that predates the Cold War. Even if they knew what it would take to avert disaster, they just couldn't do it. This failure of national government has had a terrible knock-on effect down the line at the coalface of delivery. Local governments across the country are falling further and further behind in fulfilling their constitutional obligations. Many of them have collapsed entirely, leaving residents there absolutely vulnerable. Now, more than ever, it's critical for local governments to learn to adapt and find innovative ways to overcome or mitigate the effects of a failed national government. And this is where DA-run local governments have the distinct advantage. Our governments excel in spite of national government. With local government elections on the horizon, this is our year to demonstrate our ability to innovate in government. That's what we do well, and we need to play to our strengths. As you will see in the rest of today's program, this ability has already been on full display in recent years. The four areas of the discussion chosen for this webinar, COVID response, economic development, energy security, and water resilience, showcase the very best of the DA in government. While it is true that innovation should and can be its own driving force, it's often in times of crisis that the minds of innovators are focused like lasers on overcoming challenges. In each of these four topics of discussion, our governments have had to deal with unprecedented challenges. The world's worst unemployment crisis, 15 years of Eskom blackouts, the most severe drought in recorded Western Cape history, and of course, a global pandemic. And in each of these cases, you will find that the DA governments rose to the occasion and often won global accolades in the process. I'll leave it to the rest of the speakers to get into the details of each of these four areas, but I would like to leave you with one closing thought. It's often easier to stay in your lane and not ruffle feathers 
than to innovate. Those pushing the boundaries and trying new things often become targets of those who resist change and simply don't want to be shown up. There was even a time when the word innovation was perjurative. It was likened to rebellion or even religious heresy. Now, thankfully for us, the world's moved on a bit in the past 500 years. You'll no longer have your ears chopped off as the 17th century theologian Henry Burton did after being found guilty of innovation. But some of that thinking has still remained. It is human nature for some to want to hold back the pioneers and just slow down the progress. The French philosopher Voltaire recognized this almost 300 years ago when he said, and I quote, our wretched species is so made that those who walk on the well-trodden path always throw stones at those who are showing a new road, unquote. That's going to happen to us. The more we innovate and succeed, the more we will attract the ire of those who we show up. But we cannot let this deter us. This year in particular, we have to grow thick skins and become immune to the noise. Our focus is solely on doing all we can to protect and improve lives in the most trying of circumstances. If we do this well, 2021 will be a great year for the DA. I'm looking forward to the conference and I hope you are too. Thank you. Thank you very much for those inspiring words, John. I'm sure all our participants have taken the message to heart. The DA difference, it's not just a slogan, it's a reality. Remember that. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of the Innovation Summit itself, we have a message of support from Bo Mandarup Jensen. Now, Bo is the chairperson of the Danish Liberal Democracy Program, which contributes to the strengthening of liberal parties and multi-party democracy in developing countries, and is one of our innovation partners that helped make this summit a reality. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Denmark, where winter is holding us indoor as temperatures are freezing outside. Quite the opposite of you, I suppose. My name is Bo Mandrup Jensen. I am the chair of the Danish Liberal Democracy Programme, the political foundation of Venstre. I am very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about the cooperation between our two sister parties. It is now two years since we began our cooperation. We have sent mayors and other politicians to South Africa, and we have received delegations from you in Denmark. Back in February of last year, I was lucky to visit you just before the whole world closed down because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I traveled to South Africa and met with a number of your representatives and staff. I was very engaged and impressed about their commitment and engagement. Naturally, Denmark and South Africa are two very different countries. For one, it's very different for how long time we have been governed by democracy. The first democratic constitution of Denmark was introduced already back in 1849. Since then, we have had proportional representation at elections for national, regional and local elections. Since 1901, no single party has held the majority in the Danish parliament and only very rarely at local level. So therefore, a comparative advantage of Venstre is our knowledge about coalition building. Danish politicians are good at cooperating because they have to and because they're used to. In Denmark, local government get to spend more than half of all public expenditure. Interest in local politics is therefore high, manifested through an average of more than 80% voter turnout for local elections. Currently, 37 out of 98 mayors are from Venstre. Venstre and 
DA are working together under the headline Ready to Govern, with the aim of supporting DA's prospective candidates and politicians with skills and tools to be better able to govern locally, alone or in coalition with other parties. It is very interesting for us in Venstre to work together with DA, a party which is bigger and which in some ways are even more modern than Venstre. DA is really state of the art when it comes to campaigning and fundraising. On the other hand, we are more than a hundred years ahead of you when it comes to being in local government and having mayorships. I feel confident that our two parties can learn a lot from each other. We have a very good basis for developing our partnership even further during the next project phase running from July this year into 2025. It is our wish to develop a long-term mutually beneficial relationship with DA. Allow me to finish with a few remarks on your theme of political innovation. Our societies are facing similar challenges right now. The coronavirus is obviously one of those, but growing polarization and populism in politics is definitively another one. The issue of growing populism are complex and merits an elaborated and thoughtful discussion. Recently, we have seen the ugly face of populism at its worst, domestic terrorism in the United States. How can we innovate politics to bridge the widening gap between politicians and citizens? People want real solutions to real problems. People want politicians who are open for dialogue and leading from not from behind to harness just more votes. That's where innovation comes into the frame. With societies developing extremely quickly and technological innovations doubling every other year, past solutions won't do. This requires new ways of taking decisions, of involving citizens and communicating politics. I wish you good luck with your innovation summit. I'm sure you will have interesting discussions today. Thank you for providing me with this opportunity and I hope to see you soon in real life when we are allowed to travel again. Have a nice day. Bye bye. On the 5th of March 2020, South Africa's first COVID-19 case was confirmed. A few days later, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic. The Western Cape government had been planning and putting measures in place before the first case was diagnosed and stepped up to the challenge of defeating the coronavirus and saving livelihoods. The DA-led government rolled out intense community screening, education and testing, prioritizing vulnerable patients who are most at risk from the virus. All regional and district hospitals were set up to admit COVID-19 patients, and all provincial healthcare facilities could test and diagnose. Special facilities were set up to increase hospital capacity for the expected peak. For example, the CTICC Convention Center was transformed into the largest field hospital in Africa in just six weeks and helped more than 1,500 patients while it was open. The Red Dot Tax Initiative was created to take care of the hard-working healthcare workers, transporting nurses to and from work safely and on time, carrying over 70,000 passengers to date. In partnership with Uber, 700,000 parcels of chronic medication have been delivered to patients' homes. 
53 million rand was allocated towards helping vulnerable residents have a decent meal during the hard lockdown. This included distributing food parcels and cooked meals and running a special school feeding program while learners were at home. Initiatives such as the Western Cape COVID-19 Business Relief Fund committed 27 million rand to supporting small businesses in both the formal and informal sectors which have been hard hit by COVID-19 restrictions. While other provinces were plagued by wide-scale corruption, the Western Cape Provincial Government shared all the details of their COVID-19 protective work gear procurement with the public. Where we govern, we will continue to put residents first, working hard to save lives and livelihoods. A stark reminder there of the challenges and obstacles that this pandemic has brought with it, the lives and livelihoods of so many people put at risk, but also the work that's being done to mitigate that as far as possible. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker on the theme of defeating COVID-19. And it's a man who's been at the forefront of combating COVID-19 and all its related consequences. Now, before Alan Windy began his political career, he was an entrepreneur and a business owner. His passion for improving his community led him to get into politics. He would go on to serve as the Western Cape Minister of Finance, Economic Development and Tourism, Agriculture, and the Minister for Community Safety before becoming Premier-elect of the Western Cape. During his election campaign, he was well known as the Jobs Premier because of his keen interest and commitment in growing the Western Cape's economy and creating jobs for the residents of this province. Alan is committed to improving government service delivery through innovation and new technology. Ladies and gentlemen, the Premier of the Western Cape, Mr. Alan Windy. A very, very good morning. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here today as part of this Innovation Summit uh, to share with you some of our lessons, some of our innovations uh, through this period of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. But to start with, what I really would like to say is that we've got partners here and uh, I think uh, having partners as part of this from international partners, the Danish, I think that's really amazing because it's also about not only the innovation that we can find in government, but I think it's also about democracy and how we also need to see innovation in democracy. And if there's a party that understands that, it's the Democratic Alliance. And for me, it's a great pleasure to be here to share some of those lessons, to share some of the insights. And I think probably the most important one for me as Premier in this province has been that we have created an enabling environment in our system. And not only from when I got there, uh, on, under the previous Premier, Premier Zilla, and then leading to myself, always trying to create an enabling environment in our government that enables officials, that enables teams to actually understand the problem and then try and find solutions to those problems. And uh, so I'm going to share with you a couple of these uh, insights and uh, specifically the innovations that uh, we uh, lived through in the last year. I'm going to start off with our field hospitals. So, of course, we knew that uh, COVID-19, the, uh, the need to have or not run out of beds was a real big one for us. And uh, I'll never forget, we, we were talking initially about tents, but we ended up saying, well, let's build the big field hospital in our CTICC, the convention center. And of course, uh, we built a, a field hospital of 886 beds uh, in uh, this, uh, this CDICC uh, hospital, or this hospital of hope that we built with uh, uh, 868 beds. And of course, we did that in six weeks. Now, that for me 
was the most amazing innovation. Because if we'd done it before COVID-19, if we'd said we're going to build this massive hospital, it probably would have taken us months and months and months of planning and probably months and months and months of procurement. So we learned huge lessons on innovation, not only in delivery of the actual uh, product, because the product itself was innovative. We had uh, oxygen and high nasal, high pressure nasal oxygen inside this field hospital. We had cutting edge world class um, disposal systems. Because, of course, you had to make sure that uh, you were dealing with the waste products coming out of this hospital, which could infect other people if they went to your dump sites. Uh, we enabled this field hospital with cutting edge Wi-Fi. And of course, it didn't actually start in this hospital. And this is also a story about how innovation happens in a government. The first field hospital we built was in Kailicha. It was a partnership with uh, Medicine Sans Frontiers, a small hospital uh, in partnership also with the city of Cape Town because we used the Tucson Center in Kailicha. And I remember the opening was going to be on the Tuesday and on the Saturday I decided to go and do a sneak visit, just go and make sure that uh, everything was ready for the opening. The last thing you want to do is uh, arrive and they're do doing finishing touches. And when I arrived, I walked into this field hospital and uh, the beds were out, the doctors were there, the nurses were getting training. But there was a lady walking around with a laptop and she looked very busy. And so I said to her, good day, uh, you know, who are you and what are you doing here? And she looked at me and said to me, but Premier, I'm in your department. And I apologized for her and uh, apologized to her. And, but she said to me, they normally sit behind desks in the IT section in the Premier's department. And they monitor IT at our schools, at our other departments. And they themselves decided that if we're going to have a field hospital, surely that field hospital should be Wi-Fi enabled. We'd been rolling out Wi-Fi and uh, connectivity and broadband for months and months and months and years to our, to our hospitals, to our schools. So they said, well, let's do exactly the same thing in the field hospital. And when I walked around with her, there were other uh, officials from our government and they were up ladders drilling in the ceiling. They didn't wait for public works or contractors. They just got up from behind their desks and enabled that field hospital. And that enablement and innovation then moved into this big field hospital and into every one of our field hospitals. The latest round now in the second wave, if you go to Kailicha or to Mitchell's Plain or out to some of the hospitals out in, uh, in Friedendahl, where we've, uh, where we've change spaces in our hospital to create those extra beds, you'll see piped oxygen, which was never there before. And you know that every single one of them are Wi-Fi enabled. So that kind of innovation and that uh, leadership that comes from within an organization is really key in government. You've got to enable it. Uh, and when you're always focusing on good governance, it's about plans, it's about audits, it's making sure that all of the, the finances are aligned. Sometimes you have really got to work extra hard to make sure that you enable that innovation. Another part of innovation is how during this uh, pandemic, we made sure that we were testing and trying new things. So dexamethasone. Um, here it was a drug that was a new drug and uh, linked with our universities and our hospitals. Our doctors were really happy to start testing and trying new things. And right now we've seen that uh, SAPRA has, has said that uh, ivermectin can now be tried or trialed. And so many doctors around the world have been trying this. So how do we make sure that these tests and these trials happen quickly? We measure them. And that's the, that's the kind of innovative environment that you've got to make sure you have in place. Um, just in this discussion about ivermectin, uh, I contacted the CEO of SAPRA and said, please, we need to meet with you because we need to make sure that we're creating this enabling environment. And they've agreed and we've got a meeting set up. Luckily, we've actually seen the, the proposal moving forward, but it's not only about ivermectin. There are other drugs as well that we need to make sure that we're mitigating risk. We will have a third wave. We must be innovating and mitigating risk for that third wave at the same time as rolling out our vaccines in this region. Another great innovation was uh, we found out right in the beginning the, the comorbidities were where people were losing lives. People who had high blood pressure, people who were obese, but of course the most uh, prominent one was diabetes. If you had diabetes, we knew that you were highly at risk if you got COVID-19 during this pandemic. And so, of course, if you, got, if you were a diabetic, you arrived in our system, and our data started showing us that if you went into ICU, you probably had a 50% chance of not making it. 
So again, our teams really looked at this conundrum and they said, well, how are we going to innovate? What are we going to do differently? And we started to understand that if your sugars were out of control, uh, your risks were way up. We've got databases of who our diabetes uh, patients are in our system. We were communicating through not only public but private sector, saying that uh, let's actually see if we can get ahead of the curve. We put our, our diabetes uh, patients on a database. We had our call center phoning them regularly, asking them what their sugar levels were like. Are they able to isolate themselves? Are they protecting themselves? Um, making sure that if they were going to uh, uh, get sick, we were, we were saying to people that you need to stay home and then call the call center. But if you were a diabetic, we would get you into the system so much sooner because if we got you earlier, instead of a 50% chance of not making it, we brought that right down to a 4% chance. And so there again, innovation saving lives during this pan pandemic. And then, of course, tech innovation. And we always pride ourselves as a, as a tech and innovation hub uh, as a region. I mean, at the moment, uh, the, this region, the, the Silicon Cape, which is the Cape uh, metro region and the, and the municipalities around, around us with our universities and our enabling environment, we are the, the tech capital of Africa. And uh, so also, how did we make sure we were having tech and innovation within our COVID-19 pandemic uh, programs and operations. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other tech, but in this slot, um, I think one that really stood out for me is uh, we, we've seen around the world robots are being used. And uh, robots were being used in uh, our Tigerberg hospital. And so, of course, when patients who were COVID-19 in ICU, they're absolutely isolated. And uh, every time a healthcare worker goes in or out, you're putting people at risk. Um, and so a robot was used. And a robot was used like that uh, picture with a tablet on it. And uh, you could communicate with the patient. You could connect the family with the patient using the iPad technology and connecting home to ward. And so innovation was used and tech was used uh, and in many, many more uh, instances, which I'll also uh, uh, talk about just now. I think another amazing innovation for me was our Red Dot Taxi service. And, uh, you know, normally in government, we are the regulator. Uh, we've got the traffic officials who are forever pulling over the uh, bad driving of a taxi or the outstanding fines of a taxi or a taxi driver who's perhaps breaking the speed limit. And uh, so we always seem to be at loggerheads with each other. But during this pandemic, an amazing partnership was built. And a partnership built between a tech company, between the taxi industry, and between a government. And uh, what our government did in our Transport and Public Works Department is they took this partnership and they said, we've got a problem. Our nurses need to get to our clinics and our hospitals. They need to get there because there's a curfew and they have to travel before the opening of curfew. And even if they travel after the opening of curfew, we also don't want our nurses and our healthcare workers and our doctors traveling in public transport because we are trying to minimize risk here. And of course, if you work in a COVID ward, we don't want you coming out of that COVID ward, getting in a, into public transport to go home. And so our nurses uh, would uh, use an app on their phone. They would book tomorrow morning's uh, uh, trip. That uh, system would then say in this street, we've got five nurses and a taxi would be dispatched at four o'clock in the morning and would come to your home, collect you and drop you at your hospital, at your place of work. And exactly the same thing that evening, this taxi service uh, would go back to the depot, be deep cleaned and wait for this evening where they would go out, collect that healthcare worker and make sure that they get home safely. And of course, so we built this new partnership between uh, the taxi industry and government. And this is leading to other innovations and us able to think about what does public transport look like in the future? And can we use technology to book trips? And you know, how do we get that right? Another part of innovation was how we changed our working environment. I want to first talk about our own parliament. It was almost seamless and immediate, where our parliament started its oversight work with committees actually having oversight of the work that we were doing. And especially in a pandemic, when you've got disaster declarations and you're trying to operate quickly, you've got to make sure that uh, we're mitigating risk of corruption, we're making sure that management is in place, 
And it's the most important thing in a democracy for me as a premier or the cabinet ministers in our cabinet, that the work that we are doing, we're pushing boundaries and working hard and innovating, that at the same time there's a parliamentary oversight. And uh, so throughout this pandemic, we had a special uh, committee and we were reporting regularly to the committee and giving them the updates of where we're at. At the same time, our own working environment. We, uh, this, this photograph that's on the screen here is our government meeting with the faith-based organizations in, in our province. And we have regular meetings, generally on a Friday evening, evening where we have designated ministers who would meet with the faith-based organizations because they are a network into society. We need behavioral change and we need to mitigate risk during this pandemic. And so we use technology, online, remote meetings. Our own meetings of cabinet and we had an extended cabinet. We normally used to meet every second week in cabinet. During this pandemic, we were meeting three times a week, and those three cabinet meetings were open to all municipalities across our province. So the districts were coming in online with all of our officials, and we were dealing with this pandemic in this open environment. We created an open um, a media platform where once a week we'd have a digicon and we would put out all of the detail to the public because we needed the public and government to all be working together. And this environment really enabled us to use tech and uh, I think move our government into a much more innovative thinking way. And uh, in doing so, while fighting a major pandemic, it was actually really exciting to be in government because you were enabling innovation, you were doing things differently, and you could feel the difference that you were making. We set ourselves the target of flattening the curve. And I always say that our curve in the province, you know, normally you'd see across the world and even across other provinces in our country, the virus curve would go up and then it would come down, sort of a volcano shape but not in our province. It would start to climb. We knew it was climbing. We'd mitigate, do all sorts of things, and you would see it would flatten and come down the other side. I always say that our curve is never a volcano. It's always the shape of Table Mountain. And we did it again in the second wave. Exactly the same thing. New variants, change in environments, but we managed to do it in the second wave as well. I think my favorite innovation during this time is the medicine deliveries. So if you think back pre-COVID-19, and uh, across our province, but across our country. I always think about those clinic visits. And you get to a clinic visit and you know that uh, people have been queuing since four o'clock in the morning. People in our country get up really early in the morning, they go to the clinic, they queue from very early, and they spend most of their day just to go and get their medicines. Now, who are these people? They are elderly and they are people with comorbidities, those diabetics that we were talking about. But anybody with a high blood pressure or any kind of comor comorbidity coming to get their medicines. And so, again, this didn't come from management. This came within the system. Officials in our government said, but this is, this is a massive risk to us. We have elderly people in comorbidity standing in queues for hours outside a clinic. Surely we are putting them at risk. How do we change that? We must get that medicine to them. They mustn't queue for the medicine. So again, we believe in partnerships using private sector and public. And so we did a partnership with the Gates Foundation, with Uber, with our own department and with NGOs. So for example, in Lunga, um, we had an NGO that was on the ground. And uh, so the Red Cross on the ground who do work on the ground in Lunga, they're already there. So they're the perfect partner. What we did was uh, we got Uber to come and collect the parcels. We know who are in the clinics because they come to fetch their medicines. So we just packed their medicines in our depot. The Uber would come along and collect the medicines for Lunga, go and deliver the medicines to the NGO in Lunga. They would then go street to street, deliver the medicine, but also do a screening at the same time and communicate around COVID-19. And suddenly people who were standing in queues were getting medicines delivered to their home. As I sit here today, we've delivered more than 1.2 million medicine parcels to citizens across this province. Now we can never slip back. This is an innovation that has changed people's lives and we've got to see more and more of these innovations happening. So it's the one that I think I'm the most proud of. At the same time, we've been rolling out for years, broadband, connecting our schools, making sure that uh, you know, tech and innovation is part of how we think in our DNA. But nothing pushed us as much as a, as a COVID-19 lockdown environment. And especially for me, the poorest of the poor, who we were enabling through connecting our schools and now suddenly couldn't go to school. 
So now you're sitting at home, you can't even use the family computer if you've got one or your phone because you don't have the data because that data was put in at the school. And so we've always been talking about it, but I think what happened is in our system, our education department really started to up the game. Although we'd been working on it for a long time, it really forced us to think differently. And now we package those class, classrooms, uh, those classes, we make sure you can download them and take them home, and it really moved it to a next level. We also did it with libraries. We can now, you can actually, we've digitized libraries, and now at school you download those books you want to read, you take them home on your device. And so it's actually helped us to push those boundaries of innovation within our schools. Then, of course, uh, feeding, and I know that uh, some of the speakers are also going to talk about, uh, about feeding in some of our municipalities, which has also been great in innovation. But I think this has also been a big challenge for us. You know, when everything went into lockdown, um, we knew that people were hungry. And uh, our call center was set up. We, we partnered with private sector. We were receiving thousands and thousands of calls every day to say, please, I'm running out of food. And this is also an area where innovation stepped in. I don't want to take uh, too much uh, away from uh, a future pres presenter on what happened in Drakenstein about their vouchers, but it's about those kind of things. How do we put a voucher in place that actually can be spent at a local spaza shop or a small business because you're helping uh, keep the economy ticking? But for us, it was also about our school children who get uh, a meal every single day. And despite the pressure that was put on us uh, from a national level to say all feeding at schools must stop, we stood our ground. We, set, we, we enabled our school feeding system. We might have tweaked it and changed it that you could take your meal and take it home. And we also found out you probably had to expand that meal a little bit because it wasn't just the learner, because the learner was going home to a family that also had no food. Um, we were actually having to make sure that there was uh, social distancing uh, mechanisms to make sure that this could happen safely, but we continued through the lockdown to feed. Our, our environment, I mean, our, our social development department also built partnerships across local governments. We put budget into it. We made sure that meals were being delivered. We also did a test of what happens if it really gets bad and we actually have to start creating these food depots with uh, single drops of a nourishing meal, um, which we actually tested in some uh, environments, which would be if we had to get even worse than we were now, where you weren't getting a, a fully balanced meal, where we were probably just dropping off a highly uh, high protein sustenance single pack, uh, perhaps a porridge. We did some tests like that as well. But we also managed to GIS map our feeding. So when a parcel was delivered to a home with another partner, DHL, they would GIS map the dropping of that food parcel. That was connected back to our call center, so the call center could then say, hang on a second, we've actually delivered that parcel because the person phoned in, or when the person phoned in, we would be able to check up and say, but hang on a second, you got a parcel yesterday. And so using data and understanding there was a problem, but using that data and innovation also helped us to manage uh, how this pandemic rolled out. And of course, we could also then produce heat maps, so we could see if there were communities that were really hungry and other ones that were doing okay. Okay, because the heat map would show us this was where the calls were coming from and this is where the need needed to step in and we could actually make sure we transferred money or food itself to that region. Then, of course, human settlements. Uh, in this area, I was going to say a lot more about this app and uh, how we're using technology, but again, I think I'm not going to do it justice. I'd rather leave that to uh, the mayor of Stellenbosch, uh, who's also going to talk about this app and how apps actually in the future are going to be how government and services are managed, monitored, delivered, and how we interact and how you can very quickly understand um, customer satisfaction on the ground or uh, probably the most important for a government, where the greatest need is and what kind of need and what kind of solution you need to build because your data is actually going to give you real-time understanding of what's happening, whether it's the human settlement component or any other kind of service that your government is offering you. We need to use technology so that we can have a much shorter, closer interface with the citizens that we need to serve. I spoke about... Uh, our openness and our, and our weekly uh, chat to the citizens of this province, what we also did is we managed to develop a dashboard. And this dashboard is the COVID-19 health dashboard, but I also spoke about the other dashboards. And if you go onto our website, you can actually link to this one, but you can link to the food one. You can link to the other ones that are being developed. But this was the pioneer. It was our COVID-19 dashboard 
updated daily and uh, it gave you all the data that you wanted right down to your suburb level so you could see it on heat maps you could see where the virus was moving to you could see the cases per age group you could see the cases per hundred thousand you could see where the different innovations were coming in and of course what we did on the back of the dashboard is we divided it up into a management uh, 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 process where we had hotspots and uh, those hotspots had teams so our, our senior management team we you know we were we were just everyone was focusing on COVID-19 and those reportings came back to this extended cabinet by those districts um, which was replicated in the dashboard so the citizens could see what was happening but also from a management point of view we were using this data to make decisions on where to deploy where to make sure we've got extra beds make sure that we had mechanisms to deal with death as well I remember right in the very beginning saying that our learnings from specifically what was happening in Italy before we'd even had a case. We're not going to run out of hospital beds and I don't want coffins piling up and every single thing in between. And this dashboard was a key of how we used innovation in a communication tool. And the exciting part for me is uh, during the or just towards the end of the first pandemic uh, or the first wave of the pandemic, uh, our dashboard won an award, an award where in, it was a tech award where we were competing against other private sector companies and tech companies. And here a government, a health department with a dashboard, won an award for the tech and innovation. And of course, that was the first one we've, we've uh, won. We've, uh, we've now won more. We've won uh, the Best Tech in Africa Award uh, and a third award now as well for this dashboard. And that also makes me feel very proud of, of the team that we have here in the Western Cape. Another, another set of data that we, we built a while ago that we used definitely during this time was the Sentinel, Sentinel Trauma Report. We measure in our five hospitals trauma, and that trauma is from gunshots to knife wounds. That trauma is alcohol-related um, trauma that ends up in our hospitals. Uh, drug-related, any kind of trauma that takes space in our ICU units, we measure it. And we need to understand what the causes are so we can start to fix the problem. During this pandemic, this data was used definitely in how we managed um, to, inf to put information into the system to make decisions around how uh, different levels of lockdown could be managed. And in the second wave, when we, it was very different to the first wave, we based all of our data on the first wave and going into the second wave, we realized that there was a second strain and that second strain was much more infectious. We might have same detail uh, or, or same uh, proportions um, of, of, of uh, hospitalization, of ICU beds, etc. But it was much faster and it was going to reach a higher peak. And at one stage, uh, although we don't like um, closing down an economy, this information gave us the detail to say we need to support a 14-day alcohol slowdown in the system so that we can protect and save those trauma beds for people who need them in COVID-19. The work that we've done in this trauma management, which feeds back into our safety plan, that knows where we must focus. We've got to be data-led data uh, in everything that we do as a government. And so now we're rolling this out to 23 of our health facilities, so we'll be able to even get a better idea of trauma across our province. And then, of course, understanding that data gives us the ability to actually react or make changes that are needed. Another system that we used was wastewater measurement. We picked up that uh, if you need an early warning system, and of course we always knew from international best practices, test, test, test. If you test, you know what's going on. But unfortunately, at many times during the pandemic, testing was not able to be 100% accurate. Um, and sometimes we had to slow down testing and make choices on only people with comorbidities or elderly could be tested and not everybody. And so we started testing the wastewater. And the wastewater testing would tell, tell us COVID-19 parts per million. And it would become an early warning system. And of course, managing COVID-19 when it's not in the height of your, of your, or in a peak, when you've got a much more open economy is quite critical. You've got to make sure that if we call them bushfires, if you suddenly start to see a wedding or a funeral was a, was a, a starter of a whole lot of infections, you need to know it and you need to know it early. So our wastewater system, which we're now testing in more and more parts of our province, we test that wastewater. It tells us, hang on a second, there are cases building up in this municipality 
visibility on this suburb, we know we need to zoom in, find out what's causing the spread of the virus in the suburb. Technology at its very best. And of course, this technology is going to be used for other things as well. Um, you know, we could test drugs, drug usage by, by community. We could test uh, other viruses by community. And so it's a great innovation that actually gives us as government many, many parts of early warning. I think lastly, I want to just talk about uh, our economy and uh, innovation within how to, how to handle a pandemic. And uh, specifically, as lockdowns were coming, as people were being asked to stay at home, as airlines were stopping flight between different countries, a key component of our, of our economy is the tourism industry. And suddenly, you know, people were, were losing their livelihoods. Businesses were closing. And of course, there again, even in the economic space, how do we innovate? And I mean, this, was a, this, uh, this photograph talks about a campaign where we knew that as we were opening up our economy, people weren't able to go overseas. And we knew a lot of people were planning, had trips, and they were going to cancel them. So we put a, a campaign together which showcased in our province that in actual fact, the whole world exists in our province. And we showcased that Nisner and Nisner Lagoon could have been Bali. And of course, so suddenly that person who was traveling to Bali was saying, well, let's go to Nisner rather. And so the Cedarberg and the mountains or the coast of Noveskis or and wherever it was, we were showcasing these experiences in our winelands versus perhaps France. And so suddenly we were saying to people, the whole world exists in this province. And we were using technology and innovation alongside with an ad campaign to make sure we were keeping the economy going. And I'm pretty certain that this campaign is probably going to win some awards as well. And of course, always making sure that uh, that's our job. We've got to make sure we're getting the balance right while uh, innovating and fighting a virus, uh, fighting a pandemic at the same time, innovating and make sure that we, we find ways that it's actually best in getting services to our citizens. That's our job. We are in government to make sure that where we govern, things get better. And of course, uh, that's one thing that I can say, and I'm super proud of the team in the Western Cape. We've enabled innovation, and we have got so many more innovations than, than, than just this that I've managed to, to share with you today. But it is really key that wherever we govern, we create an enabling environment so that with the private sector and government sector, we can partner, innovate, and make it a much better space for the citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Premier Windy, for that very comprehensive look at the actions and innovations taken in the Western Cape. And not only just a box ticking exercise, but real actions and innovations that improve and change and help the lives of citizens from the elderly, the infirm, the most vulnerable right across our province. And we'll have a chat to Premier Windy a little later on our panel discussion. Our next speaker is from the Drakenstein municipality, which is the largest municipality in the Western Cape outside of the metro. Now, Lauren Waring is the Executive Director of Planning and Development at the Drakenstein University. Uh, Lauren has served as the Municipal Manager of Neisner Municipality, as well as Director of Community Services and Director of Planning and Development. Lauren has vast leadership experience in local government. She has consulted to government and the private sector on a broad range of topics and has held positions on various boards. Highly skilled and hands-on, Lauren is a results-driven executive, a skilled strategist and a resilient negotiator. She doesn't hesitate to take those tough decisions and then to ensure that they are implemented as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Lauren Waring. Good morning, everybody. As Richard has indicated, my job is the di Executive Director for Planning and Development in Drakenstein Municipality. But during the first wave of COVID and during the hard lockdown, I had a side hustle, and that side hustle was uh, food security and food support, um, which has now become a passion of mine. It was a great honour to be able to serve the most vulnerable within the city of Drakenstein, and it's also an honour to be able to share the, my experiences with you this morning. So to start off, let me say that local communities are not particularly interested in which government department or which government sphere of government uh, for, 
is responsible for fulfilling the ver their various functions to meet their needs. All local communities want to know is that those needs are fulfilled and they look to their local representatives for that leadership. And so it was in Drakenstein when COVID-19 broke out in the, in the country in March last year and then when we went into the first hard lockdown in uh, the end of April last year. So from the start, there was an immense pressure on our executive mayor, Mayor Conrad Poole, and um, his councillors to, to do something and to be seen to be doing something in order to alleviate the local health, social, as well as economic impacts of the pandemic in our city. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to take you through the process that we followed to be able to provide food aid and then also for quite important learnings that we are now um, inculcating in the work we do. So in the first few weeks of lockdown um, in April 2020, we obviously tried to get to grips with the unmitigated pandemic and focusing on things like um, supporting our health workers, uh, ensuring law enforcement. You will recall that there were a number of, of um, security and safety issues um, during the lockdown, undertaking waste management, ensuring our cemeteries had space, and then obviously assisting businesses. And that you know, was from spaza shops and um, our informal traders, right up to the blue chip JC listed companies. And all of this we had to do whilst ensuring that we were fulfilling our um, service delivery mandate of it providing the basic utilities to our local community in order to maintain them as well as our businesses and our economy. Locally, um, we from the start expected that provincial and national government would step in to deal with the social food and, and humanitarian aid. Unfortunately, it soon became clear that um, supply chain issues um, and other red tape um, was hampering the rollout from the from national um, at, uh, at and to some, some extent from province as well. Um, it was also unfortunate that there was a lack of um, understanding of the local context which also impacted on the rollout. So we decided to work together initially with the Department of Social Development um, in terms of supporting and aiding our soup kitchens as a start, but this was a, obviously the tip of an iceberg. At the same time, um, our executive mayor put out a plea to local businesses to provide us with food hampers. The response, unfortunately, was less than overwhelming, but completely understandable in the circumstances because so many businesses, businesses were uncertain of what lay ahead and chose to focus on assisting their employees. Relatively early in the process, we also got a, a um, circular from National Treasury warning that there should be no mandate creep and that all spheres of government and all departments must focus on what their mandates are and that no public funds within the local government sphere were to be spent on food hampers. Um, they also confirmed that the responsible departments would be taking on this, this role. So in Drakenstein, we very early on took the position that we would not take on functions um, of other authorities, but rather focus on our responsibilities and mandates. Uh, we were very aware that um, there was a strong likelihood that whatever we did would be audited, um, both from a national, provincial, as well as um, at our local level in terms of the AG and internal audit. However, pressure mounted um, from our community as they saw what work was being undertaken by other municipalities, um, and particularly in regard to food hampers um, being distributed and the publication of that, the publicizing of that on, on social media. Fortunately, our province indicated um, not long after that what grants would be available to local government, and um, we were happy to be in the position that we had the means to support our local community, um, but at that stage we still did not have the actual process. Now, one thing that COVID reinforced um, was that local community and social structures are far more nimble, proactive and innovative in a time of crisis. Um, to use that much used phrase, uh, they, could, they found it a lot easier to pivot um, during the pandemic. So whilst government was grappling with the how, the civil society was already doing. Our mayor appointed a, um, one of his MACO members, Councillor Larisha van Nikark, to work with the administrative team to develop 
a process of distribution as well as identification of the um, potential beneficiaries. For us, the biggest issues were logistics, so how to get the food aid to where it needed to be, how to identify, the, identify those who were in need, and then how to prevent double dipping. After a series of brainstorm sessions, I managed to contact a local um, non-profit company who had a long history of working with about 200 NGOs, ECDs, C CBOs, etc. And they were in the, starting to roll out food aid to about 4,000 households throughout the valley um, through their partners. We then decided to enter into an MOU with this MPC whereby we would um, transfer the provincial grant to the, the MPC, and they would then use their logistics and distribution and supply chain um, processes wow. to um, acquire, pack, and distribute to their community partners. And then the partners, in turn, would um, deliver to the doorstep of the beneficiary. All of our packs um, that were went out from the NPC was branded with Drakenstein stickers, City of Drakenstein stickers, as it was important that our beneficiary community as well as the broader community um, were able to see the work that we were undertaking. The beneficiary identification took place through um, ward councillors, PR councillors and ward committees. Um, and at this stage, it was really it became really important the role of the MMC councillor for NICAC. She pro provided a very strong interface um, between the local politicians, the local councillors, and the admin team. And that this freed up the admin team to um, focus on the process. Um, a small team comprising of myself and a colleague, uh, we vetted the potential beneficiaries, um, taking various data sets, such as our indigency list, um, ID numbers, uh, addresses, employee lists, uh, cell phone numbers, and so forth, in order to ensure that we had a database um, that could withstand uh, audits and scrutiny. Ultimately, we wanted to spatially render this database so that we would be able to see where the vulnerable, the traditionally vulnerable, as well as the new, newly vulnerable, in other words, those people who had recently lost jobs and had to rely on, on the state and other aid agencies, we wanted to be able to see where they were um, situated spatially and what were the hotspots. We also developed an app which we made available to our, our partners um, in order to be able to undertake the field work. This app then uploaded in real time the, the data and we were able to utilise that for our dashboards which would further inform uh, what we needed to do and where we needed to focus. We proactively um, and energetically reached out to all aid agents um, to try and get uh, their list as well as of beneficiaries that they were supporting, as well as where the food aid was coming from. Um, everybody recognised the need to spread the aid as far as possible and to prevent double dipping as far as possible. It was understandable that people were desperate and whatever list became available, uh, they would put their names on. A lot of them did not believe that government would be able to support them, um, and they, people were desperate. People were desperate for aid. From Drakenstein's side, we offered our um, aid partners um, the checking for double dipping. Um, we also offered to maintain a central database to spatially render it, and then ultimately make this information available to them um, for their own purposes. Uh, the, I would say that the private entities, civil society, were far more willing to collaborate. They obviously saw the benefits of it very early on. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same about some government departments who um, one or two of them outright just refused to collaborate with us. And, and today, till to, till to today, the, the, the reason for this remains a mystery, unfortunately. So, we, we proceeded to get all of our backroom information in place, and as we were about to roll out the food hampers to our beneficiaries, we were told by the NPC that their partners had applied the brakes. What happened was that because the partners had had um, historical relations with the beneficiaries that they were assisting, they were less w willing and less able to be able to assist our part, our, our beneficiaries, because A, they had no 
relationship with our beneficiaries. They did not know where they would be going into. They did not know what the conditions were in terms of contamination. There was increasing unrest and violence. And they, we had seen in Drakenstein, as we saw in the rest of the country, looting of vehicles as well as depots. So we needed to make an alternative plan. There wasn't time to try and debate this and try and convince people otherwise. We needed to make a plan and we needed to find a way to get the aid as speedily as possible to people who have been waiting now for weeks for a, for a food hamper. Fortunately, our partner, had our NP, the NPC we were working with, had been experimenting with the viability and feasibility of e-vouchers. And we entered into discussions in this regard, and it was agreed then that we would transfer, we would still transfer our provincial grant to the NPC, and they would in turn con expand their contract with the um, e-voucher company in order to be able to uh, distribute e-vouchers on our behalf. So we immediately had to launch a, a, a communication campaign to ensure that the uh, beneficiaries understood the move from hampers to vouchers. And we did this via um, pamphlets, uh, we did WhatsApp clips for councillors, um, for ward committee members to send out, uh, we had SMS, print media, print media, Facebook, YouTube, a range of, of communication platforms to ensure that our communities and those beneficiaries who would be receiving the vouchers understood what the voucher entailed and the process around it. So ultimately, we had about a 30% unredeemed vouchers. Um, and this is understandable because many people were suspicious of the vouchers. They were suspicious of, uh, of fishing. Some people had never worked with vouchers. They'd never heard of vouchers. And then there were some who just didn't believe that it would work and deleted the vouchers. Now, on this slide, um, I've set out a full breakdown. There we go. Um, it shows the full breakdown of the various forms of aid food aid, the origin thereof, as well as the extent of the services um, that was provided. Eventually, after Drakenstein received about 7,000 household um, details, which probably made up about 35,000 persons, we were able to assist um, about just under 5,000 um, households, 4,952, by the time that we closed the project in September. We also recognised that rural and farm dwellers were unable to access the participant retailers. So we distributed about 340 um, food hampers to these community members um, and, and this greatly assisted them because obviously they didn't have transport fees um, which would uh, impact on, their, on their, you know, their available capital or household income. And many of these were personally delivered by the mayor, which also had a, had an, uh, a great impact on, on these um, households. Um, we estimate that over 200,000 persons were assisted in Drakenstein during the first wave and the hard lockdown. And this is some two-thirds of our population in Drakenstein. Our total population is just over 305,000. Um, and this is a, a significant number of people um, required assistance during this time. All right, so moving on to the lessons learned. Now, the pandemic was obviously exacerbated by the initial focus on, on the health aspects, and it's understandable, but the economic and social impacts did lag um, a little bit in the beginning. The impact of the job of job losses um, and the latest assessments that, I, that I've been reading indicate that after this uh, lockdown, we could be looking at upwards of 50% unemployment um, for the country. And then, obviously, the reticence of government, government to collaborate, particularly in the early days, all exacerbated the situation. In order to move forward towards food security, there are four learnings that we in Drakenstein are taking forward into our daily work. And this, hopefully, will make us more resilient for any future shocks. Firstly, an early learning was that unless we were able to work together and to collaborate together, we would not be able to address the expectations and the needs of our people. As indicated, government tended to be more reticent in this regard. I don't think that on the ground any of us realised what a long haul it was going to be. And as time 
uh, went by, relationship matured, and so did the collaboration. The work that's been done by the Western Cape Economic Development Partnership and the Community Action Network are examples of how, when and why to collaborate. And the result is that over 50% of all food aid that um, was distributed in, in the Western Cape during the first lockdown emanated from civil society. Now, a particular space that we are looking to improve collaboration in Drakenstein is the equitable and fair distribution of food. For example, we had a rural ward south of the N1, in an area called Simondium, which only had one soup kitchen. And the soup kitchen fed about 300 persons at a maximum. The area, the, the soup kitchen, is surrounded by farmlands and very willing and very kind farmers who regularly donated, so much so that there was an excess of food um, at the soup kitchen on a number of occasions. Supply well exceeded the demand. However, less than three kilometres away, in an area called, generally called Pal East, where there were three soup kitchens, these kitchens could maybe only operate once a week due to a scarcity of food. They simply did not have the food, they did not have the supply, and they did not have a certainty that of when food would supply. So this imbalance desperately needs to be um, mitigated. Moving forward, in order to try and mitigate this situation, we're working with our, our, the, the MPC to try and develop a virtual warehouse where those that can support and, and can supply food can upload their, their goods onto, uh, into the virtual warehouse. And then soup kitchens or other um, um, aid agents can then be allocated or draw down their requirements as and when needed. And an offshoot of this is that um, we working with neighbourhood and household gardens where excess within those subsistence gardens can also be then be traded in the virtual warehouse. Secondly, communication. We all realised that the, that the public was hungry for communication in the strange new world of COVID. Internally, we had updates and communiques to the community, our councillors, our partners and staff. And in this regard, it was clear that the communiques from our mayor uh, carried the most weight. As I indicated early on in, in this morning, um, people want to be led, uh, they want to see leadership happening, and so having a strong and focused leadership is paramount. Jocks were established at a local, a district, and obviously a provincial level to assist not only with managing um, information from, uh, from the bottom up, but vice versa. Now, unfortunately, the communication working downwards did not work as well as the communication that was going up towards a provincial level. And so at some times, the responses that we received at the jocks were inadequate or lacking in detail or perhaps lacking in understanding of the local comparisons, of the local situation, apologies. Um, attempts were made to utilise electronic systems to ensure that issues were collated and fed through to the correct points as expeditiously as possible. Um, but I think in future, we need to really work on improving um, th this, these systems. The Premier spoke about data, data collection and the importance thereof, and much has been written about it as well. At the time of a pandemic or any disaster, the value of data is immeasurable. And the finer grain, the data, the better the planning and the response can be. We need to know where people are who need our assistance. And we need to know where the food is coming from in order to be able to assist. We knew about governments, we knew social aid organisations, we knew about NGOs and so forth. But what we didn't know, and we couldn't, there was no way of tracking, were the individual churches, organisations, um, you know, aunties on the, on, the, on the street corners who were providing meals on a daily basis to thousands of people within our city. They often operated under the radar and continue to operate under the radar with no help from government, relying rather on histor histor historical networks. We estimated at the height of the pandemic there were over 3,000 such organisations, groupings and individuals who at some point provided aid. Unfortunately, we only have details of approximately 10% of those, those um, organisations or persons. So government 
and particularly local government, must start to garner household level data and contacts in order to inform, communicate and assist in a targeted manner when needed. We must start to map the full social safety net for future needs and demands. There were existing data sets, such as soup kitchen beneficiaries, but they were limited. And if we had contact details, we could have reached out to these people as well to ensure that they had received assistance and sufficient assistance. Internal data capturing within the organization of the municipality has had to improve significantly and data integrity from input through to storage, rendering and use thereof has become a key focus of our municipality. Fourthly, it was a consistent source of, of discomfort for me personally that goods and services which were intended to alleviate a local socio-economic crisis, which was as a result of an international health crisis, were being procured outside of my municipality's boundaries. Local businesses, local people were suffering, but government was procure, was not using its its resources to spend and to capacitate locally and thus attempt to alleviate local hardship. For example, we were receiving food parcels that were being procured in Pretoria, taking up to a month to get to Paul, when locally there were two businesses who have ongoing contracts with the United Nations and were able, would have been able to roll out en masse within 48 hours at significantly less cost than what government was spending in Pretoria. We need to link food relief to, to lo local micro enterprises. And we need to find a way to bring spaza shops, corner shops, and informal traders into the circle and into the food supply process, particularly when use is being made of vouchers. It is estimated that up to 54% of micro enterprises are food related. COVID shut down our local providers. COVID rendered them without an income and without business. And then when they were able to trade again and to operate again on the, you know, within the, their trading bays or within their house shops, we were providing aid vouchers for people to utilize within the big box retailers, not to those local um, micro enterprises. But the Premier's Office, the EDP and the DG Murray's Trust have done some wonderful and innovative work on the utilisation of vouchers in micro-enterprises. And the learnings from that now will be garnered within um, the food aid processes that we in Drakenstein would ha probably have to um, look at again in future. So in closing, from school closures to deaths of loved ones, to devastated industries and millions of jobs lost, the economic costs of the pandemic are measured in many, many ways. The long-term societal impacts of COVID-19 are widening um, inequalities worldwide. The social disruption that was caused by the pandemic and is being caused by the pandemic is devastating. Millions of people are at risk of falling into extreme poverty and the number of undernourished and malnourished people is increasing exponentially. There will be major impacts on the global economy, geopolitics and our, on our societies. There are going to be more pandemics and there will be other national and international disasters. And it's clear that all of these global impacts and risks are highly interde interdependent and all the responses and solutions are multi-pronged. And but, but, it, but whatever the response and the solution, local authorities and government must continue to be people-centric and resilient. We must demand a whole of society approach. And this is in order to move from a shared focus to shared solutions, to move from a reactive mode to one that is sustainable and, pro and one of, that is of proactive readiness. And we must be able to move from providing food aid towards food security for all. And that's not only in a time of crisis. I thank you. Thank you very much for that, Lauren Waring, for that insightful look into something that is a critical aspect of life for many in South Africa, and that is food security in a crisis. We've seen what has been done, we've seen what need, you've told us what needs to be done, and this is great for lessons going forward. Um, food security is always something that we have to be very, very aware of and very, very uh, intent on helping people where it's necessary.
Now, our next speaker is well known to many of the participants online at the summit today. Alderman James Foss is the mayoral committee member for economic opportunities in the city of Cape Town. His portfolio comprises a combination of tourism enterprise and investment department with those of the city's extensive asset management departments. This allows for important synergies and levers in driving economic growth. He previously served as Member of Parliament in the National Assembly as the Shadow Minister of Tourism. James continues to work towards achieving inclusive economic growth and his vast experience and expertise have been invaluable in finding ways to keep the wheels turning in a time where national lockdown rules make doing business and keeping people in work extremely difficult. Ladies and gentlemen, Alderman James Foss. Good morning, colleagues. I'm excited to share the many innovative interventions we developed to help businesses deal with the devastating effects of the imposed lockdowns. The fact is that we need to get our local economy back on its feet as fast as possible, but also to build a much stronger and more resilient economy for future generations. And this is why we've developed so many far-ranging programs and interventions, and I'm excited to share them with you today. So, starting with some of the relief and support measures we came up with. We did this because businesses across all sectors are struggling to stay open, especially during the ANC-imposed lockdown of our economy. So in the response to this, and to ensure that we keep as many businesses going as possible, we provided rates relief for certain categories of tourism properties. We've also introduced rental remissions for businesses renting city-owned premises. And on the screen, you will see some other innovative measures we implemented, such as the business retention and expansion initiatives. And the aim of this is to ensure that we keep businesses open and even expand their operations during the most difficult times. For example, through this program, we could manage to save 1,580 jobs in the manufacturing sector in Atlantis. And we also assisted many clothing factories across Cape Town to retain jobs by pivoting their production towards the manufacturing of PPE, such as face masks and also medical protective wear. Moving on, my team and I spent much of the first weeks of the beginning of the pandemic reviewing the business plans of our strategic business partners. We did this because the city provides funding to many of these strategic business partners in the sectors of clothing and textile, call centers, marine manufacturing, tourism and hospitality. And so we wanted to reprioritize the funding to where it was most needed. And I'm very proud to confirm that in the last six months, during the hardest lockdown, we facilitated more than 8,8 .8 billion rand worth of new investments and created just over 5,000 new jobs. Now, colleagues, a prime example of today's theme of innovation, and a first of its kind, was the rollout of the SMME COVID-19 toolkit. Now, we know that many businesses were struggling financially to implement workplace safety measures required to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. So my team and I came up with the idea for the SMME COVID-19 toolkit. And these toolkits contained a starter kit of hand sanitizer, face masks, and a wealth of printed material to display in their businesses. So on the slide, you can see me handing out some of the thousands of the toolkits to business owners across the city and at many of our distribution points. And our toolkit has even been recognized internationally as a best practice model for workplace readiness at the Cities Against COVID-19 online, online Global Summit in Korea. And so by identifying a key constraint faced by many SMMEs and delivering a simple and effective solution, we distributed thousands of toolkits to businesses so that we could help them stay open during these difficult times. Now, colleagues, the next order of business. We launched the Business Hub to help people of Cape Town set up or improve their businesses. And all of our operations moved online. 
This unit cut through the confusion of the national regulations about how to operate during lockdowns. We also helped them understand what relief packages were available and how to access them. And so the business hub adapted its structure and moved all of its operations online. And we did so so that we could assist businesses adapt to the disruptions flowing from the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm very proud to say that over the last year, we helped almost 2,808 small businesses by giving advice on how to get startup funding, draw up a business plan, as well as smart procurement and supply development training, costing and pricing, business licenses, as well as permits. And next month, colleagues, I will be launching our first of its kind, a fully kitted mobile business hub. It will be a panel van with screens and desks, which we will then be able to go to communities where businesses operate so that we can take the service closest to where it matters. And then I will also be using this mobile hub a few days a week. Uh, as my office to then see to the, our constituents, specifically those within the business sector. And another two exciting programs run through the Business Hub include the Women in Tech Training Program and the Future Tech Business Incubator Program. Now, to support female entrepreneurs, we fund the top Tech Tools for Women in Business program. Now, this is a flagship program that gives training to more than 200 participants in Cape Town. And also through our long-standing partnership with the Small Enterprise Development Agency and together with training provided by Fern Tech, unemployed young people received training in furniture making and upholstery. Now, these learners come from areas such as Nyanga, Kuguletu, Kailicha, Mufaleni and Mitchell's Plain and were provided with the skills they need to set up their own businesses in furniture making. Next up, was our swift response to help businesses struggling with productivity and expansion. So we came up with the Business in Distress program and we joined forces with Productivity SA to provide businesses with the help they need to succeed. Now this program will help small businesses which employ between 15 to 50 employees by putting the pieces back together so that we can prevent further job losses or business closures. And so during the toughest of times, I visited three factories in the clothing sector, the food and beverage sector, and another in the electronics manufacturing. And we were able to assist all of these businesses during our business support program. And I'm very proud to say that our interventions have enabled all of them to expand immensely. And now the clothing company supplies uniforms to big corporates, the food company is supplying popular restaurants, and the electronic manufacturer is even exporting products now to China. Colleagues, we know that our local businesses are vital for job creation, but many businesses struggle with knowing what training and assistance is available and where to access it. This is why we came up with the Enterprise and Supply Development Program. And so over the last six months, these programs have supported 380 businesses through supporting township infrastructure with increased electricity supply in Langa as part of our Pick and Pay Spaza Shop Conversion Program. Also through the South African Renewable Energy Business Incubator in Atlantis, we support 15 small enterprises. A further call for participants in this program will be issued soon. And we also trained 362 community vendors on how to do business with government, on pricing and on costing. Colleagues, we know that municipal governments are significant buyers of goods and services, supporting many of our businesses. Therefore, we came up with a smart procurement program to improve the supply performance and help small businesses compete for big business. So we moved many of our workshops online and we broadened the participation that many SMMEs can showcase their products to big corporates and a bigger buyer audience. And also the smart procurement model promotes then access to markets and training for SMMEs while providing them with a platform to really showcase their unique Cape Town products and services. And so we've been able to help thousands of small businesses grow and create many more work opportunities. 
Colleagues, on this slide you will see me standing proud with call center operators. This is a call center now employing 1,200 people and opened its doors during the hard lockdown. And in the last three months alone, through the city's funding, we could help create 2,633 additional jobs in the business process outsourcing or call center sector. Secondly, we came up with a program that will train, pay stipends and do job placements for youth and women in the business process outsourcing or call center sector, as well as the clothing and textile sector. And we call this the Cape Skills and Employment Accelerator Program. Cape Town is the first municipality to work with the National Skills Fund to roll out this program that does not train for training's sake, but it is designed to create skills pipelines for these high growth sectors so that we can provide training and work place placement for Cape Townians. So in the clothing and textile sector, we provide uh, a project where SMMEs can take on machinists at a greatly reduced cost while creating learning and workplace uh, training for unemployed women. And in the call center sector, the project will train operators and do job placements. And in the first year, we anticipate that 3,300 Cape Townians will receive training and job placement through the Cape Skills and Employment Accelerator program. And colleagues, last week, applications for the learnerships in the clothing sector closed. And next week, I'll be announcing that applications are open for learnerships in the call center BPO sector. And that is an exciting announcement that will happen very soon. So colleagues, often in my interactions with businesses, I hear how they struggle to source the talent and skills they need to sustain and grow their businesses. And so to address this so-called disconnect, we came up with a workforce development program called Jobs Connect. And through the Jobs Connect program, we aim to create a better link between supply and demand of people seeking employment. And so through this program, unemployed residents will receive work readiness training. And so with a focus on women and youth, this work readiness training that they will go through will be able to allow big corporates to source this particular talent that they need. And so then they will be entered into a database which is shared with prospective employers who will then have access to trained potential employees. And in the last year, more than 1,100 people received training and were placed in jobs by this program. Colleagues, make no mistake, municipal processes can often be tedious and complex for investors. So we came up with a plan to make it easier for local and global investors to land their operations successfully in our city through the establishment of a dedicated investment facilitation unit. Now, this unit helps navigate municipal processes, they clear bottlenecks, and they also provide the business and retention support, as well as the non-financial and financial incentives to make sure that businesses grow and create job opportunities. And so recently, we assisted the pay gas company with access to non-financial incentives in the form of fast-tracking business plan approvals so that they could launch gas refilling stations in Yanga and Philippi to give residents access to affordable basic energy. I'm also immensely proud that this unit helped the world's largest pharma tech company called Roche to expand their operations here in Cape Town. And in August last year, we also assisted to land the largest capital investment in South Africa since 1994 by Amazon Web Services. Now, colleagues, the Atlantis Special Economic Zone is a great example of how strategic property can be leveraged to unlock socio-economic benefit for our residents. And at the end of last year, the city of Cape Town transferred industrial zoned land worth 56.5 million rand to the new Atlantis Special Economic Zone company. And in anticipation of finalizing this agreement, the Atlantis Special Economic Zone has already received applications worth 3.5 billion rand. In other words, new investments that are ready to land their operations in Atlantis. And this will lead to another 800 new job opportunities. In addition, my department and the city will also make available additional resources 
towards the Atlanta Special Economic Zone by establishing a dedicated business facilitation unit so that we can help existing businesses expand, also new product development, enterprise development and skills training to benefit the residents of Atlantis, but also to expand our economic footprint so that we can produce more Cape Town products for export markets. And finally, as part of our business retention and expansion efforts, my department is rolling out business surveys in each of Cape Town's 26 industrial areas, and I've joined my team in the field to first-hand hear the concerns and suggestions from businesses so that we can use this information to address any issues that's holding back the growth of businesses in those key economic nodes of our city. Now, colleagues, our CBD and other commercial centres in Cape Town require specific attention and immediate intervention following months of lockdown. So we've been hard at work on plans to help breathe life back into these areas. Our approach is citywide, and my team and I have focused on three aspects. Place making, investment promotion, and regulatory reform. We have plans to attract footfall and drive demand to our CBD that will make business sense. And so the first intervention was to give restaurants and businesses in the CBD the opportunity to rent sidewalks or any other underutilized spaces at a reduced cost to those businesses so that we can allow more space that may have been lost due to social distancing. And we hope that this opportunity will also unlock the pavement economy in Cape Town, because that's a new trend that we are following. And certainly as a vibrant city, we as Cape Town will be able to use that as another means to drive business opportunities into our CBD that can really add value. And also uh, at the end of the day, employ more people into those spaces. So colleagues, there you have it. A snapshot of key programs that embrace innovation, smart thinking, all focused on addressing specific issues to ensure that Cape Town has the right conditions to attract the investment we need to grow our economy, create new jobs, and also to focus on training for the high growth sectors and even retraining. And no presentation will be complete without referring to one of our key sectors, which has been hardest hit, and that's the tourism and hospitality sector. And so we've come up with a 10-point tourism strategy in Cape Town that will deal with the supply and demand for new markets that will emerge in a post-COVID world. But we will also be looking much closer at home to diversify tourism products in our city, to work with communities on facilitating many more tourism businesses in the entire tourism uh, business value chain. And so there's going to be a strong focus on domestic tourism as well as international tourism when international tourism resumes again. And we intend to use all of our strategic leverage of our partnership with Cape Town International Airport, the Air Access Initiative and others to make sure that we connect Cape Town with key source markets so that we can drive demand to Cape Town which will make business sense because it's all about bums on seats and boxes in the belly so that we have more passengers arriving in our city, spending time and money in our economy, but at the same time developing more products for cargo so that we can also start exporting more of our proud, proudly Cape Town products. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's really been an honour to share with you some of these interventions that the City of Cape Town has come up with. And remember, we stand ready to partner and share with any of our blue colleagues in other municipalities. Because where there's a will, there's a way. And that is the DA difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alderman Force, for that insightful look at what the city of Cape Town is doing, the innovations that are out there making a difference in people's lives at the time when they need it the most.
Now, earlier today, you'll remember I spoke about some of the polls we'll be running. Just a quick recap on that. On each of our four themes, we'll be running polls, which will have four questions. The idea here is to stimulate some debate and to encourage participation of our Zoom participants. And just a, a disclaimer that the results of these polls are by no means an indication of DA policy on that particular issue. So the polls, we'll have a look at what the people are saying. We'll discuss them during our panel discussion. Have a look at what we've got for you in these polls coming up now. And and see you on the other side of this for a panel discussion. Defeating COVID-19. That's the theme for this poll. As part of this interactive innovation summit, we would like to get your responses to each of the questions. Later in the program, we will show the results and this will form part of our panel discussion. A pop-up window to enable you to participate will pop up once we start. We'll be asking four questions on this theme. Question 1. The single biggest ANC-led government failing exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic has been poorly managed health systems, inadequate social security protections, inability to address the country's drinking culture, poorly monitored procurement systems, inability to respond quickly to a crisis. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 2. Amidst the hardship of COVID-19, the single most positive outcome of the pandemic has been opportunities offered by remote working, successfully holding meetings online, new ways of engaging with residents of municipalities, better intergovernmental cooperation, business and industry innovation, we will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 3. Which statement do you most agree with? Lockdown levels should always apply universally across the country. Lockdown levels should be flexible and determined by provincial premiers. Lockdown levels should be flexible and determined on district level. Lockdown levels should remain on level one until the economy recovers. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 4. What has been your municipality's greatest challenge in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? Ensuring frontline services are uninterrupted and delivered at the same standard as before COVID-19. Ensuring the municipality's collection rate remains within healthy margins contending with an increase in illegal land invasions, putting in place greater social services, such as addressing food insecurity. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. completes the poll for this theme. Stay tuned for the panel discussion.
Welcome back. Some very interesting questions on those polls we've just seen and we'll be bringing you those results a little later in the program. Let me also have a warm welcome back to our presenters, Alan Windy, Lauren Waring and James Foss. Also joining us for the discussion will be the DA Shadow Minister of Health and our national spokesperson, Siviwe Harube. And a warm welcome to you, Siviwe. There's no doubt that COVID-19 has plunged us all into uncertain times. And it's uncertain because there was so much we didn't know going into this, and it was probably one of the steepest learning curves we've had to climb. And the lockdowns from five down to two and up to three and adjusted and not adjusted have impacted on all our citizens, whether it's regarding health, economy, our social fabric, um, and service delivery, which is core function. I'd like to start off by asking each of our panelists here, at what point did you realize that this is not a couple of weeks, couple of months, this is here to stay and we have to take the lead if we're going to get ahead of it. Premier, if I can start with you. Um, I don't know if there was a point that uh, it was before the COVID-19 first case in our country, I think. I mean, because we had the opportunity to see what was happening in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, because I remember weeks before we had our first case, we were already put our disaster plans together. We were already meeting at the disaster centre. Uh, we were already having our second official cabinet meeting in the disaster centre when the president phoned that day to say that we're going to actually go into a lockdown. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I, I think we had that hindsight warning because of what was happening. So I don't know if there was a time that I, I said. I, I, I mean, we were always saying. Look at what's coming. We better be prepared for it. But I think you also always think that at the end of this wave, it's going to be over. Mm. Um, it's definitely our health team that keeps on warning that this thing's not going to be over. This is not a quick fix. It's going to be with us for a while. And so as the vaccines start to help, as better medicines start to help, we are going to try and avert as much as possible our third wave and our fourth wave. But I mean, the third wave and a fourth wave are probably going to come. So it's going to be with us for a while. Lauren, what was your experience? So, I mean, I agree with the Premier, you know, I, I think we, we all saw it coming and it was great that we actually had that, those couple of months, those two, two and a half months to see um, what was coming towards us. But on a local level, um, it, it, the first time it struck me was when it, we went, it was around about the time, that the end of April, when we went into the hard lockdown and we suddenly started getting an influx of calls from our informal traders and house shops because they felt it immediately, because it was their, um, their clientele, their customers, who were suddenly losing jobs and weren't being able to support them and weren't able to, they, they weren't allowed to trade. So, uh, you know, we had to put in a whole range of processes to try and support um, those, those traders and those house shops. But I think that was when I suddenly realised, wow, okay, on a, this, is, this is affecting people on a very micro level and it's going to be here for a long time. James, you also work, work at that level. What, what was it for you that you realised, wow, we have to start taking action? I think it was um, when we reached out to our strategic business partners because we in the city have uh, uh, partnerships with, with all these uh, uh, special purpose vehicles in the marine manufacturing space, in the clothing and textile space, in the tech space, call centres, you name it. And so when we, men when we met with them, it's then when I realized we're in trouble because immediately we had to reprioritize our funding, the programs for the year because we had to pivot many of their operations and actually find out how will we keep those production lines going in the food and beverage, uh, in the call centers, because all of those sectors really are the backbone of our city's existence. Um, so it was lives and livelihoods, but it was finding out how could we pivot and how could we reprioritize. And so in our regular uh, conversations with our strategic business partners, I've realized that many of our sectors were brought to their knees immediately. So it was to make sense of all the confusion and to then reprioritize quickly. And it was in those few weeks of constant engagements that I've realized we're in big trouble. And then if you take it one step down, to your small business, your informal trading sector. Those guys really struggled and we had to come up with quick ways to, to support, but also to make sense of it all because we had to demonstrate care, consistency and confidence because people see the DA government in the province, in the city and in our municipalities um, as the shining light of building confidence amongst all of this um, uncertainty, because really the world was turned upside down. Yeah. And I must say, listening to the presentations thus far, that's what struck me, that we could really move quickly 
using innovation, using technology. Um, so yeah, so that's what uh, struck me at the beginning and it was really a tough time because I've just been in the job two years and this came along and the same for the Premier, it was for us and we've, and I must say also the partnership between, we were soft on boundaries and strong on vision. Mm. Immediately we pulled together as a whole of DA government in this province. I'd like to bring Sibiwe in here as well. So um, as Shadow Minister of, of Health, you'd been doing a lot of visits to hospitals around the country. Um, we've heard some horror stories coming out um, over the, the, the months that have passed about terrible conditions. So where does the Western Cape fit into the preparedness as far as our hospitals were concerned? Yeah, thanks, Richard. I think, look, for me, when, when, when uh, the, the crisis started to look like we were going to be in one is when, as, uh, as Alan said earlier, when we saw other countries who had a far stronger health system than we did start to battle with the cases mm. of COVID-19 and their health system started to buckle under pressure in a big monumental way and healthcare workers were struggling, um, the system wasn't able to cope with the hospitalization rate and immediately while we hadn't had our first case yet, um, that's when we called for a debate of urgent importance, uh, of national importance rather, in, in, in Parliament because we wanted to be able to say the national legislature needs to ready itself already um, to be able to hold government to a Account to check its preparedness, to check its readiness uh, for the crisis that would befall us, in you know, because it was inevitable. And on that very day that that debate was held, we actually had our first confirmed case. And I knew that the biggest the biggest, the weakest um, link in the entire response to, of, to COVID-19 was going to be our health systems. As you say, I've been to many parts of the country and I've seen the state of our healthcare. And I knew that if we had any kind of numbers like we'd seen across the world, we would not be able to cope. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, now that we've seen that the Western Cape, you know, wasn't spared. It was one of the first, pro in fact, it was the first province to experience its peak and it took innovation and it took you know creativity and thinking out the box and vision as James says to quickly um, spring into action and, and, and mount together a decent response. Thank you Sibu. Premier, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the subject that everyone's been talking about for the last couple of weeks intensely and that's the vaccine rollout. Um, a critical critical part of the entire process. Where are we I mean, we're talking about logistics, the management that has to be done of it. it it's, it's a massive... Where, where are we with that? Okay, so, I mean, I think we... we uh, for me, I've broken it into two sides. The one is um, the actual rollout. And then that's what provinces are responsible for. We, we've got a health system, both there's a private and a public health system. And, uh, you know, I kind of break it down almost into a, a, an election you know, in an election, you've got voting stations and you've got voters, and we need to make sure voters are on a database. Those voters have got to get to a station to vote. We need to know that the citizens living in a space are on a database. They need to be able to get somewhere to be vaccinated. Um, we need to be able to record it. In, in most of the vaccines, they need to come back a second time. Uh, after 28 days, we've got to get them back a second time. So it's about building a proper database behind it. Uh, it's about understanding the magnitude, um, and it's a massive task. This is we mustn't uh, underestimate the task that's ahead of us. So it's, you know, in our province we've got to get five million people vaccinated, and it's all very well if you live close to a a clinic or close to a public or private facility, be it a doctor's rooms or a, or a hospital or, or a chemist. But of course, if you live in a rural area, in a small hamlet or village, which is far away, uh, so those are the complexities. Do we need to have mass vaccination centers? Do we need to have mobile units that go out? So this first round is going to be fairly simple. It's in our hospital system. It's the healthcare workers themselves. But of course, it'd also be a bit of a training exercise for us. But the big task for us is to run a slick operation over the next months. And then for me, the other side of the vaccine uh, uh, program is I look at it from a risk point of view. As we sit now, if we look at the data that we're given from a national level, we're sitting at 38 million vaccines too few for South Africa. It's also a race against time because the third wave is on its way. Uh, I've always said that there's a risk. The risk is one single procurer, that's government. 
Um, what happens if that ball is dropped along the way? Um, how do we minimize that risk? Even in getting the vaccines out, government can't take uh, responsibility for this. It's got to be government and private. It's got to be a chemist, a doctor's rooms and a clinic. And, uh, and even that, it's got to be more than that because it is a mammoth task. Uh, we're seeing first world countries battling mm. with this. Mm. So it is our big challenge and getting that part right. I've taken it upon myself to start doing my own research in contacting and making and looking for vi vaccine supply. Uh, last Wednesday, our cabinet took a resolution now that uh, we will uh, put into process our procurement process for vaccines. So we, we're looking at that risk and putting a mitigation in place. And uh, so that uh, procurement team is now being put together. The research that I've done now gets handed over, but they, of course, uh, procurement is a different process. And of course, now uh, we've got to look at demand, shortfalls, needs, what kind of vaccines. I've said that I'm meeting with SAPRA. Uh, we've got to see that we make sure we get them approved because we have to have an approved vaccine. So even just in that secondary process is also quite a complex yeah. process. Um, but for us, uh, we know there's a third wave coming and we've got to make sure that, uh, that we are prepared as best as we can. We, we need to do whatever we can. We need, to, we need to make sure that no one loses their life in the third, third wave. And with all of those lessons and all of the mitigation, be they vaccines, be they other medicinal approaches, uh, be they tools to slow down the spread. And it's really about learning. If we don't learn, well, then we're crazy. So, Savuwe, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Richard, I mean, so South Africa's experience with mass vaccination really is about 1 million vaccinations a year, which is usually the, the, the measles uh, vaccinations for children. So now we've got this really ambitious and audacious task of trying to vaccinate 40 million South Africans by year end. And as Alan said, I mean, this is a mammoth task, but more importantly, I think it, it, it is one that is going to require uh, governments to be a lot more nimble, uh, governments to be a lot more um, decentralized in their approach, governments to also just be a lot more innovative in the way that they do business because uh, IT infrastructures need to be put in places in primary healthcare facilities in your tiny villages because you, you need to be able to have systems talking to one another. Uh, you can't still be having, um, you know, handwritten and sort of the, the folders that are lying somewhere in a, in a storeroom, in a clinic somewhere. You've got to be able to have a centralized database so that you can see who has had a vaccine, who hasn't, who still needs to get a second dose and who, who, who doesn't, and when must they get the second dose in time in that particular window. And unfortunately, a lot of our, of, of our, of our um, provinces are still nowhere near um, at a place where we would be able to roll out something like this. So it's a deep concern. It's a deep concern. I want to pick up on that third wave. So what we need to do as DA-led governments is to ensure that there's no lockdown of our economy. So whilst we are preparing for the third wave, and I must commend our provincial government um, you know, for taking those steps, being ahead of the pack, what we need to do now is to ensure that there's no lockdown of our economy by working with industry, working with our sectors to ensure that workplace readiness COVID compliance takes priority so that we can demonstrate that we are open for business and we are responsible in the practices that we implement within our factories, within our shopping centres, within our informal trading spaces, because that's where it matters mm -hmm. most. And so as DA-led governments, we must lead. We always say private sector must drive the economy, but now the role has been reversed. We need to lead that charge so that we can prevent national government to impose any further ANC lockdown on our economy. They will not survive another lockdown. Yes, we've managed now to get an ease of the restrictions on the curfew, on the alcohol sales and many others. But I remember Richard and colleagues at the beginning, we had to actually advise national government through the confusion of their own regulations. The boat building industry, for example, in Cape Town, is a huge job creator, lots of export. We are the second largest producer of catamarans in the world. At one factory, there were orders of 150 catamarans for export. And so we had to actually influence 
Department of Trade and Industry on those regulations to make provision for certain factories to remain open. The same would go for food and beverage, clothing and the others. But I just wanted to use that example, how we are to use our innovation, our first-hand experience, because it was boots on the ground. We went to visit those factories to find out what's needed, what needs to change. So I think really, in, in many respects, we, we led the charge on opening it up. Now we need to lead the charge to remain open. So I just wanted to pick up mm. on that. So I think it's great to see that our province is leading on the health response for the third wave. And as municipalities, we need to work with business and labour to ensure we keep our economy open. Just before we go to the results of our first poll, Lauren, if I can bring you in here. Sivuwe touched on it about getting processes in place so that people can be registered, there can be databases, we can know where people are. You touched on this, and it's a very strong point that you made, that with the food rollout that you did in Drakenstein, you got critical information that wasn't available before. Numbers, addresses, where people lived, how many... That information came through a lot clearer. And post-COVID, this can be used for other services. Sure. So, Richard, um, when um, I was tasked to, to, to run with the, the food aid program or project in Drakenstein, the primary reason why I wanted to get involved was around data. I, you know, I'm like a dataholic. The more, the, the better. And because I see, I see the value in it. Uh, you know, not only in terms of our planning and and roll out our surfaces, but also the, the financial value that that accrues to, to data. So. I, you know, we had great, we had great plans. We, you know, collate the data, map the data, disaggregate it, do the ash dashboards. Unfortunately, it was great in theory. When we've got people in a you know, time of pandemic, people want aid, people want to provide aid, and the people that you are wanting to assist um, and you need to get that information to you doesn't potentially understand the value of that data that they're collating, you have a problem. So, you know, I would, I, we, we had about three or four data sets no, that, that we, we, we were saying, look, this is what we need from whoever those field workers, those ward councillors, whatever they are, I think, you know. And ultimately, in order to give the voucher, all we were saying is just give us a cell number. We would get cell numbers of five digits. You know, so the de understanding amongst all of us of how important it is when we work with that data, to have, that data must have integrity, even if it's a cell number, you've got to have 10 digits. You know? <laughs> and, and then, and to try and get that understanding on a larger scale, if you're trying to get ID numbers, addresses, you know, um, uh, potentially vulnerabilities, comorbidities, that the, the full spectrum of data that we would need in, in the time of a pandemic, it just became really, really difficult. So we need to start collaborating, working with organisations that work with data. We, as local government, I think mean, province is probably better, but we at local government don't really have a full sense of the, the value of, of, of what we, what we, what data holds for us. So we need to start collaborating with businesses such as the cell phone companies. Their business is data. Mm. They, they sell it on and they use it for their business. Um, you know, they, they, and that data is verified. So from when the data is collated, whoever collates and captures that data needs to understand that, you know what, you get one number of the cell phone wrong. That means that that household cannot get a food, a food mm. voucher. That means that that household goes hungry. Yeah. That's how important it is to, to get it right. And and then you build on that. So it's your collation, your 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 inputting, your storage, you know, right until you're doing your analysis and your dashboards and your, your mapping and your hotspots and everything. But if you don't get your collation right and you don't and the, the, the people who are who are collecting the data don't understand the importance of their role, then everything else will become flawed. Okay, can I say on that on that point? So, I mean, even in our government, how many data scientists do we have in our government? Because we've got layers and layers of data at local government. I mean, you know how many people draw how much electricity per second or per hour and where it's drawn most, uh, water, uh, movement. I mean, we've got so many data points. We, we use in tracking, uh, as I said earlier, we track, we use uh, the, the testing in, a, in the municipal uh, water system for early warning on, on COVID-19. 
We were also using cell phone uh, data um, from the cell phone companies on movement of people. So we know that during the first lockdown, in actual fact, the Western Cape citizens were really adhering to the rules because we actually could show across the country the best um, slowdown in movement. But we were also looking at the second wave and how specifically migrant workforces were moving across our province as agricultural sectors were going into season. And that could also be an early warning system. And if you go to the Vescus right now, the health department and the local authorities were looking at that data, moving in with the agricultural sector saying, we're going to have thousands of migrant workforce coming into this region at citrus season, but we need to mitigate the risk. And so those early warnings, but in our governments, do we have the data scientists in place to actually take that data, turn it into something of value? Because into the future, now we're talking about innovation, this is the time to reinvent and create innovative governments. And so we must use this opportunity right now. If I can go across to our first poll that has come in, we have the results. The question was, the single biggest ANC-led government failing exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic has been we had the options were poorly, poorly managed health systems. That was 43% of our respondents said yes, that was it, and that is the highest number. Mm -hmm. Inadequate social <clears throat> security protections, only 4%. Interesting one, inability to address the country's drinking culture, zero. Um, poorly, poorly monitored procurement systems, 21%, and inability to respond quickly to a crisis, 32 So poorly managed health systems and the inability to respond quickly to the crisis. Sir, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think, so, I mean, I, I just want to pick on the uh, the point that, that Alan made about, in particular, the, the, the value of data or science-led interventions. And I think it was so important, and we saw how our government completely needs to, needs an overhaul, because we were very much reliant on the old way of doing things, and we weren't able to be quick enough out, or, or quick enough on our feet. Uh, if I can make an example, for instance, the, uh, the, 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 the coronavirus app, it took us months to be able to launch an app of that kind in the country. And even then, I mean, we can have a different conversation about, you know, the efficacy of it and whether or not it's been able to assist government in, in, in mounting a decent response. Um, but, but yeah, so I think that Ad Alan is absolutely right. This is a great opportunity for us to reset how government is done to reset how service delivery is done. Because if, if we don't use this disruptive moment now, then we are just never going to be a res responsive, um, quick and nimble government. Talking of quick and nimble, so if, um, James, I'd like to bring you in here. They say that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. But you tell me that when the going gets tough, the tough get mobile. <laughs> Do you want to go into that? <laughs> yes. So um, from, from our perspective, the Department of Economic Opportunities in the city. We've got two focus areas, one being enterprise development and the other one is in, uh, investment promotion facilitation. So under the enterprise development, we've realized that smart procurement and supply development, those are key features in your small business ecosystem. And so we need to give opportunity to small business to compete for big business. We need to equip small business with the right training, with the right resources to land bigger contracts and to do business with government so that we can make them smart in their profiling, in their costing, etc. And so, so we've launched the business up and I'm really excited because it was a big DA victory for us because we pulled a lot of resources together because as a municipality, sometimes you can be all over the place. And I think that's where the big question on data and research comes in. You must be very specific, you can't have a shotgun approach. And that's why we've established a dedicated investment facilitation unit, a dedicated policy and research unit, so that we can be smarter in our application of our funding, our service delivery approach. And so when it came to a small business, we did the same. Got a dedicated unit that only deals with small business issues. And I've gone into the lengthy explanation during my presentation, but the next step is now to go mobile, as you've said, Richard. And for us, we need to go to where businesses operate. We can't expect them to come to our city center for help. We need to go out where they operate. And it's also the new normal, or I call it the next normal in Cape Town, because that's where it's happening now. And so this mobile vehicle will be kitted with flat screens, desks and chairs, 
and even a solar panel, panel so that we don't need to use electricity. We can simply open it up and we can do education or smart procurement workshops or whatever the need is. And I want to say to the Premier, um, he inspired me when he was MEC for Economic Opportunities. He moved his office to the ground floor so that he's more accessible. And I said to my team, how can I do that? Because, you know, in the civic centre in Cape Town, it's difficult mm. to get people to come and see you. So we're going to go mobile in February, where we're going to roll out our services in communities. We'll advertise extensively, and I'm also planning to then move my office into the mobile hub a few days a week so that we can meet with our constituents, business, small, big, so that we can work with entrepreneurs in communities. There's so much happening out there because it's not business as usual. It's now a rethink of how we operate. And so while the business up started out physical here in the city centre, it moved online and we've helped about 2,000 odd businesses in the last few months online. And now the next application is going to be going mobile. So I'm really excited. So it's just taking it to the next level. Business on the go indeed. Yeah. Um, Premier, I'm being told that Councillor Mbeti from George Municipality is responding to your um, information about the Uber getting the medicines to people. And uh, the councillor says she's really excited about this. And there's so many clinics around the country that would benefit from that. Um, what are the chances of this being uh, extend, extended with other NGOs or service providers that this could be rolled out to rural areas? So I want to say it's already being rolled out to rural areas. Um, and of course, the one thing that we have been doing throughout this pandemic is sharing. Whatever we can share, uh, you saw in that video clip earlier this morning, uh, uh, Professor Karim. Um, I mean, we were the first to be hit. So of course, that wasn't just sharing across our municipalities, but it was sharing across our country. And uh, we're always happy to do that, but we have already started uh, moving it out into into a, and across the rural areas. I mean, it needs to become, that's how standard practice happens. You go to your clinic to have your assessment, etc. And if you do need ongoing medicine, you, you know that you can actually get your medicine for a few months and you only have to come back for your quarterly appointment or your quarterly checkup. I mean, that's where we've got to got to move to. But also, if you wouldn't mind, if I could just respond to that first poll. Please. And of course, we saw all of the results of the poll. But for me, when I read that poll, at the end of the day, it talks about management. And surely that's exactly what it's about. I mean, you put up your hand to say, I want to get involved in politics and I want to be, from a, from a citizen point of view, uh, through my political party, involved in management in our uh, municipality or in our province. And of course, uh, it's the two sides of management. It's the political management, and then of course, it's the administrative management. And I want to say that uh, I think all of those successes that I spoke about this morning, um, it comes down to how do you have your management system in place? So all of those risks that people spoke about, um, you know, if you've got the management system and uh, all of those things that I spoke about, they weren't all there. Many of them didn't even exist. But it's because you need to create an environment. So, of course, right in the beginning, I mean, I said even before we had our first case, we were already meeting in the disaster centre because we were asking ourselves questions. I've got photographs of the boardroom and what it looked like in that first weekend when we knew it was coming. And I had a whole team in there for the whole weekend and we were just writing on all these pieces of paper around the walls. And you can go and draw them down now and you can go and have a look and see how they became programs, mm -hmm. how they became systems so that we pulled them in, they got into reporting. And I said we, every Sunday was strategy. So the health team and the epidemiologists were telling us what was happening to the virus. Then we moved from that strategy into our team who were saying, hey, what are we going to do with this information now? And then that would then be honed and, and then we'd go into the Monday, Wednesday and Friday meeting. And then the work streams would go and come back into those meetings because you have to identify mm -hmm. the shortfalls. That again is about management. So it's each of those heads of department and how they were managing in their systems and then how we were bringing it all together. Leading on from that, if we look at the second question um, on our poll, the question is, amidst the hardship of COVID-19, the single most positive outcome of the pandemic has been. And I'd like you all to respond on your level of government, where um, the first one is opportunities offered by remote working. Um, and that was 24% of our respondents agreed with that, which was the highest number, together with new ways of engaging with residents of municipalities. Also 24% of our residents believed that. Successfully holding meetings online, uh, we have 15% who said that was the most positive outcome. And then, of course, business and industry innovation, also 24%, um, with better intergovernmental cooperation coming in last. Mm -hmm. Premier, at your level, do you, is that a true reflection, do you think? 
I think so. I mean, I, I really like uh, new ways of engaging with residents uh, of municipalities. I mean, the one thing that is, and that's sort of linked to the remote working, but the thing that's so great now is, you know, you can finish a meeting with your management team and you can then log on and have a one hour meeting with constituents in a municipality five hours drive away. And then you can log off and carry on with another meeting. I mean, that's the new world that we live in. That really does make a lot of sense to me. So new ways of engaging with residents, but also better intergovernmental operations. We have never, ever had uh, our governments across this, this uh, province working in such an intense way together before. Never. And it's because, you know, at the drop of a hat, you are meeting with politicians or managers or, or private sector um, to deal with a conundrum. And so I think, you know, we really have taken a giant step into this fourth industrial revolution. And so it's what do we make of it? Because, because the virus has helped us step forward. Now we've got to say, okay, now what are the learnings and how do we make that into this, the norm? So what's our next challenge? I mean, our real next challenge is we've got increased uh, poverty, hunger, the second pandemic. The second pandemic is unemployment, uh, hunger, poverty. How do we measure malnutrition? We measure it in our hospitals. That's too late. We've got to get ahead of it. So we need to take our same learnings from COVID-19 and say, all right, here is the conundrum. What are we going to do differently? Right. Richard, I'd like to come uh, in here. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, I think I want to pick on also on the point that uh, that James made uh, uh, a little bit earlier about governments being closer to the people. I think uh, it's been such an, a, a jarring um, realization for me that, in fact, our governments have become so big and convoluted and so far removed from the realities of the people that they're made to serve. And one such example for me that sticks out really was during the, the the height of the the crisis when we when we had um, the hard lockdown at level five and people were not meant to leave uh, their five kilometer radius and they would only leave their houses to go and get um, sort of you know emergency supplies and then government essentially shut down informal traders and shut down spaza shops and what that demonstrated to me was that governments had you know, become so far removed about what, from what actually goes on in people's communities. And, and that was a demonstration, because if you're saying to people that they can't leave their five kilometer radius from their house, but then shutting down their source of being able to access food or access emergency supplies, that says to me that you don't know the movement of your own people. You don't know um, where they get their supplies. And so I think like to James's point, it's absolutely crucial that this moment as well in our world has made us realize that governments need to obviously innovate and they need to come up with creative ways, but they also need to go back to being in touch with understanding how people, the people that they serve are living and what it is that they need to be a lot more responsive. And so I'm very glad that Alan is talking about intergovernmental relations because that's actually where for me, um, the magic spot is. Uh, because ultimately then you're going to just become very removed governments that really don't, don't improve the lives of the people we're meant to serve. Lauren, you wanted to come in there? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously COVID has forced us to catapult forward in terms of our tech and innovation anywhere between two to five years, I would think. But it does rely on connectivity. And not all of our community members have that connectivity, you know. We can't actually actively engage with people unless that is in place, if we are talking about using new ways of communicating, new ways of engaging with our public. So, what you know, it, it, it's all very well that we can we can have these remote meetings. We can you know engage. We can have town hall meetings with, where everybody sits in their in their slippers in their own you know in their lounge and enjoys a cup of coffee. But that is only one fraction of our, the public that we serve. And then my question is: So how do we reach the rest of the people? which is, in this country, the vast majority. Yeah. And here I'm hoping that some, one of the politicians are going to say, so what, this I is have what to we in, yeah. are doing in terms of connectivity <laughs> and getting that connectivity to those remote home, uh, hamlets and, and villages where, you know, where it is most needed because those are the most vulnerable that need government's intervention most. Correct. Yeah. Well, we've spent probably three billion already on connecting 
the unconnected. Um, in the beginning, it was, it was this is government's job. This is the broadband project. It was sort of really pushed by Helen Zillow when she was the premier. We've just carried on through making sure we've got those free hotspots across because they're the catalyst that starts. But if you go to Mitchell's Plain now, which in those days was let's get those, those schools connected. Let's get those uh, any kind of government building connected. Uh, now it's the private sector. They're saying move out the way because they're connecting. I mean, they're connecting when they go past a school, they give that school a gig per, a, a, a gig, uh, per second connectivity for free. Um, but uh, it, is, it is a good point. But I also want to come back to, to the point about connected citizens. And if I think about when we broke up the hotspots across the province, the most interactive hotspot was Kailicha. And... They were on a Zoom. It was, I'm just trying to think of the team. So it was, we, we had Minister Fritz and his HRD. We had, we had uh, members of parliament, both uh, DA and ANC members of parliament sitting on that grouping. We had councillors sitting on that grouping. But then we had civil, civic uh, organisations sitting on there and just members of the public. It was the most active, interactive space. And because they would come back every single week and report on what was happening. It was really amazing to see. And then, of course, I mean, I, I, mean, I absolutely get what, what Lauren's saying, because it, connectivity into this modern world is going to be so important. The biggest frustration for me was that we've been rolling out this broadband to our schools, and now suddenly learners weren't able to go to school because they were in lockdown. Uh -huh. And the poorest of the poor were the ones that suffered the most. And that was just so mm. frustrating. So how do we change that? Um, of course, when people can gather again around the hotspots and that gets, gets exciting again. But, you know, it's interesting to watch this, this space. I don't know, I'm, I'm, James might have gone to, gone to Delft uh, to Pastor George's call centre. Yes. Probably one of the most modern call centres in the Southern Hemisphere sits in Delft. I mean, it, is, it looks like Space Station Galactica from Star Wars when you walk in there. It's just unbelievable. But, but they've set up Mzanzi, Mzanzi um, uh, Amazon, I, I call it, because you can, in Delft, sit in your house, you can actually order sugar from the spa shop at the end of the road, the taxi, deli taxi driver delivers it tonight from a depot, uh, probably partnered with some major retailer. So the spa shop doesn't even carry the stock. The depot carries a stock and the taxi driver drops yeah. it at your house. You don't have to send your 11-year-old daughter up to the shop at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. So it really does change people's lives. Can I quickly Absolutely. pick up on that and about connected citizens? Very similar to the model that the Premier described. We are now speaking to small businesses in Kailicha, in the close proximity of Lukad Yol, mm. where we would like to, you know, go that extra mile. So you will have companies deliver goods to one premises and the locals, bicycles, taxis, will then take what we call the last mile, yeah. the product awesome. to the citizen. So, I mean, it's the circular economy at work. So now we're identifying this, these spaces throughout the city. So the connectivity, whether it's data or Wi-Fi or whatever is required, but then also to get the actual, the whole ecosystem involved. So, we, I mean, you went to visit the gentleman with his bicycle shop in Kailicha. So we are working with him in terms of that last mile project so that big products can be delivered there or big service providers and then they'll deliver it to people's homes. It's the e-commerce. Mm. That's the next normal. Yeah. And so it's really, and on the data, you know, it's, it's so important that we're, now this whole thing about us reprioritizing our business plans as municipality, that's going to be the hot topic because obviously it's not going to be business as usual. Budgets will look much different in the future. You need data. You need the research within your municipality so that you can take the right decision. And um, during the hard lockdown, I assembled a group of data analysts, policy researchers, and we came up with an economic action plan for Cape Town, which, by the way, other metros now want to use as a, as a blueprint. Excuse the pun. But now that economic action plan speaks to three things only. We came up with the business retention and expansion. How can we save businesses now? So we had, it was about stabilizing and then the containment and the adaptation. And so obviously there's a couple of programs linked to it. The second one was workforce development, and I spoke about it earlier on, the Jobs Connect, so that we train for the right sectors and that the municipality will push money into this training to make sure that we do the training, pay the stipends and put them in a job. 
And the third one is your sector development, where we work with our strategic business partners in all of these key sectors, which is the backbone of our city and our province. So I think, you know, these are the type of innovations that we've come up with because we've surrounded ourselves with people that understand the economic geography of our province and of our city. They understand the, the subject matter at hand. Um, and it was a matter of then putting it all together quickly, being responsive, because then it comes down to the care, the consistency and the confidence. That's what we need to demonstrate throughout all of this. So I'm really, opt uh, I'm very, uh, you know, looking forward to the future. I'm optimistic about what's coming. Um, there's going to be a lot of hard work because we have to pivot a lot of our own operations yeah. in a municipality. Mm -hmm. And so we're mindful of that. And I think it's just a matter of doing the right thing and using land. I think that's another example. Using smart real estate to unlock socioeconomic benefit. Um, as a city, we responded quickly to the call of province to make land and buildings available for the health response mm -hmm. so that we don't get stuck in the system. So it comes down to that intergovernmental and even intergovernmental between the city and national. And I've used the example earlier on with Department of Trade and Industry. Many other bespoke submissions came from this city together with province to national where we convinced and influenced changes to regulations. Because why? Where the DA governs, we are responsive. We are boots on the ground because we went to visit those factories to find out firsthand what's holding you back, how can we change, and then we made the submissions. I don't think any ANC mayoral committee member made a submission to the National. I think most of those bespoke submissions came from DA-led municipalities and our pro provincial government. And that's how we lead from the yeah. front. T talking of national, sorry Lauren, just to interrupt you there, our, our third question on our poll was which statement do you most agree with, and this is about lockdown levels. Uh, and the first option was lockdown levels should always apply universally across the country. Well, nobody agreed with that one. Um, lockdown levels should be flexible and determined by provincial premiers. Premier Wendy, that's you. 44% of people, almost half, believe that. And also 44% believe that lockdown levels should be flexible enough to be determined on district level. And then a small group that uh, reckon that lockdown levels should remain on level one until the economy recovers. But this is something that has been debated a lot, but it's clear from what our uh, participants are saying that that lockdown level should be determined at least, at the very least, pr provincial level and perhaps even at district level. It, uh, it must be district level. District level. I mean, th that's because it's never, no wave has been universal, mm. not one. And uh, so even within a province, I mean, the, the Garden Route was first in the second wave, the West Coast was last. Um, you, you can't just blanket. And I mean, quite frankly, at the end of this last uh, lockdown, I mean, the Garden Route were in it from the beginning, but then they had to live through yeah. everyone else's peaks while they'd already, and it just doesn't make any economic sense. Basically what it does is it just pushes people into poverty. And it, it has to be by district as small as possible and be nimble. I mean, you must be able to make a decision in two weeks. Or you must, you must say every two weeks or every one week. You must, we, we run it on seven day rolling averages anyway. Um, so th use that as your tool. Yeah. But, uh, sorry, Lauren, Sabiwe, you, you, you wanted to come in there? <laughs> yeah. I'll come sorry, to uh, sorry, Alan. Uh, I, I mean, I just, I just wanted to, to, to agree with that. And I think the reality is that we've learned in, in, in the past 10, 11 months, actually, that lockdowns are a blunt tool. Um, particularly if you are looking at it from just like a national, uh, from a national point of view. As Alan says, I mean, the, the pandemic and the virus has behaved differently in different parts. The Western Cape was the first to experience its peak. And soon after that, the Eastern Cape was, was next. And various provinces have, you know, experienced this virus very differently. And so I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with government being, you know, a, lo a little bit more responsive in saying, right, look, we can devolve powers to to district levels, we can devolve powers to district mayors and to local governments to be able to to determine. Because obviously, if your if your if your if your uh, response to the pandemic is data led, is science led, then you may be able to see that look, now we are reaching a peak. Now we need to you know adjust our levels. But a, a blunt tool like a national lockdown has cost us a lot more than if we were a lot more adjusted in our approach. Thank you, Lauren. You wanted to come in? Yeah, no, I think it was just touched on. If you're going to be able to decentralise um, 
the lockdowns as far as possible to district level, it is critical that you have those da the data and the projections in order to see what's coming and, and have the analysts who can interpret, you know. So I, I would think that in terms of lockdowns, what needs to, down to districts, but then when it comes to responses in terms of the economy, we need to look at the, at, at the locals because, as you said, James, I mean, we understand the context on the ground and we are able to, establish, you know, to, to, to develop a, a bespoke response to what is happening in our economy. So whether that is providing, you know, um, COVID kits for informal traders and house shops, whether it's setting up websites with the full range of information for a business where, you know, assistance, financial assistance grants um, can be acquired, who to speak to in the municipality if you need to restructure your accounts, etc. And, and and likewise, we know what's coming in in terms of our revenue. You know, stay in the first First month, April, first month of lockdown, 25 million in our, uh, uh, which for Drakenstein, <laughs> maybe not for the city, but th that, was, that was a significant knock in terms of our revenue and month on month what that did. So we in the municipalities, in local government, need to be able to be, uh, for, to, to have the, 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 the power and the authority to be a lot more responsive in terms of what our economy is needing. Because can we're I, at the forefront. Can I also say that, I mean, we say lockdown, but in actual fact, we have to now develop tools that are not lockdown. Yeah. Huh. As James says, it's, huh. it's, I mean, lockdown is the last resort tool to use. Absolutely. I mean, during what we learned during the, the trough between the two peaks is we were able to identify, and we call them bushfires. So we could tell you that there was a funeral in Beaufort West and it created X number of, of uh, infections and we could zoom in, pick up who they were, track and trace them, slow it down and put the fire out. Then we knew in Stanford it was a wedding. We knew um, in, in the garden route it was, a, it was in Plettenberg Bay, it was during a school holiday and it was, we could see that it was people coming from other parts of the country because when they were going to our health facilities, both private and public, for a test, we knew where they came from. Mm. We, we could see that. Mm. And so surely if you've got that capability, you can manage it almost by suburb if you want to. Mm. Mm. And then what, are the, what is it? So how do you slow it down? Because blunt lockdowns just are so damaging. And of course, you, they must be in your arsenal. You know, you've got to have the big cannon mm. in the wall, but you also, you know, you want to try and negotiate rather. And so what are those things that we need? And so at the moment, I've asked our team, the economics team and the health team to say, let's sit down and say, let's do some scenarios. If it starts to, what are the things we can do? Um, and what are more effective? Um, is a curfew more effective than a lockdown? Is a, you know, what are the things, um, or is it just a communication for a, for a behavioural change? Mm. Um, and we've got to work out what those are. Richard, Remember, sorry, sorry, James, I, I just have to come in here and say that I'm being told that, like Braveheart, our team out there are going, hold, hold, for the next crew to come in and do their <laughs> next theme. <laughs> so I'm going to ask each of you just to perhaps give a, a final message, a word of encouragement, a, a positive look, um, on what we can look forward to from what we will be doing to try and mitigate the force of this pandemic. Can I start with you, Mr. Premier? Okay, great, thank you. I think, and I've always said to the citizens of our province, this is a partnership and a deal. And we will play our part and we need citizens to play their part. We've, this is not over. So please, the best thing we can all do is uh, to work together to mitigate as much as possible that third wave, because then we can keep the businesses open, we can slow the spread of this virus while we bring in the other health mitigations. If we do this together, we will be a leading region in the world. Laura? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the, you know, the learnings, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. It, it, it's, in everybody's interest. Mm. You know? and that's where we're going to get to where we need to go and how we're going to deal with this pandemic as well as others to come mm. because yeah. they are going to come. Thank you, Laura. Mm. James? Richard, yeah, making sure that Cape Town is open for business, connecting us with key source markets globally and locally in Africa as well. I always say Cape Town is a proudly African city so we see ourselves as a springboard into the continent for products and for services and for talent and to be that go-to city for travel and trade.
but also to make sure that we focus on the right sectors that's poised for high growth so that we can get the right skills pipelines established, get people into jobs so that we can get our economy full steam ahead within the strict compliance of COVID. We need to make sure that we adapt to this next normal because that's also going to be the way that business would apply its mind and the same would apply then to government and to be more connected to one another. Um, so I've said earlier on, let's demonstrate care, confidence and consistency so that people know that is the DA difference because where there's a will, there's a way. So I'm very optimistic about the future and I'm actually excited because now uh, it changes the way we do our business as well because it couldn't have been business as usual. So it really gives us a new trajectory going forward. And it's been great serving on the panel. Thanks, Richard. Thanks very much. Saviwe, a final word? Yeah, I mean, I just want to assure um, the people watching that, you know, as members of parliament, uh, we, t we want to assure you that we take our role very seriously. And obviously we've got here yeah, on the panel people who are in government and who are doing cutting edge things and we're excited about that. But we also want to say that there's a massive role to be played um, by a strong opposition. And a strong opposition will hold a government to account and we are, as a democratic alliance, really assuring people that we will continue to hold government to account. We will demand excellence on behalf of the people who elected us. And we will want to make sure that we've got a vaccine rollout plan that is comprehensive, that has timelines, and that money that is meant for the people is actually spent on the people. And so that's the assurance that, that is, those are the marching orders as we go in, further into 2021. Thank you very much. A big thank you to all the panelists here today for giving us your time, giving us your expertise, and giving us those positive stories about how we can use innovation to change lives. Not ticking boxes, it's changing lives. And I thank you all very much for that. I'd also like to thank our participants on uh, Zoom. And remember, get your questions through, send questions through for the next panel. And after the break, we'll be coming back for the second theme of the day, which is technology and economic growth. Once again, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. See you on the other side. DA governments know that access to the internet is crucial for expanding opportunities and helping people to find work. DA run Saldana Bay is working with the private sector to bring technology closer to the people by creating an open access fiber network that ensures connectivity to all residents. The Western Cape government is also hard at work bringing internet access to rural communities through the Cape Access Program. In DA run Stellenbosch, you can now use a mobile app to engage with the municipality. The Stellenbosch Citizen App enables residents to participate in important discussions, get direct feedback and stay up to date. The statistics show that there are indeed more opportunities where the DA governs. And despite the hard lockdown, the DA-run Western Cape's good track record helped keep the expanded unemployment rate at 27.3%, far lower than the national average of 42%. Since the launch of the Western Cape government's COVID-19 Business Relief Fund, the provincial government has assisted over 250 businesses to date, saving at least 2,000 jobs. Job seekers can also find work with the help of the City of Cape Town's Digital Jobs Database, which randomly selects registered residents for job interviews. Mossel Bay Municipality's Beehive Project is helping small business owners grow their business in an affordable space. The international community continues to invest in the Cape and boost the local economy. Google invested a whopping 2.2 billion rand into Cape Town and the Western Cape. In the last six months, the Atlanta Special Economic Zone has received applications for investments worth 3.5 billion rand, which will support 800 jobs when approved. Investment like this not only helps grow the economy and create jobs, but is an endorsement of DA Good Governance.
welcome back. Some fascinating food for thought uh, in the panel discussion we've just had and also this video because we know that technology and economic growth is a vital cog in the machine that ensures good governance and development in our towns, in our cities, in our province. And this is doubly so since COVID-19 has put the brakes on economic uh, development over the last nine months. Our first speaker today is a man with a reputation for out-of-the-box thinking, for embracing innovation and being solution-driven. Jordan Hill Lewis is currently the Shadow Minister for Finance in the National Assembly. He got involved in the DA when he was still a, a student, and this died in the wool politician. Even though he's still fairly young, as he reminded me yesterday, he brings a wealth of experience and specialist knowledge to the table. Jordan has served as the Shadow Deputy Minister of Public Service, the Shadow Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry, and the Shadow Minister of Trade and Industry. Um, and currently, of course, as I said, the Shadow Minister of Finance. Ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Hill Lewis. Good morning, colleagues and friends around the country. What a privilege it is to be able to join you today to discuss how DA governments can embrace innovation to solve South Africa's problems and make people's lives better. Innovation for us in the DA means finding ways to do more with less in government so that every South African can live a life of aspiration and dignity. It means creating the conditions in which millions of South Africans can be lifted out of poverty over time. And it means running an efficient, innovative and capable state, laying the groundwork for innovators in the private sector to do what they do best, to take risks, develop new ideas, invest and start new businesses. That, friends, is the formula for job-creating economic growth. And economic growth is the only tried and tested way to lift people out of poverty. That is our aim in the DA. That is our why. This seminar today is also very timely, and that's why it's so great to be here. South Africa has suffered from two decades of economic policy that is stuck in a time warp. The consequences are obvious and inevitable, and they are clearer and clearer in South Africa every day. The national decline and the growing poverty. This old-fashioned orthodoxy sees the state at the center of all development and ignores the incredible potential of the private sector. The economic policies of the 1970s simply won't put food on the table in 2021. The ANC's outdated policies don't work for anyone. But our commitment in the DA to always finding better ways of doing things will work for all South Africans. The contrast could not be more stark. We are the party that represents the hope of change, change for the better. We are the party that represents progress, innovation, and a growing economy that spreads prosperity more broadly for everyone. And that is how we will grow our support and win in more and more places this year. This is the DA's path to victory. When we show the public that we are far and away the most competent, most innovative government that delivers economic growth for all, then South Africans can know that when they vote for the DA, their vote is not merely a protest vote, but an active choice for a better future for them and their families. So I have made three introductory points here. Number one, we are committed to constantly doing better in government. We are committed to innovating because this is the foundation for the job-creating economic growth that lifts people out of poverty. Number two, our constant self-improvement is what sets us apart as the party of hope for the future of South Africa. And number three, this is what lights the DA's path to victory. Now I want to discuss with you why now is the right time to push down hard on the accelerator. Today's seminar must rightly be a reflection and a celebration of what our governments have done and what we've achieved. But it should also be the impetus to go much further and to push the boundaries and do much more. We know that all DA governments, 
province and local, will face the pressure of ever-shrinking budgets in the years ahead and the burden of national collapsing services. Last year alone, National Treasury cut provincial budgets by a whopping 209.7 billion rand, friends, and municipal grants have been slashed by a further 17.7 billion rand. That trend is not going to change. If anything, it's going to get worse. So in this context, it's not good enough to rely on our track record of no corruption and good government alone. Those things are necessary, of course. Necessary, but not sufficient. Clean, efficient government within the context of, a, of the current system is no longer enough because the system itself is broken. The only way for us to thrive in DA governments is to redefine the system itself. Our choice now is between managing the path of slow decline or charting a new, bold and courageous path for ourselves. We must show residents that where we govern, we will proactively protect the public from the worst effects of a failing state. And we must claim the maximum policy space that the Constitution offers to provincial and local governments, and even test the bounds of that space and the Constitution's federal provisions. It is so inspiring to see many of our governments claiming this space and moving into that territory already. Hesequa municipality, a DA government, is using solar-powered desalination plants to provide clean water to its residents. That is protecting residents from the effects of a failing National Department of Water. Stellenbosch and George, both DA governments, have made important progress this week in their goal of procuring renewable energy to protect their residents from a failing ESCOM. These are inspiring examples, and they will pay dividends not just in a well-served public, but in a growing economy. These brave policy innovations are the best kind of economic stimulus we can offer. Everyone, every business will want to invest in those places that have secure basic services like water and electricity. This will create a virtuous cycle. DA governments protect the public from crumbling services. This attracts investment and new businesses and more jobs which in turn provides the resources for even better services. That is the virtuous cycle that the DA can create where we govern. And this is the new frontier for fighting for residents. Being out on this frontier, at the very front of it, means we won't just be managing decline, but working every day to find new paths that lead to growth and jobs. Next, friends, our governments must focus on unleashing the most powerful innovators, entrepreneurs. All too often, when a DA wins in a new town or city or province, we take over an administration that is steeped in the same bad ideas of the government that we have just replaced. All too often, these administrations view entrepreneurs with suspicion instead of respect and look at the informal sector as a problem that needs to be stamped out rather than a fledgling economic activity that needs to be nurtured to growth. But anyone, anyone who has ever run a business in South Africa or who has even worked in a small business knows that it is entrepreneurs who are the real creators of prosperity in every society. They take risks, they put everything on the line and they create work for others. We must unashamedly remove restrictions on enterprise. Let's innovate not just in technology, but also in competitiveness and in slashing red tape. Let's aspire wherever the DA governs to run the best, most competitive, easiest places to do business in the world. At the moment, Auckland, New Zealand is currently the most competitive city to do business in the world according to the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business report. Now, no South African likes to lose to New Zealand. We can beat them at rugby, and we can beat them at this too, if we put our minds to it and show the political leadership and courage to do it. We can do it. Finally, 
We should not only innovate in technology, but also in innovative policy. South Africa needs a policy spring clean, and the DA is best placed to lead it. Out with the old and in with the new. In with the change makers. We have some of the very best talent working in our governments and, of course, in the DA. Where we govern, we are slowly building up a professional civil service that is filled with incredibly impressive policy researchers and cutting-edge practitioners. Innovative policy can offer new, low-cost solutions for old, expensive problems. The Center for Development Enterprise, the CDE, has championed the idea of massive, small housing policy. This approach would see local governments incentivizing micro-property developers to subdivide their properties and build one or two more rooms or flats on their existing property for rental income. This only requires regulatory change and doesn't cost a thing, but delivers huge social wins and social benefits for everyone. Poorer people have a secure income, much needed gap housing is created, and building businesses boom. Even in very big, giant infrastructure projects, the world has moved on from South Africa's state-centered model. The two biggest airports in India, Mumbai and Delhi, are both privately owned and run. This saves billions in state infrastructure costs and unlocks billions in new investments. Our failed rail system and cripplingly slow harbors and ports are ripe for a totally different approach, pioneered by the DA. Friends and colleagues around the country, today I have made the case that, one, the DA must prepare to save South Africa from the worst effects of the failing state, because business as usual won't cut it. We can do so by courageously claiming all the constitutional policy space that our governments can. This is morally right, and it will result in a huge economic boost that will lift many millions out of poverty. Number two, that the DA can back this up with a regulatory, st a regulatory stimulus aimed at making DA governments the easiest, best, and most competitive places in the world to do business. And third, that in addition to data and technology, DA governments can innovative can be innovative in new, path-breaking policy solutions to old, expensive problems. Colleagues, it is an extremely exciting time to be in the DA. We are showing the way for South Africa. We are showing what the future could hold. We are showing what is possible under a DA government in future. There is a sense of new possibility and hope, and it is invigorating to be at the forefront of leading change in South Africa. Thank you for what you are doing in DA governments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordan, and indeed a very positive message to be able to say we're looking forward to being able to do better, to, to help people more, to be at the forefront of making people more positive and of making their lives so much better, of growing the economy and of using technology to its utmost potential that we can do. Our next speaker is also well known to many of our participants and has been in the news a bit recently. Stellenbosch Executive Mayor Jesse van Deventer graduated from Stellenbosch University with a BA Law and LLB degree and worked as a public prosecutor, an advocate of the Cape High Court and a civil and criminal magistrate in Paul. In 2011, she was elected as the Executive Mayor of Drakenstein and in 2016 became the Executive Mayor of Stellenbosch. Now we know that Stellenbosch has a university and techno park and is also very well known for its forward thinking and Mayor Giesi has been instrumental in ensuring that this innovation can and is applied to improving service delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, Executive Mayor of Stellenbosch, Giesi van Deventer. Good morning, Mulvaney. Uh, thank you for 
allowing me to be here and to talk to you about today. Salon Bosch is very serious about innovation, especially technological innovation. That is clear from our vision statement, portraying us as a valley of innovation and opportunity. Today I want to discuss with you two of the mobile apps, applications we have developed in Salon Bosch, allowing us also to swoon into the COVID lockdown. It's actually very easy for us to adapt to that. And then, of course, our wonderful Smart Street program that we also use. But let's start with the apps. Why is an app so wonderful? Because most people in this country now have smartphones. We see from ICASA's statement that there is about 91.2% of people already owning a smartphone. Our applications also work on other phones like Motorola, and other devices that is not necessarily smart devices. So what is this all about? It's all about communicating with your people. It's a much easier, modern and funky way. Firstly, we developed the housing app. The background to this is that the Bosch housing list goes back to 1987. When the towns merged to become one municipality, everything was just fused. And of course, as you can imagine, there was chaos. So many times it was amended and bettered, but I think, let's say in summary, integrity was still not good. So about two years ago, council decided to renew and update the list completely, but that would have involved a lot of staff, cost, and a lot of red tape. So we decided to rather move to an app. It's actually a wonderful, easy way to communicate. I'm going to show you what it's all about. The benefits is fantastic because we see that people who work full-time can now sit at home, the elderly people, people who have physical challenges, young mothers or children, they can sit at home, upload the data and don't have to take taxis and go into town, save a lot of money on transport and on time. And in COVID, it's very important people don't have to queue. So I'm going to show you the first slide of that. That's where it starts now, and that's the first page. So, of course, you must first download it on your telephone, which is very easy. Anybody who can send SMS or WhatsApp can do this. Look at the second page, you'll see right on the left-hand side, the first page allow you to tell us what you need. You need a gap house, a subsidy house, what do you need from us? Then you fill in your detail and also your needs. Maybe you're disabled, maybe you have dependents, and you carry on with that. You can even say which area you prefer to live in, where you live now, what your means are. It's actually very comprehensive. And then you'll see once you've done that, you upload it. You can also add a file if you want to add your documentation. Or otherwise, once uploaded, you can go in and deliver that within seven days. So easy. Now you're going to say to me, what about the cost? It's actually very, very affordable. Because only when you upload it for two or three seconds, you pay data. Be very mindful of the fact that people need houses, often come from a lower income group, and don't have money to waste on data. But it's so easy, and we see people just love that. Um, so we found that people don't queue a lot anymore, they rather sit at home. I think a beautiful thing of this is that either in time, you can go into the app, look at your status, change your details, edit that, and add or withdraw whatever you want to do. This has been wonderful for us, and we would love to share with other municipalities if they want the data, want to know what, how it works. I think it's one of those tools that is there to stay forever. The second application is our Stellenbosch resident app. Just find that. Uh, once again, you download that. The whole idea was to allow people to communicate in a better, faster, more modern way. Uh, instead of sending emails, SMSs, WhatsApps, we have now integrated this into one system. You see, you can download it on the right hand side from Google Play, Apple Store, and also from the older telephones. And this is literally our newspaper. I'm going to go to the next page, and you'll see on the left hand side, there's all the news uh, our bank details, anything that we want people to know about, um, valuation, role, everything like that. So we can change that from week to week or month to month as much as we want to. And in the middle, you see notifications, which allow us to send wonderful information to you, like load shedding, when a road is blocked, when there's a water burst, water shortage, 
Anything that we need to report to you will go through on that. Instant communication. The best and most loved page, of course, is the one on the right-hand side, where people can write to us, the chat group, and send it in to us. It's immediate. Now, of course, it does need some staff, dedicated staff, which we've appointed to look at that and then send the communication on to the several departments or to answer it by themselves. So you will see on that page, it's a wonderful tool to share information also about cell phone numbers or the service department, whatever people need. On the right hand side, you'll see the last page and that we can change, we can modify that. At the top on the right hand side, you'll see the IDP. So for instance, there's IDP information that we can send out. We can change that, adapt that as we want to. I think the result of that is that people often sit at home now, access that and speak to us immediately. No long emails, no more data, no more coming into town. It's at your fingertips. It's really a wonderful, wonderful way of communicating and it makes people a lot more relaxed. And I think the last thing a mayor wants in your town is somebody's frustrated and cannot get hold of you. We all know that feeling. Then the last thing I want to discuss with you this morning is our traffic smart services signal adaptive, whatever you want to call it, system. There's a lot of technical detail behind this. But let me try and explain to you in layman's terms what this is all about. We all know the terrible congestion and time delay on Southern Bosch roads. Anybody who has ever been to Santa Bosch will know that it's not easy and not nice to travel into our town because it's so popular. It's a very wonderful tourist town and there's lots of people. In addition to that, we have all the students and we know by now 10,000 plus come into the town every morning because they don't stay in hostels. So it really was a nightmare for us. Council then was faced with the definite challenge to provide more roads, but that's very costly to build. And also, of course, land availability is an issue. And if you know Southern Bosch at all, you'll know, touch the park, change the road, touch the tree, and you're in big trouble. So we had to be more innovative than that. And we got this new system now. In fact, it's being implemented as we speak now. The first phase will finish by the end of February. It's a first in Africa, we're super, super proud of that. It's wonderful. How does it work? We know that every robot, every signal is a small computer regulating the traffic and of course the adaption of the green, the yellow and the red light. What we've done now is we installed a master or a big brother computer, mother computer. That computer in fact reads all the traffic in Southern Bosch, scan it, read it and see what's going on. And then that computer decides for the small computers what they're going to do. Tell them when to switch to green or to red or to yellow. We've seen the wonderful results of that even in a trial period. I'm going to show you that now. There's two graphs. It was taken um, in different areas, but it's basically the same result. You'll see it was taken early in the morning between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, which is peak time. And if, if you look at the top um, graph, you'll see... And in fact, the speed increased, not maybe enough, but increased a lot, from as low as 7 kilometers per hour up to 40 or 50 or 60 kilometers per hour. I'm going to show you the second one. If I can just find that one. Now, the second one. That is north, north. It's in other words, going towards Paul uh, in that direction. And once again, there's a huge difference in speed. Look at the yellow line at the top and you'll see how well it works. Once this is done, We'll have a wonderful system controlling all the traffic in our town and then we'll expand it to other areas. So by the end of February, we'll see the first phase and by the end of the year, we'll see the whole of Southern Bosch being covered by that. And that once again relieves a lot of frustration, a lot of tension of people sitting in the traffic and they can get to destination much quicker in time. And I think when we've done that, we'll see that a lot more tourists and people actually come to our town to visit because traffic was definitely not nice to deal with. And I think the bottom line is once again, we serve our customers, we make it easier for them, make them happier. And that is eventually what every mayor, every DA mayor wants. Thank you.
you very much to Mayor Giesi von Deventer from Stellenbosch. And we'll be seeing more of the mayor on our panel discussion uh, shortly. Um, as I said earlier, we have polls which will be running now for the technology and economic growth. We'll be showing you the polls that are being put out there for you to respond to. And we'll bring the results of those polls into our panel discussion, which follows after this. Stage. Technology and economic growth. That's the theme for this poll. As part of this interactive innovation summit, we would like to get your responses to each of the questions. Later in the program, we will show the results and this will form part of our panel discussion. A pop-up window to enable you to participate will pop up once we start. We'll be asking four questions on this theme. Question 1. The sector with the potential to be the single biggest driver of economic growth in South Africa is Agriculture Manufacturing Financial and Banking Services Tourism Mining We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 2. The single biggest threat to achieving economic growth in rural areas is Unreliable supply of electricity Crime Poor road infrastructure Lack of local investment Uncertain property rights and land title we will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Question 3. Residents would benefit most if the following government departments made more of its services available online. Department of Home Affairs Department of Social Development Department of Transport South African Revenue Service South African Police Service We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 4. The single most impactful thing municipalities can do to encourage local economic development is Ensuring planning approval processes are quick and effective Ensuring a stable water and electricity supply Investing more in infrastructure development and refurbishment Rolling out high-speed fibre for better internet connectivity. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. That completes the poll for this theme. Stay tuned for the panel discussion.
welcome back. Yes, some very interesting questions on those polls. And of course, we'll be bringing you the results later in the program. I'd like to welcome back to the panel discussion our presenters, Jordan Hill-Lewis and Maya Giesi van Deventer. And joining us is the Executive Mayor of the Overburg District Municipality, Alderman Andres Franken, but I believe we all call you Saki. Um, welcome to all of you. I'd like to start off by each, asking each of our panelists what you regard as potentially the biggest obstacle at the moment to economic growth where you, in the sphere you are in, and what is possibly the biggest opportunity? And perhaps, Saki, I can start with you. Uh, Richard, yes. I think uh, if I look at the biggest opportunity, I would say um, infrastructure. Um, from a district municipal uh, perspective, I think infrastructure is very important. If you look at the services that district municipal municipalities render, um, the, the, the bulk services and so forth, that's very, very important. Bulk water, um, bulk sewage, that kind of thing. And of course, uh, the big elephant in the room always, um, refuge uh, and um, district refuge um, sites. Very expensive, um, but I think that's one of the main things I would say. Okay, may I hear I think truly um, load shedding, uh, stable electricity supply, because we have tourism businesses and it's awful when you have to close down. That's definitely the biggest obstacle. In terms of opportunities, there's so many. But I think if I can think of one, most probably that we can bring investment to Stellenbosch, uh, if we can stabilize electricity. Um, and I think that's amazing because we are looking for that. I've had been inundated with requests for people to invest. And that's a wonderful opportunity coming to our doorstep. Mm. Jordan, from your perspective? I really want to agree with Giersi. I think uh, there's no doubt that the biggest obstacle to investment in South Africa and economic growth in South Africa is electricity. You simply cannot grow an economy without power. Uh, and no one is going to invest and, and build big factories or uh, new businesses in places where they can't uh, f feel that they have security of power supply. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's undoubtedly the biggest obstacle at the moment. And interesting, that's also the biggest opportunity. Uh, because if DA governments can be ahead of the rest of the country in securing power supply for their businesses and residents, there will just be a flood of investment. Uh, you can just think of a, of a factory owner in Joburg or, or Pumalanga dealing with six hours of, of unplanned outages a day, and all of a sudden they hear that in Stellenbosch uh, or in some other DA-run council, there's no such thing as load shedding. They'll come running. Very, very valid point there. Uh, Mayor Franken, if I can come back to you, the Overberg region is very well known for agriculture, tourism, sports, and and the sporting industries. Some of these have suffered heavily during the pandemic. Um, we think about the Cape Epic and that sort of thing. Is there hope? Are there still opportunities for growth? Can we pull out of this? Richard, um, I think definitely so. Um, if you look at the, the sectors that's really driving the economy in the Overberg itself, you just touched on some of them. And um, the industry that's, that's really, well, believe it or not, actually growing is the, is the agricultural sector. Uh, right through this whole pandemic, uh, the agricultural sector was up and running and, and uh, looking at food security, um, it had to, to, to stay um, afloat. Um, so I think there's a huge potential in that sector. Tourism, unfortunately, took a great knock. Um, during lockdown, everything was down, restaurants, B&Bs, guest houses. So unfortunately, in that sector, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that sector as well. Um, looking at um, new investors, and we're speaking about investment, I think there's really opportunity there. But I think the biggest opportunity at this point in time is in the agricultural sector, and especially in the technology part of that, and in the agri-processing part of it, because that's where the real money lies. If you, if you look at, and I just spoke about, um, about processing, if you look at uh, where the real money lies in that sector, it's there. If you take, and we just spoke about this earlier, uh, about the wheat industry, for instance, um, the, the cheapest bread that you can buy out there is around about 10 rands per loaf. Um, now, it costs the, 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 the person producing that loaf more or less um, 2 rand 50. So you sit with around about 7, 7 rand 50 that you can play with. Now, the, the guy that's um, producing the wheat gets around about 49 cents. Mm. Of uh, worth of wheat for that loaf, so you can imagine um, that um, seven hundred and fifty. What you can do with that? Mm. Same with the the beer industry, the the Oberg district where, where I'm from. 
is in the in the barley producing business. So every can of beer um, takes you around about uh, 60 grams of uh, or uh, takes up 60 grams of, of barley. Um, barley gets uh, produced, uh, take further down the stream. They make malt from that, and from the malt they brew beer. So around about 60 grams of beer, uh, wheat, or rather barley, goes into a can of beer. Cheapest can of beer these days is around about also 10 rand. Now the producer gets around about 40 cents for that um, uh, 60 grams of, of uh, barley. So you can imagine uh, what, what huge opportunity there is in um, agri-processing. Uh, we're doing quite a lot of work in the craft beer industry, and I spoke with Mayor van Deventer about that just earlier. Um, right through the pandemic, there was craft brewers going down, like you can't believe it, um, because SAM and SAB, the big brewers and the, the guys with the um, monopoly, let's say, um, just said, you know what, we can't brew any, any further and we can't brew. Um, so a lot of the, the guys in the craft beer industry uh, went belly up, unfortunately. Mm. Um, we saw opportunity there and um, we, we went to one of the, the big companies here in Cape Town actually that um, unfortunately went bankrupt and said, but there's opportunity on the other side of the mountain as well. There is um, cheap rates and, rates and taxes, great water. Um, we need to re revive this business in order to keep the, the craft beer market up and running. So just touching on a few of them, but I think there's a lot of opportunity and definitely in the export market as well. Great. Before I come back to uh, Mayor van Deventer to talk about using apps for public participation, I'd just like to have a look at the results of our first poll that we've come up. Um, and the question is, the sector with the potential to be the single biggest driver of economic growth in South Africa is, and we can see clearly from the results, the options were agriculture, manufacturing, finance and banking services, tourism and mining. By far, the majority of people said tourism. And I mean, we've heard a lot about that today. We've heard how important tourism is here. But judging and, and coming to what you were saying now, Saki, agriculture comes in second at right. almost 30%. Also a critical, especially for our province, tourism and agriculture, whether it be for wine or for actual uh, food stuff, stuff, very, very important. So I think that's a true reflection of what we've seen. But to come back, um, Mayor Van Deventer, we're talking about the housing app, for example, and others which are used for public participation. This is something that Stellenbosch is leading with and you feel very strongly about. I feel very strong about it because we know it is that if you do not consult your people, you're looking for trouble. Rather inform them, consult them and hear what they want. That's what IDP is all about. You've got to find out what the people want. So our, the second app I spoke about exactly does that. And I'm so happy about that because it's so easy, it's nice. We saw the young people do not attend the town hall meetings, the old style town hall meetings. We saw the older people are scared maybe of going out at night. So it was really becoming less and less people attending that. And now we're inclusive, everybody can use that. So I'm really very excited about that and I feel very strong about that. And it's great to see the technology coming through. Mm -hmm. Jordan, we had a question from Celia's Brink, one of our MPs who's saying, how do we attract qualified professionals. I mean, we want to have growth, we want to have development, we want to get the economy up and going. But if we're looking at planners, financial managers, how do we get them to local government? Because let's yeah. be honest, it doesn't always have the best reputation. I should have expected a difficult question from Celia. It is a very, very tough question. Uh, and I mean, it is central to everything. Unless you can build a capable state with qualified officials and professional civil service, you really, all of your other things are, are, are not possible, all of your other dreams and, and programs. So this is absolutely goes to the heart of the matter. Uh, I'll say a few things that local government has got going for it, uh, and that is that salaries in local government in the civil service are, are actually quite good uh, by, you know, compared to the private sector. Uh, and then I think in comparison to ANC local governments, I, th I really think that well-qualified, excellent professionals want to work for a government that's going somewhere, that's doing the right things, that has a clear vision, that's n clearly not just in it for kind of rapacious theft, uh, and is actually committed to improving the town or the city. Uh, so you can, you, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to get some excellent professionals from around the country who may want to live in these beautiful towns and cities that, that we have the honor of, of uh, being in government in, 
not just because of their beauty, but also because we've got a clear vision and, we, and we're giving them a sense of purpose that they're working for a party that's going places. And I think it's a very important point that you made there, that these experts are out there, we need to attract them, and they have got the ability to, to slot well into the innovations that we, we, we're bringing in. Mm. Saki, earlier you spoke about bulk water, bulk electricity. Um, this is something that we're on a bit of a timeline. We sort of really are in a race against time to ensure that we can continue to s provide these services um, in a time of COVID. I mean, w when bef pre before COVID, um, it was pretty sm smooth sailing for most of our municipalities. But because of people losing jobs, because of the lack of income, providing these services, the municipality still does it, but the income isn't coming in. Um, a comment perhaps on how that's going to impact e economic growth? Um, yeah, that's a very important question because it will impact on economic growth. You're definitely right in saying that. Um, I see there, because it's a very expensive service that we render, electricity, water, and so forth, infrastructure, I see that there's a definite possibility that, that we can get or we should seek investment from the private sector as well. Um, and uh, luckily, being in the Western Cape, the private sector out there see ex that exactly what um, local government is doing in the Western Cape under the DA-run government. Uh, what we are doing, we're doing good. Um, so the private sector actually, um, w they're more than willing to come on board and, tr and, and assist. And I think really there's a huge possibility for us to not just take their money, but, but get their investment into services like that. For instance, in, in my region, I'm, I, I live in a, a quite a rural area in the Overberg, um, a lot of gravel roads. Um, and private sector actually came to, 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 to me and said, but how can we assist? How can the landowners, uh, adjacent landowners to that gravel roads assist um, in upgrading the, the roads for the economic growth? And um, you know what, it's very easy actually. Um, when they put one rand down, we should put, put run, uh, one rand down. Um, they've got a lot of, um, uh, let's say, capital that I won't say lying around, but that can assist us. Uh, a gravel road this, this time um, of year, it's very dry, um, costs you anything in the vicinity of between 150,000 ra 150, rands per kilometer to upgrade, to, uh, um, to put around about a, um, a 300 millimeter slab on that or a, a face. Um, in the in the wetter season, it, it becomes a bit cheaper because um, there's a lot more water going around. But private sector came and landowners came and said, you know what, we've got gravel pits on our land. You don't need to, to drive 50 k's that way and 50 k's back to, to get gravel. Come and, and, and we will assist you. We, we should take that because it's a lot cheaper then. That 150,000 rands per kilometer comes down to something like 70,000 rands per kilo kilometer. And that we need to it's look less at. The, less than half the price. Exactly. Yeah. You said, I want to add something. Maybe it's very controversial. Maybe I'll be told to, to shut down. But you know, one of the things that I find very difficult in local government is the procurement laws. Now, we all know it's meant to stop abuse and people cannot steal. It's meant to regulate it. But we know it doesn't work in some parts of the country. Because it's very difficult. What Saki is saying is fantastic. But how do you bring in private people? when you have to deal with the very strict procurement laws. I'm not suggesting we should necessarily let that go, but I think it should just be changed, maybe amended, to also allow for that. Uh, because right now it's virtually impossible. We all know you send out a request of proposals, you do tenders, and I think, quite frankly, government is taken for a ride because people see you coming, they know it's government has money, or so people think. But the people even want to donate. You can't just accept a donation, you're in trouble. Mm. So maybe we should think about that and ask our party to maybe look at that. Uh, amend amendments, I think, can really make a huge difference. Saki will explain that to you even better than I can do, because I think in a rural area, it's even more possible to involve private people. Correct. Um, I see in Southern Bosch, for instance, all the time, private people want to come and assist, but how do you bring them into the system? You know? It's, it's a very, very good, strict system. Very good point you're making there. Jordan, if I can bring you in here, and there has been talk about um, how we regard audits, unqualified audits, qualified mm. audits, and clean audits. Um, sometimes people say that the quest for the clean audit, you sometimes hamper yourself because for exactly these reasons, you can't 
get things done as quickly as you want to get that clean audit. Now we have qualified and unqualified, which is your basic what it is, one or the other. Mm. Um, perhaps there's a debate for further down the line, but should we be looking at finding ways to streamline the way we do this? I think there's lots of people in government that, uh, in DA governments that will disagree with me, but of course I'm a big believer in, in trying to pursue unqualified and even clean audits. And I think you know one of the DA's biggest achievements is that where we govern, we have been able to deliver consistently clean audits, which means there's absolutely no corruption. It's the, it's the biggest signpost to the public that this is a clean government that respects your money and looks after it carefully. Uh, it does come with some, some roadblocks for, uh, for speedy delivery. Of course, that's true. Uh, and it would be useful to get some practical examples that we could take up with the AG's office and take up in Parliament through legislation to say, you know, some, some of these things might be ridiculous and unnecessary. And that's where you can innovate as well. Uh, speaking of innovation, you can do legislative innovation and regulatory innovation to say, look, you know, times have changed, things have moved on. Here are a number of proposals for how it can work better from local government. So, so your colleagues out there from, from local government should feel free to, to be in touch with us about that. It would actually be fascinating to hear those ideas and, and see what we can do with them. That's fascinating. If I can just stick with you for a moment and talk about what you believe is, is actually stifling innovation. I mean, we have people in the private sector who are coming up with brilliant ideas. We have people within our party that are coming up with brilliant ideas. We have people in the public sector that are also coming up with brilliant ideas. They don't always come to fruition. People don't always want to come forward. How do you think we, can we get over the stifling of innovation where people feel that they, they're not going to get anywhere with what they want to achieve? So remember the incentive system in government is uh, mitigates against innovation. It mitigates against uh, new ideas and creativity. Because most of the people that work in government, most, they, they have guaranteed incomes, they, they, they are not, there's no rigorous system of performance assessment and, uh, and uh, consequence management and so on. So you've really got to have actually the political leadership. It comes down to the political leadership to drive innovation and change the culture in the organization to say we, the status quo is not going to work. We've got declining budgets nationally, treasury slashing local government grants every year. That's just going to get worse. So, you, you know, either, either we adapt and innovate or we're just going to see the slow decline over the coming years. And that's why it's so great to see, for example, what Gies is doing on, on electricity. Uh, it, it has to come from the top. Uh, you've got to change the internal culture of the organization to one which is fundamentally creative and innovative. And we know, um, Saki, if I can bring you in here as well, and I'll also like uh, Maya Fondeva to come in on this one. Agriculture employs a lot of people. Um, it's, it's a job that, it's a, an industry that gives a lot of jobs to people and supports a lot of, of, of households. Now in COVID, we've seen uh, especially seasonal workers and some permanent workers losing that opportunity. How can we look at trying to keep those jobs, um, given that, I mean, we're very glad to see that the lockdown regulations have been lessened, that will help. Mm -hmm. But is that the way forward, that we need to just not go back into a hard lockdown to be able to keep those jobs and even get some people back into agriculture? Correct. Um, and I agree with you there. I think the sector, the agricultural sector itself, is one of those ones that's, for, yeah, for one, very resilient, but for two, there's a lot of opportunity in that. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for new jobs, new innovation, for sure. Uh, if you look at uh, what other countries are doing, um, I think we need to link on to that as well. And, and don't be scared to do things new. Um, I think there's, and I spoke to one of my colleagues and I said, you know what, we need to make agriculture sexy again. Uh, might sound strange, but um, there's such a lot of opportunity, like for instance, drone pilots. The drone technology out there is amazing. Um, they use drones these days for spraying, crop spraying, dusting, um, mapping, everything. Um, why don't we, as farmers or as the agricultural sector, um, invest in something like that? Um, I'm so glad to see that um, Minister Ivan Mayer or MEC Ivan Mayer picked up on, on something like that. And there's a, a drone um, uh, f well, the, in the faculty in Elsenburg, you can you can uh, become a drone pilot now, um, and that's amazing. Um, the same with technology. Um, there's a huge field in IT um, or agri IT. 
Um, the same with the marketing um, part of that. We, we're looking um, at the international markets. Now, our fruit on this side um, need to be marketed um, on the other side of the pond. Um, around about 43% uh, of all the exports um, in the country comes from the, the Overberg, the Cape Islands, and the, um, and the West Coast, um, looking at the fruit. So there's a huge market in that as well, um, and a huge opportunity. But the main thing for me is food security. Um, we will get people to come here if there's food security in our, in our region. And I just want to touch on a few other things as well. If you look at the economy, and I think that's, that's what we need to look at, the, 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 not just the global economy, but the provincial economy as well. Um, there's a few things in the economy that, uh, or in the world out there that drives the economy. Uh, we touched on water security. I think we need to go around with our water a lot better. We need to look at new innovations in that sector. The second one is the, the energy security. We, uh, Mayor Gies has spoke about energy security. But the third leg that builds an economy is your labor force. Now, that we've got a lot of. But we need to upskill the people and we need to educate people to get them into, um, into the labor force. In, to enable themselves to, to, to better themselves in the agricultural sector. And there's a huge possibility for that. I think um, agri-schools and, and, and agri-subjects in existing schools need to be looked at intensively. Same with universities and colleges. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity in that region as well. Yeah. If I can just perhaps go to our second poll question, which has come through now. Um, the question is the single biggest threat to achieving economic growth in rural areas is, and then the options are, an unreliable supply of electricity. We have spoken about that here. Um, that is actually the highest percentage. 27% of our respondents believe that. Crime, also 24%, also very high. Uh, poor road infrastructure, 7%. Lack of local investment at 25%. That's also pretty high. And then uncertain property rights and land title at 16%. The I'd like you to come in there, John. Uh, it's an interesting poll result, and I think the, the, the remark I'd like to make is that actually that fourth one, lack of local investment, which comes out at, at the second highest, at 25%, is actually a symptom of the first two. There would be much better investment if there was a reliable supply of electricity and lower crime. And this is also, we, we haven't touched on crime, Richard, but I think this is also part of this new frontier for DA governments. And, and you, you've just spoken to Alan in the, in the, uh, the panel discussion before this. Uh, but, you know, DA governments have got to step right up to the frontier on protecting residents from the, the, the worst effects of crime. Because we also, it's one, another one of those national services that we just can't rely on. SAPS is totally unreliable. Uh, and it shows in that poll result. I think uh, it's a very important result. Mayor Jesse, from Deventer, do you agree with um, uh, what, what Jordan's saying there, that if we could just, uh, because I know electricity supply is very high on your agenda at the moment, if we could have that, we'd be able to attract that local investment. I mean, there's a lot of big-name companies that are in Stellenbosch and probably still want to come to Stellenbosch as well. Is this one of the issues? Are they talking about things like crime and electricity as mm. keeping them back? Definitely, I think electricity is a big one. You now we've just seen, I don't want to name places, but big companies like this cell has been closed down for many months now, uh, which is an absolute nightmare for us economically. Mm. But you know, crime is such a, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> crime is such a terrible, terrible topic. And um, you know, recently, about a week ago, I had a big meeting with farmers, uh, very concerned about crime. The unfortunate situation is that I have no mandate to police anything. And if I do, you know, I'll be knocked over the fingers because I, it's not my mandate. But the police is not maybe the problem because the police are still functioning. But when it goes to court and if you go to prisons, I mean, what, I'm a trained lawyer, as you know, um, and it doesn't help the police do their work. We've got a wonderful police service in Southern Bosch actually work very well with them. I make it my business to, to get on with them. And they actually catch the guys, bring them in. And they would just walk in the door, out the door, next day. There's a huge collapse, you know, I, I yesterday I just saw Glynisi and we maybe should sit down sometime and decide what is it we can do to put pressure on the justice system to just go back to functioning again. Because the prisons are full, no prisons are built, and 
the national government don't want to admit to the fact that crime is bad. You know, they often release people. They just go in, they book them in, they go out. You see these guys. There's a farmer say to us, I had that guy arrested yesterday. The police assisted me. What are you doing out there again? So crime is a massive, massive problem, especially in, 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 in the rural areas. It's not just a challenge. It's a problem indeed. And we can do nothing about it as local government. But I think that the, the one thing I wanted to, to latch on to was the, the agricultural thing. I'm also a trained agriculturist, you know. I've done a lot of things in my life. So I spent my three years at Elsenburg uh, qualifying. Uh, so I understand I've been in agriculture for many years. And what is a stumbling block to employing people is that we do not empower new farmers. Uh, you know, I get really, really excited, but in a negative way, when I see that new or young farmers get land from national government, but that's it. They get parked there, no support, nothing. Well, how are they supposed to, to survive? You know, if you put any trained, wonderful, experienced farmer on a piece of land without any support, He's also going to be bankrupt soon. So we must also empower our new farmers. I'm passionate about the female farmer space because I was in that space myself for a long time. And you know, there's so many wonderful young women out there who want to farm, but there's no support for them. And in creating those small businesses, we know will attract more workers into to agriculture, make it more sexy. Young people will love agriculture again, and we can really go for that. So I'm very passionate about that space, agriculture and both crime. Well, interesting, I just had a question coming in from uh, Leon von Weyck, the Mayor of George, saying that the municipal administrations need to become more productive in the sense that employment-related costs have grown uh, exponentially year after year after year, and local government is battling with so much of the money that's going on salaries and employment costs. Um, are you finding that where, where, where you're from, Saki? Um, Richard, yes, that's definitely a problem. You're right. Um, and Leon is, is correct in saying that. I think it's even more so... With a, a real moment to take stock and, and remember how fragile this, this system is, uh, but at the same time an opportunity for us to really uh, surge out ahead and, and, uh, and chart a new course for, for the party and for the country. And that's what makes me so excited to be in the DA today because we really are at the forefront of, of hope uh, for the country. You know, the, while, while every service uh, nationally at a, at a national level uh, is in various stages of disrepair, uh, the, the DA is really just a shining example of competence and honesty and, um, and good government. And, and that's really exciting to be a part of. I want to say a very big thank you to my panelists today, all of you adding real value to our Innovation Summit today. Thank you so much for that. I'd like to say thank you to our participants on Zoom who've been sending in your questions and have been participating in our polls. We will be taking a break for lunch and this afternoon we'll be addressing the critical issues and I think it's issues that everyone has mentioned at some part so far today and that is water resilience and energy resilience. So don't go away. We'll be back after the break.
In 2018, the city of Cape Town faced a dire water shortage and the imminent threat of day zero. But with public awareness campaigns and demand and pressure management, the city was able to dramatically reduce water consumption and get through the drought, winning worldwide acclaim. Ongoing efforts to get more water sources on board include tapping into the Table Mountain Group Aquifer to get 30 million litres of water a day and investigating fog harvesting on the iconic Table Mountain. Amidst an ongoing drought, Kocha municipality in the Eastern Cape continues to face incredible challenges to secure a steady water supply to its communities. Drilling more than 40 boreholes alongside initiatives such as upgrades to water treatment works and leak repairs. Well known for keeping a close eye on water leaks is Drakenstein Municipality by encouraging residents to be on the lookout at home and replacing old or aging asbestos pipes. Drakenstein loses just 16.92% of its water, whereas most municipalities lose 37%. They have also brought more water sources on board by building new borehole water treatment plants and increasing capacity. And we can proudly say that DA-led Hesequa is home to South Africa's first highly cost-effective solar-powered plant which converts salt water into clean water. Successfully supplying enough drinking water for Witsant from solar energy alone. These DA-led municipalities are water resilience in action, leading the way to solutions that could be replicated all over the country. A good afternoon to everyone and welcome back to the Democratic Alliance's Online Innovation Summit. This morning we heard the first two themes of the day, that of tackling COVID-19 and of course the second one, technology and economic growth. We heard from our experts, we had a panel discussion, we ran some polls and a very, very interesting uh, morning for sure. This afternoon's not going to be any different equally exciting, equally interesting and thought-provoking. I'm going to request that our participants on Zoom continue to participate in the polls we'll be running, send your questions through for the panel members. And we start off with the third theme of the day, which is water resilience. Now, water resilience is becoming a core concept in water governance. It refers to the ability of communities, cities or regions to withstand the challenges posed by the increased intensity and frequencies of floods and droughts. Now, anyone who's lived in the Cape Town area for the last five years will understand exactly what that means. Our first speaker on the theme of water resilience is currently the mayoral committee member for water and waste. Elderwoman Xanthia Limburg also sits on the planning appeals advisory panel as well as other specialized task teams and previously held the posts of mayoral committee member for informal settlements, water, water so services and energy and mayoral committee member for corporate services and compliance. Prior to being a member of the mayoral committee, she previously served as portfolio chairperson for economic development uh, and spatial planning, as well as energy and climate change committee. Ladies and gentlemen, Elder Lady Xanthia Limburg. Good afternoon to all and thank you for the opportunity. The recent drought that Cape Town experienced has been relatively well documented to date. But overwhelmingly Cape Town also became known as the city to have nearly run out of water. But in reality this is not the entire story and so today I wish to share much of the rest of the story. At the same time a global research institute tells us that 153 cities across the world experience severe water need. And in fact, some cities, including some cities in South Africa, had to resort to tracking in water and implementing extreme 
measures of water rationing. Cape Town was able to steer clear from this crisis. We were able to adapt and learn from the experience to shape a very different and more sustainable water future, one in which Cape Town aims to become more resilient to future drought risks. Cape Town, like the rest of municipalities in South Africa, relies on surface water from dams. These dams are largely owned by the National Department of Water and Sanitation. The city of Cape Town receives the bulk of its water supply from the six largest dams within the Western Cape water supply system. This system is overseen by the National Department of Water and Sanitation and provides supply to other users within the system, such as agriculture and smaller municipalities within the Western Cape province. This image depicts dam capacity at 100% towards the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. And just three years on, dam levels severely drop as low as 19%. The three years of below average rainfall has been described as a 1 in 590 year event based on historical rainfall records. This merely emphasizes how truly unprecedented this particular drought was. Dams and the related systems supplying urban areas in South Africa are generally designed to provide a 98% level of assurance. This means that once in every uh, year there's a 98% probability that there is sufficient water supply to meet demand. But this does not mean that there will only be water restrictions imposed once every 50 years. The general rule for operating under drought conditions is based on the principle that there will be more frequent light water restrictions implemented and far more severe water restrictions implemented uh, less frequently. But the additional uncertainties associated with climate change now has to be factored in as part of future water planning. The success of being able to effectively manage and overcome a crisis such as a drought is not solely based on being able to take rapid action and implement immediate interventions, but it's also about being able to utilize existing resources, skills and abilities that have been invested in for example, in this case, by the City of Cape Town's Department of Water Services over an extended period of time to build a strong, solid foundation. And it is for this reason that investing in doing the basics right should not be underestimated, as this formed a critical part of Cape Town's success in navigating the drought. This strong and solid foundation has been developed over the last 20 years with Cape Town developing a water conservation and water demand management strategy. This strategy has been globally recognized and includes a number of projects and programs. For example, ongoing investment in the replacement and upgrading of water and sanitation reticulation infrastructure has resulted in Cape Town having the lowest water loss rate than any other municipality in the country. Other interventions also included education and awareness programs, leak detection and leak repair programs to assist indigent households with leak repairs and assisting them with managing their household water consumption. This has contributed to Cape Town enjoying the status of having the lowest water use per capita than any other, than any other city in South Africa for many years now. The strategy has been instrumental in Cape Town being able to flatline its water consumption and de-link it from an ongoing economic growth and population growth, a trend that not many cities in the world has been able to achieve. It's this long history and track record of a water-wise and water-conscious city that has formed the basis of Cape Town being able to overcome the drought. In just three short years, Cape Town was able to reduce its consumption by 60%, a world record. It went from consuming 1.2 billion litres of water per day to just under 500 million litres of water per day. The city of Cape Town managed to achieve this massive reduction in water consumption through three key measures. One, 
physical demand management, and this entailed the intensive pressure management through installing smart pressure controllers in multiple supply zones across the city. The installation of water demand management devices, and these essentially are meters that allowed for household water consumption restrictions. The second key measure was around economic incentives, and this involved restructuring the water and sanitation tariffs to not only ensure that they were more cost reflective, but also to ensure that they penalized high water users. The third key measure was through ongoing communication efforts through targeted campaigns and key messaging like Day Zero. This was supported through stakeholder engagement as well as a range of innovative web oriented applications such as the City of Cape Town's uh, water use calculator as well as our Cape Town water map which essentially allowed households not only to monitor their own monthly water consumption, but that of their neighbours and their broader community. This web-based application used the simple principles of peer pressure to encourage communities across the city to rapidly reduce their consumption. Our water demand management interventions around pressure management alone saved the city 70 million litres of water per day. The city was globally acknowledged for its water saving efforts by the International Water Association. We won't, weren't only recognized for the ability to reduce our consumption, but also we did so without having to resort to any intermittent water supply. We as a city and the residents of the city have learned a lot from this drought, but I'd like to hone in on five key learnings which has informed our future water plans. One is that Cape Town will remain vulnerable to climate change related risks and there are multiple recent climate studies that show this and we have to ensure we plan for this. Secondly, regional resource risks need to be ma managed better and this will require cooperation between different partners as well as different spheres of government to ensure that there is better management of catchment areas. Thirdly, we will need to build ahead of time because much of the augmentation schemes are large capital investments that take time and diversification will form a key part of our future water. The city aims to implement desalination, groundwater abstraction, as well as water reuse as part of adding to our water security. The fourth key lesson was that day zero messaging had a mixed impact. It was successful in that it allowed us to reduce our consumption in a very short space of time, but it also unfortunately contributed to a mistrust and lack of confidence in the municipal government, which the city is working hard to restore. The last key lesson learned from this drought is that we were able to learn from international experience and make use of international expertise. This allowed us to save time but also tap into the best solutions that are out there uh, around water security and water supply. But Learning from a drought isn't enough if these learnings are not translated into action. And it is for this reason that the city of Cape Town during the drought worked on developing a water strategy for the city. And the core vision of the strategy is to become a water sensitive city by 2040. And a water sensitive city essentially is when a city optimizes and integrates different sources of water to ensure that there is benefit for all. Within our strategy, we make five commitments to our residents. One is around safe access to water and sanitation, and this involves improved quality of the daily experience of the most vulnerable in our city, particularly those living in informal settlements. Secondly is around wise use, and this ensures that we strike a fair balance between pricing as well as incentives around regulatory mechanisms. The third key commitment to our residents is sufficient reliable water from different sources. The city aims to invest in 300 million litres of new supply coming from groundwater abstraction, desalination, water reuse, while also ensuring we continue our efforts in uh, water demand management and water conservation. 
The fourth uh, key commitment is around shared benefits and managing the risk from regional water resources. We want to be able to utilize the strategy to also optimize and leverage off joint opportunities to benefit the overall Western Cape water supply region. And the last commitment is around building a water sensitive city by 2040 and a water resilient city uh, by 2030. This will entail a long process of transition, but the city, through its holistic and outward looking strategy, aims to achieve this. The strategy has five commitments, which I've just touched on, but it's also informed by 10 key principles. But there are probably eight important things that residents and businesses within Cape Town need to know about the city of Cape Town's water security and reliability going forward. One is that Cape Town will continue to rely on rain-fed dams from water, uh, as this remains one of the more affordable sources of water. But we will have to ensure we remain water-wise and continue saving, as climate variability and rainfall variability will impact uh, surface water sources. Secondly, the city commits to building uh, additional 300 million litres of new water capacity. This will increase our water reliability or availability by 99.5%. And the city has a long capital programme towards ensuring we build this capacity. Thirdly, the bill program will reduce the likelihood of severe water restrictions in the future, which will aid uh, economic security and growth. And fourthly, the cost of more reliable water is affordable because the city aims to structure our water augmentation schemes over time and through a diverse of financial uh, funding solutions to minimize the impact on our residents. Fifth, the new infrastructure may not be used all of the time, but the investment would not be wasted, as the city believes this additional augmentation will act as a key future policy uh, of security and guarantee for the city. We are also through the international expertise that we are tapping into, learning about risk-based uh, schemes around managing these more optimally when there are periods that we do not need to make use of these alternative water schemes. Then the sixth most important thing that residents and businesses need to know about the strategy is that desalination will become an important part of Cape Town's water future because this is one source of augmentation that is scalable and least dependent on rainfall. And Cape Town is suitably located as a coastal city to maximize on the benefits and potential yield from desalination. And then the seventh most, most important uh, aspect to our strategy and reliability for Cape Town's water future is that Cape Town will proactively address regional water risks. We will both provide annual inputs and aggressively monitor the National Department of Water and Sanitation's reconciliation strategy to ensure that there is no delays to large bulk water infrastructure projects. And the last most important thing is that there will need to be a permanent change relationship with water. We believe, given that water is a finite resource, we need to jointly protect this resource. We can give water a second life and enjoy in all of its prosperity. The city aimed to be transparent in drafting or developing our water strategy and it is for this reason that we included our capital investment program within the strategy. We included timelines and budget estimations for each of these augmentation schemes. The augmentation schemes are in different phases of implementation and some have already yielded water into our overall supply. This augmentation scheme and the strategy has been stress tested to ensure that it is robust and adaptable to climate change impacts. In closing, the city has been able to not only overcome and manage a drought, 
we have been able to pull together as city and residents to ensure that we build a far more water secure future. Our strategy can be regarded as a foundational and enabling tool for our city and an important commitment to our residents as we continue on this journey to build a shared water future. Thank you. Hey South Africa, this is a message from Cape Town's bucket bearing bodybuilders, the late night leak reporters and repairers, the water saving succulent specialists, our pressure management magicians, the water wise schoolyard vigilantes, and the Cape's compulsive consumption calculators. It was tough, but together we refused to waste water. Now we're the number one water-saving city in the world. Come and see for yourself. It might just change the way you think about water. The City of Cape Town. Making progress possible. Together. Thank you very much for that informative um, presentation, Xanthi. I think the perception that South Africans were a little blasé about how they treated water, I think your presentation shows that if that had been the case, certainly in the Western Cape, it is no longer the case and certainly not in Cape Town. Um, that critical resource we all need and cannot take for granted. Uh, our next speaker is also someone who is no stranger to dealing with a water crisis that threatened the very existent of the community that he stays in. Executive Mayor of Koha Municipality, Horatio Hendricks, started his career as a teacher at Andres Kral Primary School, where he taught for 22 years, with the last 12 being his principal. In 2009, he ventured into politics as a councillor at the Sara Bartman District Municipality. He served as chairperson of the district's Municipal Public Accounts Committee from 2011 to 2016. Following the DA's victory in Koha Municipality in the 2016 local government elections, Horatio was elected as Speaker of the Council. In 2018, after the tragic passing of Mayor Elza van Lingen, Hendricks was elected as the Executive Mayor of Koha. Ladies and gentlemen, the Executive Mayor of Koha, Mayor Horatio Hendricks. Good day. My name is Arashu Hendricks. I'm the Executive Mayor of Koha Municipality, and I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present the case of Koha in terms of how we were dealing with a prolonged drought. I want to thank Xantia, uh, my colleague, for that excellent presentation in terms of what the Western Cape was doing. We always look as Koha Municipality towards the West to see where the best practices are, but taking that into account, you have to also consider that we are a new government in, in Koha and we don't even closely have the budget uh, that the Western Cape uh, has access to. So we noted the, um, we noted back in 2015, there were signs that, that we were moving into a drought. Uh, we didn't get the expected rainfall. Uh, for the season, and these were worrying signs. When we took over the government in 2016, there were a number of issues we had to deal with, especially when you take into account that the ANC has ruled there for 15 years. We had a 500 million rand backlog on roads alone. Uh, most of the infrastructure, there were no preventative maintenance going on. So apart from a looming drought, we also had some a, a lot of internal issues that we had to deal with. Um, you would all remember in 2017 of June, we had the wildfires in Thornhill, uh, but that was also accompanied by the fires in Neisner uh, as well as Platt, and I don't think we should ever forget. But those were the tangible signs that we were caught up in a drought. Um, there were prevailing dry conditions. The, the atmospheric pressure as well as the humidity was very low. And those, these were all indications that we are in a drought. In 2017 of January, 
the Koga Dam by the end of January, Koga Dam actually dropped below 50% when we, we were at 40% and the, this happened for the first time in a very long time. So we had to um, implement water restrictions or water shedding. By May of that same year of 2017, uh, the dam actually went down to 20%. At that time, we, we had no choice but to introduce or to declare a local state of disaster. A month later, we had the fires. And in August of 2017, um, the dam actually dropped to 15%. And this is our main supply dam. And when that happened, we actually introduced punitive measures because people were not used to the new normal. People were not yet adhering to the call to conserve water. So we introduced punitive measures. <coughs> During that financial year of 2017-18, we embarked upon um, reprioritizing our funding and reallocating some funding uh, from capital projects to other projects that supported our drought effort. This was a very difficult decision because we had so many other backlogs that we had to deal with, but we had no choice. Uh, before the end of that financial year of 2017-18, we realized we will never ever have enough internal funding. We're going to have to look outside of Koga. Our revenue base is just not big enough to support this. And we submitted two business plans to National Treasury. The one plan was based on groundwater development to the tune of 58 million, and the other one was water conservation and demand management to the tune of 92 million. In October of 2018, Treasury approved our funding application, and that was great news. But I want to take you one month before that. In September 2018, we faced our first day zero. Koha Dam actually went down to 6%, of which 3% is usable. The other 3% is sediment and toxic. You can't use it. But we, we truly had our backs against the wall. And we opted to go to the prover proverbial mountain. We got our counselors, we got our farmers, we got our farm laborers. And we all went to Koga Dam, Dam and we actually decided to go pray. And I mean pray. But prayer does work. Because less than a week later, the, the heavens opened. Um, we had about 250 millimeters of rain uh, over one weekend. And, and Koga Dam shot up from 6% all the way up to f over 50%. Um, I, I almost feel compelled to still say hallelujah, and if you're a believer, you can say amen. Uh, so on the one side, we had the approved funding, and on the other side, our dam stood at over 50%. That really put us in a position to launch this assault on this drought, because now we had a little bit of a safety net in terms of water, and we also had 151 million rand in terms of funding. So we went out on a massive exploration program to find the underground water. I think we did about 40 um, boreholes, exploratory boreholes. Uh, some of these boreholes had, had a very good yield, others had, didn't have. Uh, some delivered some brackish water, others had some nice clear water. Uh, we did boreholes all over Koha in every single area. We also went out on a massive water conservation uh, program um, in terms of, of, of uh, new storage facilities, new treatment facilities. Um, that We went out on water conservation and demand management. Uh, we replaced old pipes. We declared a war on leaks. Uh, we retrofitted in uh, meters in disadvantaged areas. We we audited all domestic and bulk meters, and we replaced the ones that was faulty. This was a massive program. We rolled out water tanks in impoverished areas to make sure that these communities actually use the water in the tanks instead of using the water from the dam or from their taps. Um, and our community started to buy into the new normal. Uh, we had water drives and some amazing NGOs as well as businesses. Uh, I think Water Warriors also delivered a truck of water. And we, we just kept things going, so we just kept holding the line. 
We had a massive awareness program. We actually bought a mascot from China and we asked our communities to name him. It was eventually named uh, Splash. This mascot was used at festivals, at shopping centers, uh, at malls, uh, at roadblocks, um, and it was very effective in schools. Um, you could you could see the effect of the awareness program uh, through the use of water that was declining uh, month on month, and people started buying into the new normal. So so things started to change sl slowly but surely. But we soon realized that as much as the awareness campaigns were continuing and as much as we were retrofitting and, 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 and uh, dealing with other issues and trying to save water, we still had to go to ground and find the water. And we did find water. But that's not the only thing we found. We found additional problems. Because 10 years ago, if you did a boil, you would probably strike water at more or less 100 meters, and that would be very good drinkable, potable water. This time around, we went probably 300 meters and more, and we still found brackish water. We still didn't get the, the best yields, and we realized that our water table was diminishing. It was not getting replenished by rain, and we had massive alien vegetation intrusion that was decimating our water table. So apart from protecting our surface water, we now had an additional problem of protecting in the, in the mid and long term our groundwater. And we just didn't have the funding for that. We were still struggling to protect our surface water. We already received funding funding from, from National Treasury. So basically we had to now go international. We had to look at what partners we had outside South Africa and we had to knock on the doors. And the first ones we knocked on was Germany, our partners in Ilsfeld, uh, that we do have a climate change partnership with. They got on board and, and, and started supporting us with funding applications. Uh, and I will speak to more about the, the, the leak detection vehicle. But because of the International Climate Change Conference we had, we got noted by other countries as well. And we got a country from the UK, sorry, we got a business from the UK called Hive Energy. We presented to them a good governance case of COHA and asked them to come invest in COHA. What this company did was to establish a biomass plant to deal with the biomass harvesting in Koga. In other words, what this company does, they put up a plant um, in your municipality. They do an assessment of how much alien vegetation you have and what the struggle is with your underground water. Instead of removing the alien vegetation, you get the opportunity to harvest the alien vegetation. So instead of just removing it, it's now sold to the biomass plants through chips and you use SMMEs to do the harvesting. So apart from dealing with our mid and long term challenge with underground water, we had the opportunity to massively increase our SMMEs in job creation because um, what a typical SMME does, they go into that, that, that wooded area, they chop down the trees that, that's using up your water sources, they chip that wood and then sell it to the biomass plant who then further creates uh, compressed carbon as well as nutrients for farmers and farming land, uh, also supporting drought-stricken areas, and they export that. So about 40 to 50 SMMEs will be able to do the biomass harvesting, and about 400 people will get jobs from that. Our German partners uh, also raised a, a, a application for funding and, and what they've succeeded to do was to get a smart leak detection vehicle. The, what this vehicle does, it's mobile, it goes to the actual ground zero of where you have a leak. They can detect the leak and fix the leak on site. They are fully equipped in terms of the telemetrics. They are fully equipped in terms of resources to deal with a leak on site. This is a very smart vehicle. I'm not a technocrat, so I can't explain that too deeply. All I know is that it will make a massive difference in us detecting and fixing leaks as early as possible.
So these were some of the innovations and technology that we introduced when we realized that it's not just surface water that's our problem, but also we don't have sustainable groundwater. But other than dealing with education and awareness, um, declaring war on leaks, uh, the massive programs on water conservation, you, you must realize that in 2020, which was a very difficult year for Koha municipality, because one, we were dealing with fires because of the dryness, we were dealing with a prolonged drought, and we were dealing with COVID-19. This was a triple threat to a very small semi-rural municipality who have very limited funding. So we had to think out of the box. Um, we had to apply strong administrative and political leadership who has the political will and administrative will to make that difference. But other than all of the programs that we had, the one thing that made the biggest difference um, was the fact that you needed heroes. And I found those heroes in the people of Koga. Because that individual, that normal individual on the street um, made his contribution in whatever small way to protect the interest of Koga and to protect our people. And I want to tell the people of Koga that I'm absolutely very proud of them. The fact that we've been dealing with this drought since 2016, we just came through two uh, massive lockdowns um, and we're still here, we're still holding the line. And this is because of our communities and, and the fact that they they, they're part of our governance. So I want to thank them. I want to tell them I don't want to be any part of any other municipality. I still believe we are the best municipality in the Eastern Cape. We've got the first plastic road in Africa just to show that we're open to innovation and technology. Just listen to me promote my own municipality. Um, but yes, I want to thank our people and I want to say to them we're partners in this and, and, and I'm looking forward to the journey with them. So thank you everyone for listening to me and giving me the opportunity to present the case of Koga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Hendricks, um, for that presentation. And feel free to promote your municipality when you've been uh, using innovation like you guys have. You can brag all you want. Of course, you did mention it there, Mayor, that the Koha municipality also won international acclaim for the first plastic road. And hopefully, if we have time, we can touch on that during the panel discussion. Um, before we go into that panel discussion, just a reminder again that uh, for this theme, Water Resilience, we'll also be running some polls. Those will be coming up uh, in a few seconds. Take part, make your contribution, and send those questions through. So have a look at these poll questions, fill them in, and we'll be back on the other side of this for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Stay tuned. Water resilience. That's the theme for this poll. As part of this interactive innovation summit, we would like to get your responses to each of the questions. Later in the program, we will show the results and this will form part of our panel discussion. A pop-up window to enable you to participate will pop up once we start. We'll be asking four questions on this theme. Question one. The single biggest threat to securing a sustainable water future for all South Africans is climate change, National Department of Water and Sanitation, poorly run local governments, urbanization, a lack of engineering skills. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question two. Theoretically, the entity best placed to manage the reticulation of bulk water is local municipalities, 
district municipalities, regional water boards, external service providers, provincial governments. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Question 3. The most exciting development in the water sector right now is mobile water treatment plants, solar powered desalination, fog harvesting, design of waterless toilets, monitoring water quality through mobile apps. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 4. The pollution of water sources can be stopped if the national government pursued the following as a priority. Criminally convicting the municipal officials responsible. Strengthening the capacity of the green scorpions. Deploying provincial teams of engineers to municipalities. Increasing conditional infrastructure grants placing municipalities under administration. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. That completes the poll for this theme. Stay tuned for the panel discussion. Welcome back. Some interesting questions there on the polls and we will share the answers of those questions with you later in the program. But first, I'd like to welcome both our speakers uh, to the studio, Xanthia Limburg, Alderwoman and Mayor Horatio Hendricks, welcome. Um, if there ever was an example of how a devastating crisis was averted in record time with the buy-in of citizens, it was defeating Day Zero in Cape Town and also in Coca. I mean, you faced very, very similar challenges there. The naysayers and the prophets of doom who were sort of predicting a major catastrophe were stunned into silence. Um, but as much as that was a success, the work of water resilience is far from over. And I mean, uh, Coja and, and uh, the city of Cape Town uh, are not the only municipalities or metros in the country facing water challenges. South Africa has always been a water scarce country and perhaps in the past we may have been a little lax with that. Um, but given what you've both been through, what priority would you put forward to forward thinking municipalities or, or, or mayors in metros and what should they be pursuing with regard to water management and water security? Anthea, if I can start, Zanthi, if I can start with you. Well, it's um, about focusing on the basics and getting that right and ensuring that there's ongoing commitment from a budgetary as well as a resource capacity perspective. But the reality in the story of Cape Town is that we ultimately had to make a decision to act outside of our municipal um, mandate or competency and invest in bulk water augmentation. Something that municipalities are not necessarily geared for, both from a staffing uh, point of view, but also from a financial uh, perspective. And I think that is something that municipalities going forward are going to have to contend with and find innovative ways to enter that space in aid of building water security for their region, because it is such a critical component to economic growth and development of cities and communities. Thank you, and, and Maya Hendricks, you, you also in Coca got to that point where it was really 
almost the edge of the precipice. Um, you didn't have the resources of a Cape Town necessarily at your disposal. What's your advice for a, a smaller local community with dealing with this type of, of, of water resilience and water management? Well, firstly, Richard, it's about protecting what you have. It's kind of uh, pointless in trying to deal with a drought when you don't protect what you have. So you got to do your preventative maintenance. you got to fix the pipes before it becomes a problem. And this is something we experienced based on the 15 years that the uh, previous party governed in Koha. They never did that. They just, what, what we inherited was just a lot of backlog on a lot of infrastructure, including electricity, including pipes, and not just water. Um, so yeah, you gotta take care of what you have before you start looking for other things. Then you gotta change the mindset of people because without people, you're not gonna do it. And I'm very proud of what Cape Town did. Um, all my visits to Cape Town, I could just see and feel it that people cared about water. If people don't care about it, if they're not interested in that, you would, you would find in Koha municipality, we have inland towns and we have coastal towns. Now the coastal towns never had a problem with water. So while people were conserving water in, in the inland towns of Hanke and Patiensi, we had serious issues in, in, in towns like Yemasdorp and Jeffries Bay, where people figured it's, it's not a problem. Pro when I open the tap, the water is there. So we don't have an issue. But little did they realize that we have to track in water from Yemasdorp to conserve uh, 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 water in, in Anki and Potency. So you've got to change the mindset of people. The, it is called a new normal. Um, and if people are not partners in the program, all else fails. Thank you very much. And I see our first uh, poll question is already back in. The question was, the single biggest threat to securing a sustainable water future for all South Africans is and the response is there, climate change, which nearly 30% of the people reacted to. National Department of Water and Sanitation, almost 40% said they were the biggest threat. Poorly run local governments, 22%. Urbanisation, just 3%. And a lack of engineering skills at 8%. Now, um, climate change obviously has an impact and we've known climate change is with us. And as you were saying earlier, Xanthia, that, that you have to factor that in. Um, but with almost 40% of the people saying the National Department of Water and Sanitation. Is that is that a, a serious threat? Well, the reality is written in the Constitution. The National Department of Water and Sanitation are constitutionally responsible for bulk water provision. Municipalities are responsible for the reticulation of that service to residents and businesses. But more and more municipalities are being pushed into the space where they need to think about water security from a bulk water perspective because we are seeing a delay in bulk water augmentation projects and schemes not being put in place. And this does expose us to greater risks of water security. And I think that municipalities are going to uh, have to aggressively monitor and play an oversight role in terms of ensuring that there is adequate implementation and implementation in time. One other, I think, um, aspect that the National Department of Water and Sanitation needs to uh, prioritize in its uh, future water planning strategy documents uh, is around diversification. A lot of the bulk water augmentation schemes that they are planning across the country are still largely orientated to groundwater solutions. We do need to see a greater portion of that going to alternative water sources because we are located in a water scarce region and that isn't going to change. Climate change studies um, do indicate that we are potentially approaching a step change um, and so we have to prepare for a future of greater water variability and rainfall variability and climate variability. Um, and if we fail to do that, we will continuously be in a position where we are water scarce and where we are going to starve our economy and um, the livelihoods of people across the country without adequately investing in additional water supply. Thank you. My, my Hendricks, the, the local communities in rural areas. Um, I guess a lot of people there just look to the municipality and put all the blame there. No matter, you know, they don't really see the bigger picture and how bulk water is accessed. Do you find that you having to do more of that and sort of say, listen, even though the national department has certain responsibilities, we have to step up and say, we have to fill that gap? 
Yeah, other, what you gotta understand is we, we, we are the users of that water and we gotta protect the little that we have. We gotta rethink how we're using that water. As much as we wanna blame the national departments and them not coming to the party, we've got X amount of water. You gotta use that very sparingly. Like Xantia says, we don't know what the full effects of climate change will be. We don't know when this drought is really gonna end. We gotta hold the line. And you gotta have your communities who uses that water to rethink how they use that water. In Koha municipality, every seven to 10 days, it rains. But where does that rain fall? It doesn't fall in our catchment area. What do you do with that rain that is falling? We shouldn't be in a drought. We should have enough water. We gotta rethink that little that we have. We capture it and we use it. But again, it's changing the mindsets of people to buy into this new normal, to buy into the fact that we don't have enough to go around. Um, and we gotta think of how we use it. I saw in your presentation the uh, the smart van for fixing leaks, and I know yes. um, from personal experience, Drakenstein have a massive um, campaign to find leaks and bring that water loss between source and tap down as much as possible. Um, it's almost unbelievable that I think the figure is 37% is the average of water that's lost. That's an incredible amount of water, isn't it? That is, and I mean, yeah. it goes back to the point that Horatio made, that we have to protect what we have. Um, I touched on it in my presentation around doing the basics right, um, because essentially that is a quick win, and that is ultimately where we are, as local government, responsible for maintaining our reticulation infrastructure. And so the city of Cape Town for many years has invested in a leak detection and leak repair program, um, and through our pipe replacement program, we've been able to reduce the amount of bursts along our network, and this has also also resulted in, be, in, in allowing us to minimize our water loss rate and we're working towards improving that year on year. I wanted to also touch on the previous point that Arasha made around um, despite the fact that National Department of Water and Sanitation are responsible for bulk water supply, we collectively have a role to play and I think uh, partnerships is key as part of this issue around water security. And the city of Cape Town is looking at ways to work with other partners. So for example, around catchment management, which is something that we jointly need to assist with through the removal of alien in veg uh, vegetation. Uh, there's a great Greater Cape Town or Greater Cape uh, Water Fund that's been established. Uh, it's a combination of government as well as the private sector financially contributing towards the removal of alien invasive plant species within these catchment areas. Because by doing so, we are able to potentially uh, yield an additional uh, 200 million litres of water per year towards our overall water supply. Um, but we are bound by municipal boundaries. And even though our water supply comes from other catchment areas outside of our boundaries, this kind of fund assists us to work across those borders while getting the support of private sector funding as well. We had a, a question coming in from the media here from uh, a correspondent from the BRICS Post. Um, that's BRICS as in BRICS countries. Uh, asking whether any DA municipality is looking at small hydroelectric turbines at pressure reduction points, as has apparently been implemented at Bloom Water. Do you, could you speak to that or is this something you'd... Well, the city of Cape Town has its hydro plant at the Stembrus Dam and this assists with um, the overall management of that system, but has also been effective towards um, helping the city uh, protect itself from different stages or the first phase of or stage of load shedding. Um, and so the city is looking at different ways of how we can maximize uh, different technology solutions to reduce our demand on energy for the operations of not only our water reticulation facilities, but as well as our wastewater treatment plants. Horatio, from a small community um, as opposed to, to Cape Town. You both, however, face the, I don't know how to describe it, but the wrath of, of residents when you have to impose water restrictions or there have to be water tariffs that are brought in. Now, what we've seen in both your cases is that it worked and we, we saw the results, but the winning the trust and the, and, and the, and the confidence of the community, uh, having to do that, it couldn't have been easy, Horatio. No, it wasn't. People actually resisted the punitive measures that followed because they didn't conserve water. 
but it's got to be coupled with the education and awareness program where you go door to door and you knock on people's houses and you explain the fact in his face why you need to conserve water. Um, uh, we had a massive program where, like you see in the presentation, we introduced a mascot that we took to schools uh, because you you, you got to get them while they're young. So we went into crashes, we went into schools, we went into malls, we went all over Koha. Even at a roadblock you would find uh, you're not being pulled over for a traffic uh, infringement. But I'd rather just shake hands with our mascot to say, please save water. So you've got to have the buy-in of, of the community, otherwise they're just going to resist you. And back in 2017 when we started having issues and introducing punitive measures, it actually didn't work. People are still using uh, too much water, especially uh, we realized with, 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 with bulk users, uh, they were not, people were still filling up their, their swimming pools. Um, if you want to charge me more, fine. I think the same thing happened in Cape Town. Uh, but you can't, you can't govern with a stick. You got to get the people's buy-in. And that takes a massive education and awareness, and it takes time to have. But once you get into that stride of a new normal, that Cape Town did very well. Um, then, then things start to subside and you start to make, make progress uh, in terms of developing your infrastructure because now you've got the opportunities that you didn't have before. I think that's very true. I think the figure was something um, Cape Town did it in half the time that Sydney did it or something. So people did buy in, but it wasn't always easy. It definitely wasn't um, easy. Cape Town did achieve a world record in that we were able to reduce our consumption within a three-year period. Other cities across the world have taken much longer to reduce their consumption by half. So we are proud of what we've achieved, but we couldn't have done it with our residents, and buy-in is key. I think when it comes to uh, imposing water restrictions and the intensification of water restrictions, residents want to see fairness and that you're applying these restrictions across the board. And so we did have to display that um, continuously, that we were taking action in suburbs as well as uh, transport interchanges for taxis. And once you show that consistency, that is how one develops a buy-in. And around tariffs, I mean, there's been great resistance and there still is a lot of unhappiness. But you have to strike a balance between also providing adequate levels of subsidization for households who are struggling and cannot um, afford high tariffs. Uh, but you also have to demonstrate to residents how you are using public money towards investing in greater water security. And the city attempted to do so. And communication is key in Communication is not just about communicating a particular message to residents or a sector of your society, but also listening. And so, for example, with our water strategy, we took that out for public participation. We made changes based on input received. And that is what our approach is going to be going forward, listening to our residents as much as we can as well. Thank you. I see our second uh, poll question is back, and this touches on something we were speaking about just now. And the question is, theoretically, the best, en the best the entity best placed to manage the reticulation of bulk water is, and by far, their local municipalities, 62%, exactly what, what you were saying. District municipalities at 16%, regional water boards at 11 external service providers down at 3 and provincial governments less than 10% at 8 So it's exactly what we were saying here, the reticulation. That's local municipality. That's, that's yeah. the bread and butter. Now, if we think about this being an innovation summit, um, we've heard about a lot of ways that innovation is used. Um, and especially when we were looking at day zero, I mean, people were talking about barges that do desalination that are, 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 are off, offshore. And we may laugh now, um, but of course there was the iceberg, which people wanted to bring in. And at the time, um, there were some very serious talks going around about bringing an iceberg. Um, where are we with that? So during the drought, the city wanted to essentially open itself to understand what technologies were out there. And so we did a call for proposal and we received a range of different technology solutions. Um, and each one of those, we did a very uh, rapid assessment around their viability and their potential yield. And it's on that basis that we chose augmentation schemes that we were able to uh, implement rapidly that had the largest potential yield. Um, the transportation of icebergs 
um, according to the assessment that we have done, is both logistically complex, but in terms of long-term water uh, availability, there are multiple challenges as well. And so we did not opt for that, but we continue on exploring different technology solutions. Um, we're currently in the process of running a pilot assessment on fog harvesting um, up on Table Mountain. And this shows our commitment towards continuously understanding what is available. The Water and Sanitation Department in the City of Cape Town also developed a uh, water technology unit where we can receive proposals and technology ideas from the private sector so that we can be on top of what the world is, has to offer and um, implement or adapt our plans accordingly. If I can just come back to a point you made now about fog harvesting. I mean, in the video that was played just now, we saw um, a couple of visuals of that, but I'm not sure everyone understands exactly how that process works. Could you just break down what fog harvesting is? Well, basically it um, is based on uh, the fact of uh, there's a mesh uh, material and we do use different uh, materials for the mesh structures that we've um, installed and we've set up two mesh um, harvesting structures on different parts of Table Mountain. Um, and as obviously water rises, uh, this water passes through this mesh and water is then collected into rainwater tanks. We have um, measuring uh, installations or applications um, attached to these mesh structures to uh, monitor the volume of water. and. Once we are complete with the pilot, we'll obviously be under, able to understand the viability, what the potential yield is, um, and whether there are limitations around the location of being able to set up something like this across the board, or whether it is more suitable for localised use. Um, and so that is the outcome that we're hoping to understand after we've um, been able to perform the pilot. And Rachel, I can come back to you. It's a point you touched on in your presentation as well, and that is about groundwater extraction and this fear amongst, and it happened in, in, in Cape Town as well, fear amongst residents that we used it up and it's not going to come back and, you know, we can't just sink boreholes wherever we want. How do we sort of allay those fears and say, look, yes, we are taking groundwater, but we're not going to deplete those resources completely? Well, the studies that has been done showing the aquifer, I think it comes all the way from Cape Town past us. It's a massive amount of water. That's probably hundreds of years of water. But the fact is it still needs to be replenished. You can't just use it. And as you saw in my presentation, you've got to drill deeper and deeper. And that means the water is going somewhere, but it's not coming up. Um, so, yeah, you've got to protect, protect that water source as much as you can. I've heard talks about um, uh, reticulating water back from your, your, your grey water as well as all other water, uh, reticulating that back into the aquifer. Uh, but there is a massive amount of water. Uh, treating that water is something different. In Koch municipality, our, our groundwater program shows that will be 50% less dependent on the water we buy from the metro. Now at a cost of about, I think it's about 50 million rand a year that we spend on buying water from Koga Dam, which is in Koga, uh, but it's owned by, by the metro. I need to speak to Naba on that. Um, so we're going to reduce the amount of water that we buy by 50% that you can reinvest then into your infrastructure development as well as your preventative maintenance. So that groundwater source is, is gold to us. We need it. Uh, and it presents other opportunities to us. So um, there are studies that shows that um, groundwater is not sustainable. You can't be fully dependent on, on groundwater. So it's, it's always augmenting what you already have. Uh, but yes, it's available. It's there. Why not use it? And could we then say that the message we moved on from uh, potentially is instead of use less water or save water, is use water responsibly? Yes. Uh, because people are saying, oh, but there's water in the dams, we should be able to. But the fact is, even if there is water in the dams, use water responsibly. Is that the message? Absolutely. And repurpose that water. And this is what Cape Town's water strategy is all about. Being able to uh, close all the loops along the water ecosystem so that we can maximise the resource. Um, and it's for this reason as well that the city of Cape Town has taken a very conservative approach around its groundwater abstraction projects. Uh, and we've implemented 
implemented what we call a managed aquifer recharge scheme, where we're not just hoping to draw water to supplement our own supply, but actually assist with the sustainable management of this resource so that it can uh, remain a resource for future generations. And so we are looking at, um, and we have to date over many years, artificially recharged aquifers uh, to sustain the resource in uh, aquifers such as the Cape Flats aquifer, which is in a largely urban area, the aquifer water is quite polluted. So we're also looking at improving the quality of water coming from the aquifers through our managed aquifer recharge scheme, all in aid to ensure that we are not only taking from the environment, but that we are giving back. Well, our participants on Zoom have been busy with the polls and we have the next question in. Uh, it is the most exciting development in the water sector right now is mobile water treatment plants comes in at 11%. Solar power desalination at 37%, fog harvesting, which we just spoke about now at 6%, design of waterless toilets at 17 and then the next highest, monitoring water quality through mobile apps at 29%. So using the apps, that's quite a popular um, answer here, but solar power desalination seems to be the choice of our participants here for the most exciting development. Is this something that we're going to see a lot more of? For Richard for Koga, solar power desalination is probably not an option. The, the, the reason for that is our coastal towns have a massive amount of underground water, um, uh, what you call um, fountains and spring water. This is not an issue. For us to put a desalination plant there, we have to pipe that water about 40 kilometers away. So the actual uh, uh, reticulation is going to cost more than the plant. Then there's always the cost of that water uh, and whether our communities can afford to pay that rent. So we're discussing probably a regional plant that we do not have a coca solar plant and we involve the metro as well as they, they're also getting water from us and we involve the, the, the um, let's say more to the west, Kokama, probably even Platt. And we get a regional plant and we share the cost of that um, that's more viable option for us, for us. But to go with a uh, with one plant for coca alone, it's just unaffordable to us. How far we need to push that water through pumps and 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 it, it, the cost would be enormous. I understand that the Hesekwa municipality has has a desalination yes. uh, solar power desalination plant up. Viable for for the metro. Well, desalination will be a main feature as part of Cape Town's water future. Uh, and during the drought, we um, implemented or installed three desalination plants. They, these were all of a temporary nature, but as part of our augmentation program, we plan to have a large uh, permanent desalination plant. And we're obviously looking at ensuring that this is uh, run in the most energy efficient way um, and so uh, investigations will look at how we can reduce our reliance on high energy um, bills. But the city has also invested in energy to waste programs um, and to divert that into energy to offset running costs on other water um, facilities like our wastewater treatment plants and potentially that is an avenue that can also be used for our desalination plants. So we're exploring a range of different options, yes. And water resilience is the, the topic which we're discussing today. And um, due to what happened with um, with Coca and with Cape Town, uh, we focused on, on drought management. But what you were saying, Xanthia, in your presentation as well, that water resilience is far more than just a drought. It's about the floods. It's about water management in general. Uh, Horatio, you're talking about the rainfalls in the wrong places. You may have to deal with that. So flooding is also something, um, I mean, it sounds crazy to talk about it just coming out of a drought, but flooding is a serious issue. Yes, it is. And Cape Town is uh, obviously not new to floods and we experience many of our floods in our peak rainfall period. And it is for this reason that the water strategy aims to transition Cape Town into what is called the water sensitive city, where we use wastewater, stormwater um, and other forms or sources of water to deal with flood control to improve urban waterways as well as assist with aiding or adding to our additional, uh, additional water security into the long run. Um, it's a holistic view to assist with all of these challenges within our urban environment. Rasha, from your side, do you feel that um, with the drought now 
relatively under control. I mean, you guys have managed to, to get over that hurdle. There are other hurdles like localised flooding and other water issues in your area. We will welcome a flood. We are flanked by the uh, Titicama River in to the west and the Storms River, um, no, sorry, the, the uh, uh, Van Starens River to the east. Then we have about three rivers um, within Koga municipality that basically feeds our, our farmers uh, through irrigation. So that water sources are very important. Uh, but most of these rivers are seasonal. And it's very dependent on the seasonal rain. Um, we get floods probably every 10 to 12 years. I think the last flood we had was around about 2007. Um, so ever since then, the rain just disappeared. Um, so yeah, we, we, we don't have um, a lot of low-lying areas that's prone to, to uh, flooding and, and, and all of the effects of that. Um, we actually have a problem that because our rivers are drying up, they're not reaching the ocean. Um, the Siequi River as well as another river, um, we, we keep on having to drench uh, because now it presents an a, a ecosystem problem. Um, and your ecosystem is now at risk. So we keep on having to drench so that uh, the natural fl flow, even flow of water can actually happen. So rain has stayed away for such a long time that, that <laughs> we would welcome any flood. We just want the water. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about um, leaks, in water systems, obviously a lot of pipes, their age is an issue. Um, sometimes buildings and so on uh, activities disrupts the pipes. I was reading somewhere that there is a lot of new types of piping coming out that has a much longer uh, lifespan and that sort of thing. But the cost of replacing entire networks of pipes must be astronomical. It definitely is. Uh, in Cape Town's case, we have a water reticulation network that stretches over 11,000 kilometres long. And on the sanitation side, over 9,500 kilometres um, long. So it takes annual investment uh, to ensure that we replace different parts uh, or segments of our network to ensure that we can deal with the most critical uh, parts of the network to manage water loss uh, and reduce um, loss uh, of revenue through water as well. So it's an ongoing and long-term um, investment program that forms part of our overall master plan. Um, and the city consistently sets aside a significant part of our budget towards that. Um, and I think the risks um, of not doing that can be seen in many parts of South Africa. And so it remains a priority for the city um, because the loss of water in the long run obviously poses a massive risk. But it also um, is also incredibly inconvenient when people are having to be shut off from supply during periods of um, burst pipes. And so we need to make sure, and this is what the city is also doing, that there is both preventative maintenance and an adequate budget set aside to do that. And Arisha, I find that one of the complaints you hear from people across the country is response times. And I'm guessing for a municipality, that's critical. If people say there's a leak here, there's water pouring out this area or whatever, yeah. the response time that you can set in motion um, works well, as you were saying before, you need communication and education. And yeah. response time is part of that to say to people, this is how quickly we can get to your problem. Now you see the, the, the infrastructure system, the bulk infrastructure system in Koga is very old. Um, if you want to do preventative maintenance, you probably got to know where the pipes are. And when we took over this municipality, there wasn't even an asset management register or an asset management plan. So at one point in time when we took over, somebody told me there's a, a 80 year old guy who knows where the pipes are. And if he dies, it's Nobody knows. Can you believe it? So people didn't take, take care of this municipality. But in back in 2017, we realized that the complaints were not getting to us. So we established a, a call center. We established a link app on, on your cell phone. Uh, and we've probably, we've now advanced that to a WhatsApp system as well. So people can report early. We got a turnaround of about 24 hours in terms of service delivery requests that we turn around. Our turnaround is about 24 hours. Our success rate is about 92%. This is very important as to what you referred now in the response time. If that 
pipe burst, if that fire hydrant is leaking, whatever the problem is, you can respond to that immediately. This fire, this sorry, this um, uh, leakage de detecting vehicle that we're going to get from Germany is probably going to help us to plot where the pipes are because it has the ability to, to detect those pipes underground. I don't know how the technology works. I will probably get inducted on that as well. But that's going to help us to replot. So we, if we want an asset management plan, you got to know where the assets are first. And we didn't inherit a lot of that from the previous government in, in Koha. Well, thank you very much. Our time is just about up. If I can just ask perhaps a last message to people out there who are wondering how water resilient we are. Cynthia? Well, Cape Town's uh, in a far better position. Um, the dams within the Western Cape water supply system have recovered. And this is partly because of some additional rainfall, but actually largely because of an ongoing low and stable level of consumption. And we wouldn't be able to be in this position without our residents. Uh, from a Cape Town perspective, we, um, we've got 70% of our users from our residential customer base. And so it, it's our residents that we depend on to drive down consumption. So not only have our residents assisted us with getting through the drought, they are a key source of why dam levels are where they are. Um, last year, dam levels reached um, just over 100% actually. And so we extend our greatest thanks to our residents who are our most important partners. And we will depend on them as we continue this journey because it is a journey. The transition to a water sensitive city is not an easy one. Um, Singapore is regarded as a water sensitive city, but it took them 50 years to get there. Um, and so it is for this reason that collaboration and collective action is required throughout the way. Thank you very much. Rachel, last word from your side. Richard, yeah, we were quite jealous of the amount of rain that Cape Town uh, received uh, and the fact that they could deal with the issues. We had a saying in Koha that it seems like Cape Town is having ropes around the clouds <laughs> and they refuse to release it a little bit downward. Uh, but yeah, they did well. Uh, I want to echo what Xantia says. It's about buying into the new normal. It is a new normal. It's not for a year or two years. It's for a very long time that we need to conserve water. And you've got to get your communities to buy into that. I want to echo and say also protect what you have. Thank you very much. And I think Cape Town might be a little jealous of your plastic road. So, uh, you know, it's a bit of all that. Thank <laughs> yes. you very much to our participants out there on Zoom for sending in the questions and for taking part in our polls. Don't go away. We'll be back with our last theme of the day, energy resilience, after this. Have you noticed how, when most of South Africa gets that dreaded load shedding notification, Cape Town often gets a clear forecast? This is with the help of the Steenbras Pumped Storage Power Scheme, which picks up the slack whenever possible. The DA-led city of Cape Town is a perfect example of how governments can innovate to make our power supply more reliable. They are leading the way by installing rooftop solar systems on city buildings, by retrofitting traffic and streetlights with LED lamps, and by installing smart electricity meters. The city's waste to energy project is even working to turn the harmful greenhouse gas the city extracts from our rubbish into electricity. This is all in pursuit of keeping the lights on. If we look to the DA run Western Cape at large, a priority is to enhance the uptake of rooftop solar PV at businesses, such as on the roof of this Cape Town shopping center, because we've got to keep our economy working. DA run governments are also promoting innovation through the installation of solar panels on the roofs of schools and clinics so that these facilities can keep operating during load shedding. In fact, the DA is on a nationwide mission to free all South Africans from ESCOM's monopoly. This includes urging our national government to open up our grid and allow the private sector to compete with ESCOM to supply electricity on a level playing field to change the law so businesses and individuals can sell the extra electricity they generate onto the grid for others to use, to offer a 75,000 Rand tax rebate to cover the cost of installing solar systems in homes to take the pressure off the grid, to zero rate VAT on LED light bulbs and energy efficient appliances, and to allow municipalities to purchase power directly from independent power producers rather than having to rely on ESCOM. 
the DA is doing everything possible to get our national government to step aside and let the private sector, provinces and municipalities get on with the job of keeping the lights on, keeping businesses and industry working and ensuring that our economy grows. Welcome back and you join us as we start our fourth and final theme for the day, which is energy resilience. It's almost hard to believe that load shedding has been with us, I think it's for about 15 years now. And despite vague promises and claims that it'll all be over soon, load shedding and rising costs from ESCOM don't seem to be going away anytime soon. Like with water, an uninterrupted and stable supply of electricity are critical to any sustainable economic development you might want to do. And energy resilience is not a nice to have, it's a must have. Now, our first speaker on this theme is the Western Cape Provincial Minister of Finance and Economic Opportunities, David Mania. David has served for the past 10 years in the National Assembly as Shadow Minister of Finance and Shadow Minister, Minister of Defense and Military Veterans. veterans. He holds a Bachelor of Arts Honours Degree from the University of Cape Town and a Master's Degree in Public Administration and Management from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He'll be working around the clock over the next five years to grow the economy and create jobs, maintain stable public finances and promote clean government in the Western Cape. Ladies and gentlemen, the Shadow Minister of Finance, David Mania. In the Western Cape government, innovation is implemented transversely across departments and within departments. And it's all about finding new ways to work. It's about finding new ways to impact the lives of citizens, new approaches to activating them as partners to shape the future together. It involves overcoming old structures and modes of thinking and embracing new technology and ideas. As Premier Alan Wendy mentioned earlier today, the COVID-19 pandemic has driven us to be more innovative, which includes the award-winning COVID-19 dashboard, our Red Dot Taxi service, and the measuring of COVID-19 infections through wastewater. But when it comes to innovation, there is no greater need than in the energy space, where ongoing load shedding by ESCOM is causing havoc on our businesses, restricting investment and slowing economic growth in the Western Cape. It's almost as though the COVID-19 pandemic is a left hook and load shedding is the right hook, uh, which together have been a knockout blow for many businesses across the Western Cape. In fact, we estimate that in 2020, load shedding costs South Africa's economy 500 million rand per stage per day, and the Western Cape's economy 75 million rand per stage per day. To throw back a few punches of our own, it is critical that we develop energy resilience in the Western Cape. We need to create an enabling environment for individuals, for institutions, for businesses and for systems to survive and to adapt and to grow despite the chronic stress or acute shocks they experience as a result of load shedding. And so we are doing everything we can with municipalities and businesses across the province to invest in the growing renewable energy sector. And together, we can improve our energy resilience to mitigate the impact of load shedding and grow our economy in the Western Cape. The challenge, of course, is the legislative and regulatory framework within which we operate as a provincial government. And it is there that we find opportunities for innovation. A great deal of work has already taken place over the last decade to develop the green economy in the Western Cape. And a great deal of these successes could not have been achieved without the work of the Department of Economic Development and the City of Cape Town, and who have worked with municipalities and stakeholders, including Green Cape and Westgrove. A key element of our work has been to drive the uptake of solar PV across the Western Cape so that we can mitigate increasing costs of electricity, 
so that we can reduce dependency on ESCOM, so that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and so that we can provide energy resilience during load shedding in the Western Cape. We are doing this in two ways. Firstly, we have engaged every municipality in the Western Cape to enable residents and businesses to install solar PV by providing guidance on the necessary policy, the bylaws and tariff structures that are required. And we have had considerable success in this regard. In 2015, only two municipalities allowed small-scale embedded generation to connect to the municipal grid. But today, 23 municipalities now allow small-scale embedded generation. And 19 municipalities also have regulator-approved feed-in tariffs, where a business or a household can be financially compensated for feeding excess electricity back onto the grid. Together with communication campaigns to encourage uptake of small-scale embedded generation, this has led to approximately 167 megawatts of small-scale embedded generation being installed to date across the Western Cape. Secondly, through Green Cape, we have held one-on-one -on -one engagements with businesses in the Western Cape to assist them in improving their energy resilience. To date, over 60 businesses have been visited and received this in-depth advisory assistance to install solar PV. In addition, 1,307 businesses have been supported to either improve their water or their energy resilience or to grow the green economy sector uh, in the Western Cape. One such example is the support we, together with Green Cape, were able to provide to Sea Harvest, one of the largest employers on the West Coast region. Load shedding put their business under strain as they were spending large amounts of money on diesel to fuel generators to keep their plant operational. And reaching out to the Western Cape government for assistance, Green Cape jumped into action, engaging urgently, directly and innovatively with sea, the Sea Harvest team and, of course, the Soldana Bay municipality. And as a result, we were able to successfully provide relief to Sea Harvest from load shedding saving them from closure and saving jobs in the Western Cape. And of course, this uh, support to business will continue. As a provincial government, uh, we are leading by example. We have invested over 53.4 million rand in solar PV on provincially owned buildings, which is likely to result in substantial cost saving. The solar PV, together with the installation of electricity meters to better manage consumption in provincial buildings, has resulted in our energy consumption being 38% below the industry benchmark. Towards the end of last year, we launched our three-year Municipal Energy Resilience Project, or MER project, aimed at enabling municipalities to generate, to procure, uh, and to sell their own power in the Western Cape. Specifically, the project aims to assist municipalities to take advantage of the new energy regulations, which includes the potential for municipalities to purchase energy directly from independent power producers. The MER project is spearheaded by our green economy team in the Department of Economic Development who are working in collaboration with the Department of Local Government and the Provincial Treasury to engage with municipalities to build their energy resilience. The procurement of energy at utility and municipal distribution scale, such as bulk energy purchases from independent power producers is a complex and challenging task. Municipalities may not have the policies, the plans, the resources, or the funding, or procurement expertise to procure whole-scale electricity from sources other than ESCOM. Municipalities may not have technically evaluated their electricity distribution systems to determine their readiness to support new electricity generation and energy trading. 
And so our focus is to help the municipalities at this stage to develop a pathway to energy resilience, whether they may be generating their own electricity or procuring electricity from third parties. To achieve this, we have committed 20 million rand per year over two years to roll out the MER project in three phases in the Western Cape. Phase one has identified the candidate municipalities who are already uh, working uh, with uh, to identify pioneering projects that will be part of the MER project. As announced last week, Stellenbosch municipality will be one of these municipalities, and we hope to announce the other participating municipalities soon. We will work closely with these municipalities to develop a roadmap to roll out the projects, which will consider renewable energy technology and scales, cost op options, location issues, risks, municipal readiness needs, infrastructure needs, uh, timelines to get capacity onto the grid, transaction and procurement mechanisms, and all the regulatory issues. Phase two will focus on the implementation of the pioneering energy projects, as well as working with municipalities to help fill gaps to ensure future energy project implementation. And finally, phase three will see the development of a master plan for energy projects to be rolled out in all the candidate municipalities. We will also identify additional energy projects in other municipalities in the Western Cape. We want a situation where all municipalities can guarantee a stable supply of electricity at competitive prices in the Western Cape. Another key element in the drive for energy resilience has been the diversification of energy sources in the Western Cape. Investment in liquefied natural gas could be a critical catalyst for the economy in the Western Cape. Local liquefied natural uh, gas will also replace dirty industrial fuels, reducing pollution and greenhouse emissions. To support this, we have completed several studies to assess the feasibility of importing LNG at Soldana Bay and developing gas storage, transmission and distribution infrastructure along the West Coast corridor of the Western Cape. Our most recent study found that the importation of LNG to Soldana Bay will be economically and financially feasible. And so since 2012, we have actively promoted the importation of LNG into our province via Soldana Bay. And we will continue to work hard to ensure that Soldana Bay is identified as one of the sites for gas importation. This will attract investment that leads to increased exports and the local production of uh, green technologies, which will enable the green economy and contribute to energy resilience in the Western Cape. As a shareholder in the Atlantis Special Economic Zone, uh, which has been in place for a year, with the most recent development being the purchase of land from the city of Cape Town in exchange for a minority shareholding. The conclusion of the land transfer is a critical step in the development of the Atlantis Special Economic Zone because it allows the company to attract and engage investors independently over the next three years and the ability to negotiate terms directly with investors. 25 hectares of the Atlantis Special Economic Zone has already been developed with four investors totaling 680 million rand and creating around 300 jobs. There's also a significant pipeline of investments with the Atlantis Special Economic Zone seeking, seeking to recruit suitable investors to the value of 600 million rand, which will enable over 1,000 direct jobs 
in new energy generation technologies and other green tech investments over the next three years. And so the timing of the land transfer could not have been better as the Atlantis Special Economic Zone is expected to start breaking ground and building uh, for investors uh, in the next 12 months. These are just a few of the examples of the innovative initiatives taken by the provincial government to build energy resilience in the Western Cape. There is still an enormous amount of work to be done. The strategic intent is there. The urgency is there. We now need to execute and we need to execute fast. And we will do this by continuing to find new ways to work. We will overcome old structures and old modes of thinking and embrace new technology and new ideas. And we will find new ways to impact the lives of citizens and new approaches to activate them as partners to shape the future together in the Western Cape. I thank you. Thank you very much to David for that powerful and enlightening presentation. It's great to hear that the balls are being put in place and now we need to tee them up and just get the ball rolling. Uh, our next speaker on the very important topic of energy resilience is the mayoral committee member for energy and climate change, Councillor Pindili Matriti. Pindili is an experienced politician, community activist and administrator, having served in various community and city structures over the years. He has been a councillor in the city of Cape Town since 2011, and as the MACO member for energy and climate, he has sought to make Cape Town an in innovative leader when it comes to energy security and cutting carbon emissions. He, this, he feels, is, a, is as important as it is becoming more evident that the city-led government responses might be our only hope moving forward and dealing with issues around a sustainable electricity provision. We all know that electricity, a sustainable, uninterrupted supply is critical to any development that we want to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, the MAKO Member for Energy and Climate Change, Pindile Matriti. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak about some of the work that the city is doing. The city of Cape Town has a long history of responding to climate change through strategies, policies, planning and programs. Our draft climate change strategy has just been through a public participation process and will be finalized for council approval early this year. The strategy confirms the city's commitment to taking the necessary actions to reduce the damaging greenhouse gas emissions and of becoming carbon neutral while also adapting and becoming more resilient. In parallel, as part of our commitment to the C40 deadline 2020 program, a climate action plan is being drafted which outlines the pathway to achieve this and it will be published early this year. Clean energy for work creation and economic development is a key strategic focus of our climate change strategy. This includes the following goals. Move as quickly as prices and opportunities allow towards 100% clean electricity supply by 2050. Get technologically and commercially ready to operate the grid of the future. Minimize the economic cost of energy through maximizing energy efficiency opportunities. In terms of our work to drive the diversification of our energy supply, we are focused on driving the transition to a new future based on renewables and hydrogen, and significant work is already underway. The basis of this renewable energy modeling and planning, which include the development of a city-level integrated resource plan, which will look at supply and storage opportunities, electricity decarbonization and security of supply within the national context. In terms of our ability to procure energy outside ESCOM, on 16 October 2020, 
amendments to the electricity regulations on new generation capacity were promulgated. These allow for the minister to provide a determination for the purchase and procurement of electricity by municipalities, subject to the sub submission of a detailed feasibility study or compliance with the public-private partnership legislation as applicable. We are investigating the implications this would have on our plans to diversify our energy supply. We continue to engage with the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy as an outcome of the judgment of our court case. And in parallel, we have been working with the National Treasury's City Support Program to assist in the development of a framework for municipal-led renewable energy procurement program. Notwithstanding the outcome of engagement processes and determinations as mentioned above, the city is intent on procuring power from independent power producers as soon as it is legally possible. A draft City Renewable Energy Independent Power Procurement Program Project Initiation Report and Process Flow Diagram has been developed and it demonstrates the business case for such a program, as well as highlights the commercial, legal, and technical aspects and the risks that need to be considered when developing the program. The process plan indicates that from a positive confirmation from the court or determination to first power could take up to five years. An internal governance mechanism is being established to guide and approve aspects of the program. Despite the delays in the IPPs due to the national government, the city is finding other innovative ways to generate our own electricity. One of our best known examples of such energy generation capabilities, it is the Stinbras power station. The power station was commissioned in 1979 with a capacity of 180 megawatts and was the first hydroelectric pump storage scheme on the continent. Following the last round of load shedding from ESCOM, and indications being that load shedding will be with us for most of this year, the investment in our generating capacity will be important. Stinbras can be started at short notice, therefore providing security of supply. The power plant is able to supply 12.5 hours at full load. The importance of this, as shown with the recent ESCOM load shedding, was that we were able to protect our city-supplied customers from the full blow of load shedding. The other plants we have are the Athlon gas turbine plant, which is available on a continuous basis and is remotely controlled at Steenbras. Also, the Rochebay gas turbine, which was installed in 1982 with a capacity of 40 megawatts. It also gives me pleasure to announce that we are continuing with the development of our own generation capacity, such as ground-mounted solar PV and the rooftop PV systems on our municipal facilities. The team has assessed a number of vacant pieces of land for system less than 10 megawatts, and a site in Atlantis is being actively pursued, and we are hoping to start construction at the end of 2021. Development on this site is expected to cover a land area of 10 to 20 hectares, and it is expected to generate enough clean electricity to power the equivalent of 4,000 low to middle income households every year, and 50 jobs expected to be created during construction phase of this project. We also have the industrial load containment program targeted at aggregated load from industrial customers in specific locations. Industry is required to commit to up to 20% load reduction to avoid up to stage 2 of load shedding. Our initial results are promising in Epping and we look to expand to Atlantis and Belleville. The uptake of small-scale embedded generation by businesses and households in the city continues to grow and at the end of October 2020, there was an installed capacity of 45 megavolts the city has also established a wheeling framework, a tariff structure with the wheeling tariffs approved and published. A wheeling pilot is also underway to test the system. We are also exploring a model that looks to assist households and businesses to install renewable energy technologies. The program is an innovative finance scheme for renewable energy and energy efficiency deployment. It enables low-cost, long-term funding 
for renewable energy and energy efficiency, and also resilience upgrade. This would be a collaboration between the public and private sector. But this is still at a conceptual phase, but we are determined as the city that the model or an alternative is adopted going forward. We continue to lead by example in terms of our net zero carbon buildings commitment through our municipal retrofits and smart facilities program. We have made huge strides in the last decade with the savings during the period between 2009 to 2019 from these projects amounts to 231,348 megawatts, which is equivalent to 300 million rent and 229,035 tons of carbon dioxide reduction. This excellent work is also reflected in the recent A score for our 2020 response to the carbon disclosure project. We are proud to be recognized for our commitment to climate action and transparency of our data and plans. We are one of the 88 cities worldwide to receive this score and the only city in Africa. We showed our commitment to a zero carbon future yet again last year when we launched our first public electric vehicle charging station situated in the parking area of the Belleville Civic. This is the first of two solar powered electric vehicle charging stations that will be offered free of charge for the first two years to the members of public. The sites were chosen because of their convenient, safe and visible locations. The chargers were donated to the city by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. The city will continue to support the uptake of immobility for all and developing initiatives to drive the growth of this technology in Cape Town so that it can become more accessible and rolled out in the future to benefit all Cape Townians. We see great opportunity presented in the COVID-19 recovery for climate change and renewable energy. We also see a need for a green recovery as a bridge to a more resilient future. In planning for this future, we must recognize that climate change poses a similar risk to economic stability, life and livelihoods. This underscores the need to urgently work towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and our Carbon Neutral 2050 commitment. With those few words, I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for that, Pindela, and we look forward to having you up in the studio with us in a few minutes as part of the panel discussion. Uh, just a reminder that we will now be going into the last of our polls, um, and thank you all to the people who have been con contributing to those polls. Don't stop now. This is the last one as we go into the subject of energy resilience. So send those messages through, send those questions through, and send those polls through. Take part in the polls. We'll be back after the break with the panel discussion. Don't go away. Energy resilience. That's the theme for this poll. As part of this interactive innovation summit, we would like to get your responses to each of the questions. Later in the program, we will show the results and this will form part of our panel discussion. A pop-up window to enable you to participate will pop up once we start. We'll be asking four questions on this theme. Question one. South Africa can be energy secure if the government pursued the following as a priority. Clean coal. Nuclear energy. Renewable energy sources. Gas. A mix of the above. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 2. The single biggest threat to a municipality's ability to deliver electricity is 
load shedding, cable theft, non-payment by residents, illegal connections. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Question 3. The most exciting development in the energy sector right now is solar panel roadways, electric vehicles, biofuel, harnessing ocean tides for power, battery electricity storage. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Question 4. The single biggest impact that load shedding has had on municipalities has been breaking of infrastructure due to the constant switching, the economic impact on businesses, growing discontent from residents, spike in crime. We will now give you a moment to complete the poll. Thank you. That completes the poll for this theme. Stay tuned for the panel discussion. Welcome back as we set the scene for the panel discussion on energy resilience. Joining us on the panel this afternoon is the Shadow Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, Kevin Milam. Very welcome to you, Kevin. You. And we also are joined by Quinton Smith, the MMC for Infrastructure at the Stellenbosch University. Welcome thank this you, afternoon. Pinele, thank you. We've just seen your presentation. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Energy resilience in the South African context is arguably a little different from most other countries. We had over a decade of load shedding and certainly years of load shedding still ahead. I think we have to try and think out of the electricity box. But I think if I may just start with you, Kevin, a question we, we got in from Barbara Grublinghoff from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. And her question is, can someone please address the issue of this attempt to reintroduce the nuclear deal by the back door. So can we can we deal with that one, Kevin? Sure. So I don't think it's by the back door. I think they, they've come storming through the front door to, to reintroduce the nuclear deal. In fact, Minister Gwede Mantashe, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, in his performance agreement with uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, has committed to procure nuclear energy by 2024. Now, that would then kickstart a nuclear new build program. The problem that we've got is that the Integrated Resource Plan, which is South Africa's electricity roadmap, which was finally adopted in uh, October 2019, doesn't make provision for new nuclear at this stage. It says, yes, nuclear must be part of the mix. Yes, we must extend the life of Kuburg, and we must commence planning for uh, a nuclear new build. But the reality is that right now, South Africa can't afford a nuclear power plant construction. We, we have... Uh, an electricity crisis that needs to be resolved quickly. So a nuclear build would take 12 to 15 years, and that's not my figures. Uh, Andre de Reiter on Monday said that, that to build a nuclear power plant, you're looking at a minimum of 12 years. Uh, so that's not gonna happen anytime soon. So we need to look at what can we do now? What can we do relatively cheaply and, and, and sustain and our grid and keep the, the, the lights on? Yeah, very, very pertinent uh, answer there, very question on a lot of people's lips. As we were discussing just before we came out here today, um, 
we constantly hear about illegal electricity connections wherever you go, whether it's a metro, whether it's a small university, a small municipality. And of course, the devastating effect this can have because it's not only the theft of electricity, there are fires that are could be ignited by this, this infrastructure destruction. Um, awful to think there could be death and injury by electrocution. And we see quite a lot of this. Now, I know a lot of municipalities and the metro are pushing to get, uh, especially the, the the less formal sector, having electricity. But how are we managing this? Are, are we ever going to get to a point where we can really do away with illegal connections? Pedele, you, perhaps you'd like to start. Uh, thank you very much. It is going to be very difficult to say we will be able. If you look at the spike of land grabs, because I can tell you in Cape Town, the biggest issue that we're facing now is the land grabs. Mm. Unfortunately, the people that are grabbing these parcels of land, they don't do any research or studies to understand if the land is suitable for people to reside. In most cases, you'll find out they are building on flood plains where we are not allowed to provide uh, electricity. So if we are still having the, the, that problem, that means we will not be able to resolve the issue of uh, illegal connection and vandalism, unfortunately. And Quinton, you were saying even in Stellenbosch, it's, it's, a, it's a massive problem. Yeah, I, I could add on to what my colleague has just alluded to. And <clears throat> to give you an example, uh, we are, are currently sitting in a similar situation, really, where we are trying to cut through 1,500 illegal connections, as an example. And what we've learned from that, and, and there's a lesson to be learned in this, is that there is a thriving economy because of these illegal connections. So what is happening is that you've got a grouping of people connecting illegally. So on a phased approach, Stellenbosch is trying to phase out our electricity supply in a phased approach. So we need to move a section of the community away into uh, a separate area, uh, which is a specifically demarcated area. So we want to move them there to enable to facilitate the process of getting permanent electricity structures into place for them. But what is happening at this point in time is that they are then, because of the land grabs, like you said, they are now additional legal, illegal connections taking place. But the sale thereof, that is the problem, because the people living in that specific section that now needs to get uh, a steady supply of electricity legally are now illegally also supplying and selling electricity to the next door grouping who has illegally occupied land. So that is a, a, generating, gen a generating income for them. So when you talk to those residents, you say, well, in order for us to give you electricity, we need to cut your electricity first and move you to another demarcated area. They say no, because the moment you do that, you take away our income. So there is another problem, which I think, uh, Richard, that we need to be looking at seriously, is how do we curb that situation? Because that is also leading to the illegal land grabs, yeah. because there is money involved. And the moment money is involved, it's an under the, under the carpet black market economy. Basically, that's what, what's happening. And the same thing if we're looking at cable theft. I mean, cable theft is highly risky. It damages infrastructure and it costs the municipalities or the metro a lot of money to, be, to have to replace what has been stolen and, and what has disrupted the, the system. Richard, every time there is an illegal connection, the risk of damage to, to municipal infrastructure increases. And so you'll have illegal connections causing outages in, in, in places where there are no illegal connections because the, the, the broader municipal infrastructure gets damaged. Secondly, there's the loss of revenue. So the illegal connections cause a substation or a transformer to blow. There's time to, to replace that transformer or substation. There's a cost to replace that. And so all of this has a knock-on effect on the municipality's ab ability to service the residents of that community. I see our first um, poll question is back. Uh, the question is, South Africa can be energy secure if the government pursued the following as a priority. Clean coal, uh, 3%. I think not everyone's sure what clean coal <laughs> exactly is. Nuclear energy, zero. I think that's, that's quite an important number to come out in this poll. Absolute zero. Renewable energy sources at 56%. Gas at zero, which is also quite interesting. And a mix of the above at 41 So um, if you look at renewable, renewable energy sources, but also the mix, uh, you think that's pretty realistic going forward? So very much a mix of energy sources. I mean, we can't give up our existing generation capacity, uh, the ESCOM coal plants, we can't give those up, we can't give up our, 
our nuclear plant at Kuburg, because if we did, we would not have enough electricity for what the country needs right now in the, in the short to medium term. But we do need to look at how we bring new capacity online. And that means that we've got to look at, at renewable energy sources because that's a quick way of bringing electricity uh, generation capacity into the system. Uh, very, very short time span. Uh, solar is 18 to, to 24 months. Wind is 24 to 36 months. So it's a very, very quick one. Gas is an interesting one because gas allows you to, to provide uh, what they call dispatchable power. In other words, a consistent uh, power supply. We have natural gas resources off our coast that need to be developed, uh, the Brulpada and Laypat fields that, that need to be developed, but those are about seven or eight years away. There's natural gas that comes down through Mozambique, uh, through a pipeline into South Africa that we could uh, connect to. And then we have our, our tanker facilities at Saldana and, and Cape Town where we could build power plants that utilize these and, and provide dispatchable power. And the cost of that is within the same sort of range as renewable energy sources. And the time frame to build those power plants is also about 24 to 36 months. So it's a quick quick win. Um, Cost-wise, it's, it's, a, it's a good price and it's lower than coal or nuclear. And as far as IPPs are concerned, the Western Cape is ahead of the curve um, as far as that is concerned and uh, had to sort of stand up and say uh, enough of this other nonsense and, and, and take some steps that were viewed as, as quite unpopular at one stage. But we have a question coming in from uh, Drakenstein from Councillor Johan Miller who says that how will this alternatively generated electricity be distributed to homes and businesses without a distribution network? If the Eskrom grid uses it, are there extra wheeling charges to be, to be uh, taken in Pindila? Yes, what we are actually saying, because I want to go back to what Kevin was saying, we did not say we wanted to do away with the coal plants when we started our fight to procure energy from the IPPs, but our main objective was to diversify our yeah. energy supply. Uh, as the city of Cape Town, we already have a framework that is speaking to wheeling. Although people are saying that there will be extra cost, it's not a big cost. But what is very important is that if people now are choosing to buy from a third party, they will use our network. We will allow people to use our network to transport the energy to whoever that they are selling to. But what we will get, because as the city at the end of the day, we must maintain the network, then we will get that small fraction as a fee, but we will provide our network to the third party to sell to whatever customer, even to our own customers, because we believe that people must be given a choice to choose where do, do they want to buy. We Absolutely. cannot force people to buy a particular type of energy. If people are saying today they want clean energy, it is their right, they must get it. But what we need to do as government, let us actually assist those people to make sure that that is doable by providing or allowing people to use our network and infrastructure. Richard, just on that, uh, Stellenbosch has a, a bylaw in place that, that, does, uh, that allows wheeling of electricity. George has just announced that they're putting bylaws in place to, to permit wheeling of electricity. But one of the things is, how do you transport electricity from uh, one area across long distances to another? And that's where the national grid comes in. Now, the national grid is currently owned by ESCOM. Everybody agrees that that should be an independent uh, grid operator. It shouldn't be something that is that, that you have the generation and the, the grid ownership owned by the same company because then, then there's the opportunity to, to block IPPs. As we saw in 2016 when ESCOM refused to sign the power purchase agreements with the IPPs to allow them to connect to the grid and that, that delayed those, those IPPs from coming online for a long time. Now, what, what Pindale is talking about is, is the municipal distribution system uh, but the, equally, we have to look at the, the bigger national and provincial uh, grid structure and, and the cost of that. Now, there will be, a, as he said, a very small charge that would have to be added on to the actual cost of generation in order to make that feasible. You mentioned uh, Stellenbosch. Uh, Stellenbosch had been in the news recently with the council decision that they want to get away from the ESCOM grid and want to become independent of, of the, well, independent is probably the wrong word, but um, to be able to, to get away with that and not have I load shedding. exactly the right word. <laughs> <laughs> the right word. We should only consider the word codependent. <laughs> we don't want to say we're cutting ESCOM out of the picture completely, but yeah. But, but that, 
discussion and the news that there are municipalities who are moving in that direction, I believe it sparked a lot of interest from people who want to get involved, from people who say, I want to be part of that. Um, what's your exp experience like in Stellenbosch, Quentin? Uh, yeah, Richard, he ends the tide, look at my face. Uh, <laughs> between myself and the executive mayor, we've been inundated with calls from organisations, groupings, uh, individuals that has been in this sector for a long time. And I had this discussion with Kevin previously, uh, just before we came into studio. And it's a very good thing. It's good to see that people are knocking on our door saying, we've seen what you're busy doing, we want to be a part of it, let's engage. And that is at this point what, what we're looking for. Um, our, our council decision that we made, uh, like we said, is an investigative one. So we are now uh, in a phase of investigating. We are very fortunate because we already have partners. We have the University of Stellenbosch, we have the CSIR uh, on our doorstep and, and they are assisting us. So next week we'll be signing an MOU with them. But then also with all the other interest that is coming in, uh, like Kevin alluded to, that will be a great win for us because we'll get all of the technical expertise. We'll get all of the experts in the different fields coming in, whether it's solar, wind or gas, irrespective. All of these role players will come together uh, and we'll be able to formulate the fastest, the most cost efficient and easiest way for Stellenbosch to basically put down the blueprint because that is our intention. We want to give the other municipalities a blueprint of how it should be done. Uh, and we're really fast-tracking that process, so uh, that, that is the plan. Well, bringing it back to this fact that we are having an innovation summit, Kevin, this is the opportunity for the Western Cape again to say, right, we're going to take the lead, we're going to be the front-runners, and we're going to get partners on board and lead the way. Absolutely, and we heard that in, in David Mania's presentation earlier, uh, that they have put to, in place a, a, a whole program to assist municipalities to get to that point. And, and so Stellenbosch, City of Cape Town, uh, uh, George are already doing these things as, uh, to, to make it happen. But it's not just in the Western Cape. Uh, the DA-run municipality of Koche is also at the very forefront of, of uh, energy resilience. They've got a number of wind farms uh, in place. They're looking at, at possibly taking electricity from those uh, through a power purchase agreement. That would require uh, ministerial determination, exactly the same process that Stellenbosch is, is uh, going through. So they're going to be engaging with Stellenbosch to see how can they take this forward to procure directly from the IPPs that are on their doorstep already. And I mean, Quinton was saying they're getting a lot of uh, inquiries. Is there a real appetite out there to to go down this road? Absolutely. There's, there's a lot of investors uh, around the world. Uh, Hersi van Deventer, the mayor of Stellenbosch, was telling me that she's had phone calls from Malaysia and places like that. I'm aware of, of green funds that are willing to invest billions of euros and dollars into developing countries like South Africa. And up until now, our legislation and our regulatory environment, and it's still very, very much a handbrake on, on energy uh, security, and energy resilience, uh, at a, particularly at a municipal level. But up until now, uh, they haven't been able to invest here, and now they're looking to come here and assist us. Pindili, is, is your experience in the city of Cape Town? Yes, I do believe that what uh, Kevin is saying is, uh, is correct. You will all recall that we had to go to court to force government to allow us to do what we think is right for us. But. Uh, I must also mention that uh, we've taken a decision as the city to say we will follow the, the advice of the court because the judgment that was given was saying that let us engage more. Although knowing very well that we've engaged the national minister, I think three ministers already, to say we yeah. want to do it. But uh, because we don't want to be seen as uh, if we don't want to work with the national minister, we will follow the advices from the court to say let us engage again. We will engage, but exactly as Kevin said, there is no interest in the national government. Knowing very well that uh, we've got a minister who was not ashamed to say he's a coal man in a, conference, yeah. in a conference of international oh. guests, he said he's a coal man, then you must understand that what we are facing in South Africa is something that is unheard of. But I do agree with the sentiments shared by Kevin. Our second question is in from the poll, and the question there is, the single biggest threat to a municipality's ability to deliver electricity is load shedding comes in at 45%, cable theft at 9%,
non-payment by residents at 9% and illegal connections at 36%. So pretty much what we've been saying, the illegal connections making a big impact and of course load shedding. Going back to the city of Cape Town with what you are doing with the IPPs, when it's, late, when it's stage two for everyone else, it's stage one for uh, the city of Cape Town, which is a great relief to a lot of people. But non-payment by residents, this has been ex exacerbated by COVID-19. And I know a lot of municipalities, especially during the hard lockdown and just after, uh, their collection rates did drop quite dramatically. And this is something that I think is a challenge for municipalities in the metro to get that collection rate back up again. Well, it is. Yeah. It is very much a, a challenge. Uh, but there's, there's a culture of non-payment that we have to address in certain areas. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the, the problem is, is not only non-payment by residents, but it's non-payment by municipalities. In other words, the, the ESCOM uh, the money that ESCOM is owed by the municipalities is because the municipalities are collecting from residents on the one hand, residents and businesses, and then using that to pay salaries or whatever other uses they may have and not paying ESCOM. So you've got to balance. There is a problem of, of non-payment by residents, but equally there's this massive problem of poor financial management by municipalities. And, and let me stress here, it's not a problem in DA-run municipalities by and large. It's a problem in ANC-run municipalities. And, and Kevin, one of the points that uh, someone was speaking to me about the other day is that a lot of government departments are not paying the electricity accounts. Absolutely. Uh, and they are massive accounts. Absolutely. So the, the big ones are Department of Health, Department of Education. Those are the ones that, that you generally find the problems with. But uh, it, it is a problem. And then there's a dispute declared and it takes months to resolve that dispute. It takes time and negotiation and to say, yes, here's what you used, here's what, what uh, but maybe, maybe. And they're supposed to set the example. I mean, Absolutely. It's a, it's a government department. They're supposed to set the example for the citizens of the country to say, well, we're paying our bills, so should you. In many municipalities, people just don't pay. Um, I think the figures on there, uh, the 9% there, I, I think it's a, people underestimate the rate at which people are not paying their electricity bills. In some communities, people just say uh, straight up, you know, it's, it's, it's a right for us. Uh, we need electricity. We're not going to pay our, our, our bills because of X, Y, and Z. Um, they don't see it as a service almost. And, and that is, well, like Kevin alluded to, it's a misperception. People need to be re-educated in that field to say, but you know, you need to pay because that money is being refunneled back into the communities at the end of the day. And if the communities are saying, well, it's our right to have electricity, uh, we don't see the reason why we should be paying, then uh, it's, it's going to become a huge problem in, in future. Yes, the first thing that I want to say, I want to thank the residents of Cape Town because even during the, the COVID-19 period, we're still getting over 90, 95% in our collections. That's good. One of the reasons, I think, is because we engage in a numerous uh, projects. One of the projects was to replace the credit meters with the prepaid. Mm -hmm. So we've got a big uh, pool of our customers on prepaid. We also arrange with customers that are affected who cannot pay to say, come to us, let's talk and see how do we meet each other halfway. So we've created platforms for customers to share their frustrations with us and uh, we don't say, because you don't have money now, we cannot talk to you. We'll talk to you and see how do we give you a long time to pay off your, your, your account. So we are not affected as bad as other people, I can tell you. We still collect over 97% in Cape It's amazing. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great rate. Um, throughout today, with all our topics and themes that we've had, what keeps coming up as well is the importance of communication um, to let people on the ground know where you are, what you're doing, and as you're saying, what the situation is, how can we help you? And uh, this is something I think that DA municipalities do well, but you can never do too much. Communication's key. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, we go back to the example of day zero in Cape Town, how well the city communicated on that and how it led to a, a change in behavior by the residents of Cape Town. And even now, the water usage is still significantly lower than it was at the start of that campaign. Uh, I'm not sure the exact figures, but I mean, it's significantly lower. And so the importance of communication cannot be uh, underplayed. 
every single municipality needs to say and go out into those communities and encourage payment, encourage people to connect legally, uh, to educate people on, on the, the dangers of illegal connections. I mean, in, in, in the Eastern Cape, and I know here in, in the Western Cape, uh, illegal connections are called is in Yorka, mm. snakes, mm. because they bite. Mm. And, and children are playing there. You go and you, you find a piece of wire that's, that's twisted together like this. There's no insulation or anything like that. It's lying in a puddle. The kid steps in a puddle and dies. And that's tragic. We can't have that. So we've got to educate, 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 communicate with these communities, with all our communities, on the need to pay, on the need to connect legally, on the, on the need not to steal the cables. And I think if we look at um, Stellenbosch, for, for an example, and City of Cape Town, seen as being at the forefront of, of, of innovation and of looking to use green energy. With COVID and with people saying we don't have money and with people saying we're in a crisis, do you think there's a, a, a stepping back from the green agenda? Do you think we can afford to say, listen, we need to not pursue the green agenda as, as, as avidly as we wanted to? Am I out of line? I, I don't just think so. I, I do understand. I mean, let, let's be honest about it. There were major budgetary cuts during COVID, which were necessary to, to be done in all municipalities. Um, and I'm not just saying this because Stellenbosch uh, financially is a healthy municipality. I'm saying this because we need to look uh, into the future. Uh, we need to do futuristic thinking. Uh, the acts that we do now will be cost-saving in the future, specifically when it comes to alternative uh, electricity supply. There will be a cost involved. Uh, we need to be realistic about that. We need to face that cost. So if a municipality is able to do a specific budget at this point in time, with COVID-19 uh, still in our midst, if you can afford to do so, then you should start now with your planning phase to start implementing these projects, get them in play, make those costs available, and you will reap the benefits in seven year or 10 year or 12 years from now, then you will start reaping the benefits. But that is what a municipality or a metro, that is what it's about. Uh, we need to uh, identify these projects now for the future generations. This is not about us now, saving ourselves now, keeping the lights on right now. It is, it is for the future generations. Uh, it is for my kids, for your kids, so that when they grow up, they can start their own business and they can run their business 24 hours a day without the fear of load shedding. So, yes, by all means, I, I think uh, we will face the budget processes. Uh, we obviously will need to do some juggling with that, but I think we've got great support from, from the province. The province has already allocated funds uh, for a lot of these projects. Um, and I think for any municipality out there, if, if you can at this point start the process, do that because it will be a future sh a save for our future generation. Richard, um, I, I want to add to what, what Quinton has said there. First of all, absolutely, municipalities need to take a, a leading role in this. But during the COVID crisis, a lot of people have been at home. They've been uh, doing home DIY projects. And some of that has involved making themselves energy resilient as residents, as businesses. So businesses have taken the opportunity, some of them, to remodel, revamp, etc. And in that process, put solar panels on their roof, put inverters in their, in their uh, facilities so that they, they are less reliant on uh, ESCOM to keep the lights on. What we proposed, and we proposed this a while back, is that every single resident who installs solar panels on their roof should get a tax rebate of 75,000 Rand for the fact that they are taking down the demand of, of electricity. And we've calculated that over a period of three years, we could save as much as 3,000 megawatts of electricity supply, of electricity demand, sorry, sorry, uh, just by implementing a program of that nature. It's a massive, massive saving. Yeah, you want to reward people, you don't want to punish them. And no, I mean, absolutely. we're going down the line of people saying, well, if you're not going to be using our product, we're going to charge you more mm. somewhere else um, because of that. And I mean, surely the residents are going to say no. Yeah, one of the things, as Kevin has said, that we've done as the city of Cape Town is to have a feed-in tariff that was approved by council. And uh, we are providing that precisely to incentivize people because one of the things that you need to do when you're working with the people, make it easy for them to do whatever that you want them to do. That is why we incentivize them as the city of Cape Town. And 
I want to agree with uh, my colleague from Stellenbosch to say, as the city of Cape Town, we see a need for the green recovery after COVID. And we believe that uh, in order for us to have a resilient future, we need to make sure now that we treat COVID and climate change as one and the same. Because we think they pose a similar risks to both economic stability, life and livelihoods. That is what COVID is doing. And climate change will be doing the same thing. So that is why we say we cannot pull back now. We need to forge forward with our green we projects. Need go, we need to go full steam ahead right now. I mean, this is an opportunity for us to build an economic recovery based on a green economy. Yeah. If I can add on, Richard. Yes. And, Sorry. and also, what, you know, what's very interesting, which I read yesterday, was that since 2020, uh, we're talking alternative electric supply. So yeah. let's talk electrical vehicles quickly. Uh, the, the market, Tesla, their yeah. shares has jumped by 400 percent since 2020. So yeah. that is a clear indication of what is coming in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Electric cars, it's going to be part of our future. So, you know, we're talking about supplying electricity to our, but our vehicles, we, we need to look at a whole new remodeling of the way we think, the way we're going to, in the future, build our buildings. How will they be constructed to make a facility for solar panels? Where will we put these electrical charge point for vehicles? So it, it's exactly. a whole way new direction um, that we are heading into. And, and we need to, to take cognizance of what the international market is doing and where the trends are going. So. I read a report last week that said that the, the cost of electric vehicles is expected to be lower on a comparative vehicle basis mm. than petrol or, or diesel-based vehicles by 2024. Yeah. Mm. That's just around the corner. That's mm. three years mm. away. Yeah, it might be interesting to see our, our third poll question coming in. Uh, the most exciting development in the energy sector right now is solar panel roadways coming in top 40%. Uh, second place, battery electricity storage at 31%. Uh, harnessing ocean tides for power at just 3%. Biofuels at 11%. And electric vehicles, which you're speaking about now, 14%, which obviously we need to grow. Uh, a while ago, a couple of years, well, 10 years ago, when I was uh, working in Belgium, biofuel was the buzzword. It, it was all about biofuel. That seems to have, have taken a little bit of a back seat as, as far as that's concerned, purely because at the time they were saying the cost would be too much. But as you were saying now, Kevin, electric cars were once seen as well. If the petrol price goes to a million rand a litre, then, then we can have electric cars. But we're not there. We, we're now saying it's, we're almost uh, pa at parity with that sort Absolutely. of thing. Absolutely. In terms of the cost of the vehicle, the operating costs are significantly lower, but the, the cost of the vehicle, yeah. parity. I think, um, I think on biofuel, just uh, on, on a sideline joke there, uh, if you've ever smelt a vehicle running on biofuel, I mean, it's, it's like smelling, they say it's, it smells like fish and chips. Uh, so that's also maybe one of the problems why biofuel started off with a big bang and then all of a sudden just uh, ended up in a cupboard somewhere. But we are at a point where we ha have actually come a very long way. We've made great strides. And we have to keep going forward. I mean, this is, we've proven that it works, that we have had some back to square one moments, but we've proven that the road we're taking um, is working and we can't go back. Can, 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 can I of course. also come with the, with, the, with, the, with the EVs? Last year, we, we launched of two of our charging stations that will be given free to the members of the public. We've got one in the Belleville Civic, the other one in the Somerset Civic. We are giving those uh, chargers free because we are again incentivizing people to say it is time now for people to move to the immobility. Because as exactly as Kevin said, we picked up that in a short space of time, there will be no difference in your IC vehicle and the electric vehicle. So for us as Cape Town to make sure that people now are taking charge or are taking advantage of that, let us make infrastructure available. That is why we've installed the two chargers in Civic, in Belleville, and the other one in Somerset. So we, we launched that towards the end of last year. You know, the technology changes that we're seeing at the moment mean that electric vehicles are able to go further, they're able to go faster, um, and so we're seeing technology that, that encourages people, exactly as Pindale has said, to move to that as an alternative mode of transportation. But the interesting one that came in at, at second place there is battery electricity storage. And as we move to renewable energy uh, as, as a, a broader source of electricity, we're going to need more 
electricity storage capability. The city of Cape Town is very fortunate to have the, the Steenbrass pumped storage scheme, and there are a couple of others around the country, but we need battery storage, and we're seeing significant developments on that front of the ability, both at a, a, a consumer level, business level, and then at a utility scale to store electricity. Mm. Is there a, a move at all for our institutions of higher learning to take this on as a more, um, you know, to offer some kind of incentive for people to be more uh, working harder to, to, to get more green technology? I think absolutely, and I think that they are, to, to a large degree, very involved. I know, for example, that uh, the University of Cape Town has a, a research unit that focuses on uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy and uh, how, how we can move forward from a technology, a technological perspective uh, to a, a better future for all. But I think equally, we're looking at innovation from the private sector. You know, one of the things that, that we need to acknowledge is that government does not innovate. Government is very much about maintaining. They don't, they don't push the, the, the envelope. So it's incumbent on the universities and it's incumbent on the private sector to do that innovation. And we're starting to see that companies like Tesla, companies like uh, uh, even, even local companies like you know, Sassel, Apple, Microsoft, Apple, Microsoft, all Microsoft mm. they're all Amazon. Amazon yeah. here in, in, in the Western Cape are, are building a data center here because they, they can innovate here, they can put in the renewable resources to, to power that data center, put in the storage facility uh, to, to run it and make sure that everything uh, is operational. And it's about innovation, exactly the theme of this, the summit. And uh, just our latest, our last poll coming in, uh, the question there, the single biggest impact that load shedding has had on municipalities has been, we have way, way ahead of everything else at the economic impact on businesses, 86%. I mean, growth, uh, growing discontent from residents comes in at naught, spiking crime at nearly 10%, breaking of infrastructure due to the constant switching comes in at, at, at 6%. But the economic impact on businesses, and that's one of the things that has come up in every single theme that we've had today, is our businesses are suffering, and we need to help them through innovation for water resilience, energy resilience, fighting COVID, and using technology. Um, would you think that's a true reflection of how people are feeling out there? Well, Karen? if you've ever had to field calls from disgruntled residents because their power is off, you probably wouldn't agree with that. Uh, mm. I'm sure Pindale and Quinton yeah. know the feeling. But, mm. but uh, the reality is exactly that, that the economic impact affects everybody. And we've seen what load shedding does. David Mania spoke about the, the impact on the economy. The, the estimate is a billion rand per stage of load shedding per day is lost. So if you're at stage one, we lose a billion rand. If you're at stage two, two billion rand from our uh, economy. But it's, it's not the big companies that are only affected because what, what you see is that people are reluctant to invest. So the ratings agencies, uh, Moody's, Fitch, the like, they all have identified load shedding and dysfunctional ESCOM as the single biggest handbrake on our economy in South Africa. That's why we're getting these ratings downgrades. But it's the, the little guy. It's the spaza shop who has to keep meat cold or cool drinks cold. They, they're unable to do that. It's the, 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 the gogo who is sewing. She can't sew if her sewing machine can't operate. Mm. And so you have this, this effect that our our economy from the, the, the very bottom all the way up to big, big businesses are, are hamstrung by our inability to ensure a consistent and reliable supply of electricity. Well, gentlemen, our time has just about run out. Um, it's been absolutely illuminating chatting to you guys about this. I'll just ask you all perhaps a last message from your side, a, a looking forward a message to people out there who are worried about, about uh, energy resilience. Yeah, firstly, I want to agree with the 86% on the impact on businesses. I think that is precisely for that reason why, as the city of Cape Town, we make sure that we maintain our steam press pump storage mm -hmm. and the other two gas turbines that we are using. But on top of it, we are also exploring the possibilities of building our own solar power plant. We've identified a piece of land. At the end of this year, 2021, construction will start. We are, we've got a lot of other projects that we are actually exploring. We are also exploring another means 
of assisting our businesses and, and customers to say, how do we assist you to get your energy efficiency technology? And then you will uh, repay it over a long period of time. So these are things that we are doing because we understand that per stage you are losing so much. And uh, I believe that the impact on businesses cannot only be felt by businesses. It will also be felt by municipalities because that is where we get our rates. It will be felt by ordinary citizens because that is where people must get money to buy bread. If businesses are impacted, everybody is impacted. So that is why we are coming up with so many initiatives to make sure that we do assist our people. So I do agree with the, with the 86%. Quinton, from your side? Yes, I mean, it goes without saying, businesses has been the hardest uh, hit uh, by all of this, and then COVID on top of that as well. So I think it's now time for us to re-gear re our industry again. Uh, and I think the important thing that, that we need to take away from this summit uh, uh, is the absolute commitment, I think, uh, from our leadership, uh, the commitment from the party itself, uh, from provincial government all the way up to national side, everybody's commitment uh, to get this program going. And I think if we can get our businesses back on track, uh, we will start seeing a change in our, our economy uh, and for the better, obviously. Uh, but I think people need to realise it's, it's a long road ahead still. There are certain short-term projects that can be easily realised, but there's also medium-term and there's long-term projects. Uh, and we need to clearly differentiate between those three. Uh, we shouldn't start getting into a bait, uh, debate about long-term projects, which we know will be in the future 10 to 15 years. We should look at the short to medium terms, like Kevin said, the short-term wins. What can we do now? to get our local businesses up and running again, to get our local consumers keep their lights on and ultimately uh, get the Western Cape economy going at a fast rate so we can get back on track. Thank Kevin, you. Kevin, you've been very positive. A final word from you for our viewers out there? So I think the, the important thing from a broader electricity and energy perspective is that we need to ease the regulatory environment. We need to make it easier for people to connect. We need to make it easier for IPPs to connect to the grid. We need to make it easier for, for competition to occur. We need to bring down the cost of, of electricity and allow people choices. And that requires ministerial will. It requires political will. It requires uh, someone to sign the piece of paper. That someone is the Minister of Energy, Gwede Mantashe, and I will keep pressure on him to make sure that ultimately we get there. Kevin, thank you very much. Pindele, Quinton, thank you very much to my panel for joining me. Um, thank you very much to the participants on Zoom for taking part in the polls uh, and for sending in your questions. We are not quite done. We'll be back after this with a final wrap. Stay tuned. This radio ad was produced using only solar power. This is Black River Office Park. Behind its slick corporate exterior hides something truly special. On its roof, it has the second largest rooftop solar array in Africa, generating 30% of its own electricity. It's the first building in South Africa which through the efforts of the city of Cape Town can actually sell electricity back into the power grid when it's under pressure. It's just one smart solution towards us becoming South Africa's most switched on city. City of Cape Town, making progress possible together. This radio ad was produced using only solar power. This is Stienbras Dam, and while it's very quiet and peaceful, it holds a pretty remarkable secret. It generates power during peak electricity load times by letting water from the dam flow downhill through a turbine into a large dam at the bottom. And late at night, when power demand is low, it pumps it back up to the top, ready to save the day again which means that when load shedding occurs in Cape Town, it's far less severe than anywhere else. It's just one smart solution towards us becoming South Africa's most switched on city. City of Cape Town, making progress possible together. This radio ad was produced using only solar power. This is Cape Town Civic Centre. 
26 floors high and spanning two city blocks. I'm walking along a quiet corridor to show you something interesting. If there's no movement, the lights dim and eventually switch off. And when there's movement, they switch back on again. It's because the building has intelligent motion sensitive LED lighting, which means that no power is used when no one's there. So it can be used better somewhere else. It's just one smart solution towards us becoming South Africa's most switched on city, city of Cape Town, making progress possible together. Welcome back and we have almost reached the end of the Democratic Alliance Innovation Summit live coming to you from Cape Town and what a wonderful day it's been. We've heard from the experts on our four themes, COVID-19, technology and economic growth, water resilience and energy resilience. It's been a really insightful day and a big thank you to all our presenters, all our speakers, all our panelists, as well as the participants on Zoom who've taken part in the polls and have sent us those questions. Now joining me here in the studio for the wrap of the Innovation Summit is the Chair of the Federal Council, Helen Zilla, who's been following the summit all day. Helen, thank you very much for joining me. Perhaps some general observations? Thank you very much, Richard. Well, welcome to the bitter enders who've stayed till the end. I hope you'll find it worth it. I found it amazing. I have been involved in a lot of the DA work and even I was taken by surprise at some of the innovations. Some of my favorites were following the sewerage to see where you're going to get your next hotspot of COVID. Now that is innovation, saying it'll come up in your sewerage very much more quickly before it comes up in your population and starts spreading. Follow the sewerage, spot the hotspot, and then deal preemptively. Very nice innovation, that one. I loved the Stellenbosch innovation around the mother computer controlling all the mini computers on the traffic lights so that they could all coordinate their flow to make traveling times much less concentrated, faster, and more efficient. Really good, innovative things like that that just make life easier for people. And that's what it's about, Helen. It's not about ticking boxes or saying, well, we've done what's expected of us. We're going beyond that. And it's about improving the lives of people. Well, you know, when you talk about ticking boxes, you hit a very important point for government officials. They are measured by a whole list of boxes that have to be ticked. And therefore, to get innovation in government is extremely difficult because at the end of the day, a head of a department is going to get a clean audit or not on three things, whether he met all his predetermined objectives, whether he abided by all of the regulations, and there are hundreds sent out by National Treasury and the law, and then whether he got a clean financial audit. We're the only country in the world that does that. And that means a massive tick box exercise. Now to innovate, you have to take risks. And people who are aiming for clean audits are very risk averse. So you have to have an atmosphere created by the politicians that enable people to fail. I hate to say this, but clean audits are sometimes not the be all and the end all if they stifle innovation and doing things in new ways. Because you can never take a risk and do things in a new way without some possibility that you may fail. And if you don't have political cover for that failure, then you're going to be hung out to dry because some, somewhere there won't be some kind of regulation that you've abided by. So innovation means risk and governments are averse to risk. And many of these innovations took a lot of risk you had to change regulatory environments completely. I mean, I know when I was the Premier of the Western Cape, we started changing the regulatory environment for small-scale embedded generation. And that is another wonderful thing about innovation, because innovation builds on innovation. We started getting the regulatory environment right then. We started getting the wheeling bylaws working then and now it's being implemented. So you have to keep on and keep on. In government, things are slow, but cumulative. And it's that cumulative innovation that's enabled by politicians who are prepared to take risks and back officials that do. 
Alan Windy was talking about, an official who was just there saying, well, we better get this field hospital connected, digitally connected. Now, that was a bit of a risk because it certainly wasn't on their predetermined objectives. They didn't know that COVID was coming, but they were out there doing it because innovatively they thought this needs to happen. And it's that climate, that atmosphere that gets created by the politicians. And I think an important point to pick up on what you were saying as well is that the DA hasn't started doing this since COVID. No. We've been doing it for many years before and potentially why we could do so well in COVID because we laid the groundwork and we were, as you say, prepared to take those risks. Absolutely. I mean, we've been through crises before. We went through the water crises. We went through a massive fire crises. We went through a range of other crises and we've got it down pat. And the joint operations centres that get pulled together, the work streams that get pulled together, working across boundaries is, is second nature. You don't all sit in your silos. You get joint objectives and then everybody contributes to those objectives. And that is also a very new way of working in government. People don't like doing that because they think, well, you might impact on me and I'm going to get my clean audit here. And if you do something that makes something in my department go wrong, then I'm going to look bad. Joined up government, seamless government, has been a very, very big theme that we've played on for a very long time. So it's that climate. And another cl thing you have to do, and I think Jordan Hill Lewis mentioned it, nothing could be more important. You have to enable the private sector and entrepreneurs mm. to innovate. Far too many government officials are out there saying to the private sector, no, you can't do that. This regulation says you can't do that. Now, the difference between government and the private sector is this. In government, you cannot do anything unless the law specifically allows you to do it. In the private sector, you can do absolutely everything unless the law says you can't do it. And that is a very different space in which to work. And often officials can't get their heads around the difference. So, for example, the flash shops, the spaza shops in informal settlements throughout the Cape and probably the country, I don't know. I got to know them in the Cape. They came and complained to me that an official from the city of Cape Town had stopped them selling electricity on a fantastic new app that they'd got linked to a cell phone and they could sell electricity from their shops and people could buy it. And that gave them a lot more feet over their doorsteps so that they sold many more products as well because people buy some fish or a loaf of bread or some peanut butter or some soap or whatever it is they happen to buy with their electricity. And the official said, no, we've never done it like this. You must go and buy it at Pick and Pay or with the other outlets. And I said, no, this is a great innovation. Let our spas and shops flourish. No, but there's no regulation that allows it. So we enable that to happen. So the critical thing is enable innovation. Don't stop it with regulation. And not to be jealous of what you have. We need to share it. And I think we need to continue what's happening now is whether it starts in the metro or starts in one of our smaller municipalities, we need to share best practices and assist where we can. Um, because the, the, the lower down until we get to grassroots level when everyone is being impacted by our innovations, that's where we need to be. Absolutely. But, you know, people don't realise how much innovation changes things. Just look at that red dot taxi initiative. Now, if you're a normal commuter or somebody who had to work from home, you wouldn't realise that there is this wonderful app that's been innovated and created that enables our healthcare workers to be picked up at their doorstep, driven safely in a taxi, dropped off at work so they can safely look after patients. And when they come off their shift in a COVID ward, they don't get back into a general taxi where they risk potentially infecting other people. They go into a special health taxi. That's a great innovation. But for 90% of the population, they wouldn't feel it. But this is what I would do, I want to say. No one mentioned, and that's why I'm bringing it here today, that Cape Town has been named one of the world's best cities for remote work. Now, this is the new normal. We talk about the new normal with climate change, all of these things. But the new normal is remote working. And it is the investment that we've made in the infrastructure, in the connectivity infrastructure, Silicon Cape, also the incredible e-learning projects that we've put underway, the wiring up of even the most remote areas in the city, 
are able to work remotely. And the data costs hopefully will now come down dramatically. All of the schools will be are connected to broadband. And it's innovation from long ago that makes this possible. So I think it's an absolute kudos at this COVID time we should be saying Cape Town named one of the world's best cities for remote work. That doesn't happen and that didn't happen since the start of COVID. Yeah, I think it's clear from what we've seen today is that a lot of people have been working really hard to take this innovation into our daily lives. And then the payoffs are seen with things like that. And I think from our biggest metros to our smallest municipalities, um, the will is there. Uh, definitely the people are keen to get involved as much as possible. And we just have to try and facilitate that as much as we can. Absolutely. It's, it's a mindset. It's an enabling mindset. And it's also a problem solving mindset. And I think the world is divided into problem solvers, problem acceptors, and I suppose problem causers. But problem solvers are the innovators and everybody else must make an enabling environment for them to innovate and solve problems. They won't always do it. They'll sometimes make mistakes. But as long as they're honest mistakes, you don't want to kill that innovative spirit. Well, thank you so much for that, Helen. I mean, I feel that what we've done here today um, has shown everyone how prepared we are to go forward, how hard we are pre uh, prepared to work to get this done. Perhaps a final message from you to anyone out there who's been watching this today? Well, it's been very important to share this, as you say, Richard, because, you know, it doesn't help winking in the dark. It only helps if people actually know what you're doing. And of course, the critical point as a political party is to say that people can choose to be governed better. That is the point of a democracy. You get to choose your government. And you may not see progress overnight, but cumulatively over 15 or 20 years, you see a massive difference between good, clean, stable, innovative government as compared to corrupt, self-serving and controlling government. And that difference is just chalk and cheese. And in a democracy, people get to choose. And if people choose bad government, well, I'm afraid that's where the downward spiral starts. The DA difference indeed, not a slogan, a reality. And a we reality. want to take that forward, especially in this year, an election year. Helen Zilla, the chair of the Federal Council, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking part throughout the day and uh, monitoring what we're doing and having some observations here. I was incredibly proud and I learned an enormous amount. So thank you, Richard. You must be exhausted, but thank you very much. It's been very, very informative and a thank you to everyone out there. It's been a wonderful day. We're going to do this again. And remember, vote, vote, vote. The DA difference, not a slogan, it's a reality. Take care until next time.